All right, we should be all set. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, I would like to convene this morning's public hearing for the Commerce Committee, this being February 11th, Thursday uh, at 10.01, I think it is, uh, 10.02, I'm corrected. Um, and, and we have um, a very full list of uh, speakers ahead of us, looking forward to hearing all of um, their comments with regards to uh, the items on today's agenda. Um, and with that, I would like to um, uh, defer to my co-chair, uh, uh, Representative Simmons. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you everyone for being here. Looking forward to a really productive discussion today and to hearing from everyone who'll be testifying on these important bills we have on the agenda. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and thank you. Uh, Madam Co-Chair, um, and uh, my ranking member uh, and colleague, um, Senator Martin, um, would, would you like to make any comments? Um, I know folks are going to be bouncing between meetings today, and he may um, be doing just that now. Uh, and so Representative Buckby, uh, our ranking member in the House, sir, would you um, like to make any comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm looking to dive in. We've got a lot on our agenda today, so uh, good to see everybody and can't wait to get to it. Thank you. Um, and so I would ask the advice and counsel as we go through this of our um, clerk uh, to keep us all in order. Um, and thank you, by the way, to uh, Ginger Rodriguez, who is just doing a yeoman's job um, because there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the back channels to get us to this moment. Um, and so with, with that, I would like to call um, our first um, speaker today, which is John Michael Parker, uh, state representative from the 101st. Uh, representative Parker. Hello, Senator Hartley, Representative Simmons, Representative Rochelle, Representative Buckby, Senator Cohen, and all the distinguished members of the Commerce Committee. It's a privilege to testify today in support of HB 6119, an act concerning arts, culture, and tourism funding. Others from across this sector, artists, organizers, entrepreneurs, small business owners, educators, restaurateurs, and advocates of all stripes will speak to their personal experiences and what is possible if we choose to invest in this critical and urgent work. I admire their advocacy and thank you for thoughtfully engaging with their testimony. As an introduction to this bill then, I'd like to make just a few points. First, I want to explain the proposal, which is the result of years of work and collaboration and represents a shared priority among this industry. HB 6119 would increase the percentage of the state's lodging tax that is set aside for the sector from 10% to 25%. This money would otherwise be sent to the general fund and to look at our last full year before the pandemic as an example, it would represent an increase of 13.1 million to 32.8 million. Such an increase would bring Connecticut on par with our neighboring states in terms of arts, culture, and tourism investment, and would return the industry to the levels of support it received before 2008. The proposal would also rename the Tourism Fund to the Arts, Culture, and Tourism Fund to better reflect its actual investments and it would codify the current practice of allocating 40% of the fund for arts and culture and 60% for tourism. Second, I wanna to speak to the breadth of this sector and the strength of this coalition. Today, you will hear from Democrats and Republicans, including House Minority Leader Candelora and the founder of the legislature's Arts, Culture and Tourism Caucus, Senator Formica. This issue and this bill are bipartisan. You will also hear from a diversity of individuals and organizations who participate in the sector. The budget line we're hoping to grow supports three important statewide offices, Connecticut Office of the Arts, Connecticut Humanities, and the Connecticut Office of Tourism, each of which benefits from dynamic and visionary leadership and hardworking committed teams. And through these offices and their grants, investments, and other initiatives, hundreds of thousands of individuals are served. I encourage you to think expansively when you consider the sector. It includes the hotels and restaurants, the museums and performing arts institutions and cultural centers. Yes, it also includes educators, 
and healers and activists and community leaders. Arts, culture, and tourism is a force for economic and workforce development, for public health, for education, for equity. Through this bill, we can make Connecticut more desirable and marketable and economically viable. We can also make it more beautiful and resilient and just. Finally, I wanna to speak to the current moment. Others will articulate the challenge the sector faces in the time of COVID-19. I'm grateful that the governor has already demonstrated a commitment to pulling this sector through the pandemic with a variety of initiatives and investments, including yesterday's announcement of an additional $9 million to offset the current and projected losses to the lodging tax. I believe then that this is an opportunity to build momentum and look toward the future. For as the state rebounds, and with it the lodging tax that supports this fund, we can move forward with a long overdue and critically important investment. There are important conversations to be had about the continued impact of COVID-19 on our state budget, the appropriate timeline for this proposal, and how the additional 15% of investment will be allocated precisely. I look forward to being a part of those conversations throughout this process and am confident that we can arrive at mutually beneficial solutions. And I welcome questions and feedback from this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Parker, and thank you for your, your um, very articulate um, testimony today. Uh, the arts is central to the economy of the state of Connecticut. I'll just put it that way. We all know it um, and we all benefit um, and we all have the opportunity to enjoy it. They have been slammed, no question about it. Um, many of them have been shuttered. We now have just seen the new um, program, which is about to be rolled out from SBA about the shuttered venue relief program, which um, I've been trying to telegraph to uh, you know, everyone in this sector. Um, and I know all my colleagues are doing the same. Um, and, and by the way, when the lights go back on, we expect, you know, that we're going to have to really um, market this. And as you know, we have been kind of flatlined here by virtue of, you know, the funding stream. So thank you very much. And by the way, welcome to the General Assembly. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, question from my colleagues. And so I have to kind of figure this out here. Hands raised. Ginger. If I'm missing someone, please holler. Um, uh, no, you're good. Okay, See, seeing, seeing no hands raised, um, you obviously have answered all their questions. Thank you, Representative Parker. Thank you um, for having me. For, look forward to working with you um, on this and other things. Uh, and so we would like to move along and to um, hear next from uh, Representative Candelora, our leader um, in the Republican House. And congratulations to you, sir. And um, thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much, Senator. I appreciate that. Uh, Senator Hartley and uh, co-chair Representative Simmons, ranking members uh, Martin and Buckby. Uh, I'm here to testify in favor of uh, 5759. Uh, it is a House caucus bill. Uh, I think it dovetails nicely into um, uh, Representative uh, John Michael Parker's um, uh, proposal on providing some additional funding for our arts and tourism. Uh, throughout this whole pandemic, we've seen those industries be hit particularly hard. And um, one of my concerns overall with the way we've seen this pandemic play out is our executive order process is sort of a light switch. You know, it's on or off, um, and the governor has extraordinary power. Uh, certainly rightfully so in the beginning, we didn't know what we were anticipating. Businesses had to be shut abruptly. Um, and we saw some slow gradual reopenings and different phases being put forth. Uh, as a business owner, one of uh, my personal experiences, and I think experiences from others, especially in the hospitality industry, uh, is not knowing uh, what is going to happen tomorrow. And so there were certain deadlines that were set and they were anxiously waiting for the um, guidelines to come out. And what we found were that businesses were impacted uh, more so than others um, because they didn't have the time to be able to anticipate a reopen, giving them that certainty so that they're able to um, you know, schedule or book their events. For instance, the latest reopening of the, the sports industry, uh, which I'm a part of, uh, we were given three days notice of what the guidelines were. It didn't give individuals a lot of time. 
to set up schedules, to book events out. And I think there was additional lost revenue because of that. And so uh, what we're asking for is when these orders come out um, to provide a minimum of a 10 day notice, uh, if there is an emergency that exists where we need to react sooner because there is a spike or some additional evidence that comes forward needing a quick reaction, uh, we would provide the executive branch that flexibility. Um, but as a policy, we think it's important that we try to provide this certainty to, to businesses. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you very much, um, Representative Candelora. Uh, I, your, your message resonates. Um, you know, this has been very imperfect and we have had to react, um, you know, in knee jerk, fashions as we've gone, as we've, as we've gone through this, uh, there, you know, it's the fine line between uh, being nimble um, and then also providing, you know, that upfront notice as best can be done. Um, and I appreciate your message in particularly for small businesses. Um, so thanks for bringing this forward to us. Um, and uh, we will continue to, um, you know, talk about this and, and, um, uh, go through our process. Uh, so with that, um, questions from, um, let's see here, my colleagues. Okay, uh, Representative um, Nucio, you have your hand up, do you? Yes. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you. Thank you, um, Representative Candelara. So um, I happen to have family that are in the, the small tourist like restaurants and stuff like that. And I know there was a really big hoopla rightfully so, around the reopening of barbershops and, and health supplies so, and health providers. I'm sorry, it's early. <laughs> um, so the impact to business on this, I know is, is rather big, especially when they have to react and understanding that, as you said, if there's an a absolute emergent situation and we may have to close someplace, absolutely agree with that. But um, I am supportive of giving people the amount of time that they need to prepare for this. So in your industry, what you had to deal with. Can you kind of quantify some of the impacts to business when they have to, when they're, when the notice is not given to give them even just a few days to respond in particular, even when we're going up. So when we're looking at now with the restaurant industry to say it's going to go to 10 o'clock or it's going to go to 11 o'clock, the scheduling and the impact that that has um, on those businesses from inventory and everything else. Can you kind of elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, I just, I think so. Um, you know, generally speaking, I think a few of the factors is, you know, to your point of scheduling employees, if, if orders come out on a Friday um, and it's effective on a Monday, you're looking at employees having to be paid overtime potentially because it's the end of the work uh, in order to adjust for these um, new sector rules. Uh, in terms of ordering product, uh, especially for restaurants or food industries, a lot of those orders come in on a Friday. Uh, so being able to have that time to order product that's necessary or to cancel orders. As we saw in the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of food went to waste um, and they ended up, you know, trying to, uh, you know, give it to people that are food insecure or go to homeless shelters or food banks to make up for that. And I understand back in April and May and, and March, that was a necessity. We couldn't avoid it. Um, but I would like us to try to avoid it in the future. I don't anticipate, I mean, as time is going on, I think this bill may not be as uh, necessary um, as it was maybe two months ago. Um, but I think it's, it's good to have this vehicle out there and a conversation out there in case we move forward and we're looking at a protracted executive order situation. Because, um, you, you know, we could avoid these kind of pitfalls and really every dollar that a business could mitigate is important. Thank you. There's also uh, there's also a pretty large impact to the employees and a lot of the employees, as we've all um, learned and has been reiterated to us, a lot of these employees are the lower wage employees, whether they're waitresses working on tips or bartenders or people in the um, service industries, they have to also react to this. So with a, an extension of hours or a shorting of hours, you're talking people having to provide daycare or transportation and all kinds of other things. Did you see a lot of that? Um, in the industry that you're looking at? I know I saw it from the perspective of uh, the restaurant industry. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And we certainly do have a lot of that 
that pivoting. And so, um, you know, I just, I think it's something important that we should take into consideration, um, you know, in the executive branch as we're moving this forward. And sometimes, you know, giving the orders to open up businesses is a great thing, but timing also matters, even if we're opening, uh, not just closing. Right. Thank you. Um, I think that's all that I have. Thank you very much. Um, other members, um, let's see, am I, Ginger, is there anybody I'm missing here? I don't see anybody else. Um, you know, Representative Kendallar, I would just like to mention one thing. So you proposed 10 day notice. Um, I'm imagining, you know, that's kind of a fluid number, um, you know, especially as a representative, um, Nuccio points out, like if you're in a situation going into a weekend and so forth, um, uh, and then you've got the consideration, you know, for uh, restaurant tours who are buying their, you know, their products and, and with regard to, you know, the, the shelf life and so forth. Um, so uh, I thank you. Um, and, you know, certainly we're dealing with a lot of things that uh, we would have never imagined. Thank you, Representative Kendall. Thank you very uh, much. Yes. Uh, and seeing no one else, we'd like to move on to uh, Daniela uh, at Cheeseburg from the town of Stonington. It's uh, Adam First Selectman. Welcome. Hi, yes, thank you so much uh, for, for having me. Um, and it's a wonderful opportunity to, to speak to you all, even if it is over Zoom. Um, so yes, uh, as you mentioned, I'm Danielle Cheesebro, and I'm the first selectman of Stonington. Um, and I'm here to speak in support of House Bill 6119. Uh, before being elected as first selectman, I served on our board of finance, which really helped give me a deep appreciation for just how important and challenging it is to put forward a, a fiscally prudent budget. Like a, a common phrase that we often mentioned was an increase in one area of our budget meant a decrease in another. And so while at face value, I understand the challenge um, of requesting an additional 15% of the room occupancy rate to go towards tourism likely means 50% will have to be reduced elsewhere. I wanted to speak just to be sure that we're all looking at the bigger picture. So just what's being discussed um, in my mind is really not an additional expense, but rather an investment. An investment that study after study finds both in Connecticut and around the country has shown to have a really outstanding return on investment. So for me, I hope we don't look at tourism funding as something that's competing with other priority programs, but really rather as a, a funding mechanism to help pay for some of these programs. Um, just to share a few examples, I was reading at um, a 2012 study by the state of Connecticut conducted by Longwood International that showed for every dollar spent on marketing, $3 was generated in increased tax revenue. And not just Connecticut, I was looking at um, a Florida study that looked at a three-year period for their tourism uh, funding campaign, and they found similarly for every dollar they spent, they generated $3.27, so they have us beat by 27 cents. Um, Tourism marketing done right really seems like it doesn't just pay for itself. It actually increases tax revenue that could be used for other areas of need. Another way I tried to look at this was based on a 2017 study, the economic impact of tourism uh, study that the state of Connecticut also did, was that each household in Connecticut on average would need to be taxed an additional $705 to replace the state and local taxes generated by visitors in 2017. And then looking across the nation at a US Travel Association 2013 study, um, it looked like travel and tourism generated over 60 billion in tax revenue to state and local governments. And trying to put that in perspective, that was essentially the wages of all police and firefighters across our whole country or the salaries of nearly 100% of secondary school teachers across all 50 states. That really stuck with me. So what I found was if we fail to invest in Connecticut, we're gonna lose market share to our competitors who get this big picture. Our neighboring states seem to understand this. And I think a strong return on investment can be made in Connecticut if we invest more in the tourism marketing. The 2018 Tourism Marketing Review conducted by Connecticut's Office of Tourism also showed that the advertising they were doing really was working. Um, I think it found about 6.4 times um, people were more likely to visit the state um, and they stayed about three and a half times longer than those who didn't see their ads. 
And also we're seeing that other local businesses and organizations that we've gotten feedback from in, in Storrington, which represents uh, half of Mystic, is that they really can't afford to advertise in expensive markets like New York and Boston without the support of the state. Um, and since we see how positive the impact can be, we just really want to advocate for this investment. And just to also add beyond the return on investment, seeing that tourism is the eighth largest employer in Connecticut. And when you look at tourism, arts and culture combined, this is 15% of our economy. It's also so much more. Um, we're talking with residents, it's really about the quality of life. And it draws people not just to visit our great state, but also to live here, whether it's to start their careers, raise a family or retire here. And these industries, as I think others have, have mentioned, have been really hard hit by the pandemic. Um, and being able to make changes that are suggested in this bill will not only help the nearly 180,000 people that are employed by these industries combined in Connecticut, but I think it will also be sure that they remain a vibrant and important part of our communities. And then just in closing to share, when trying to think about these kind of win-win bills, they're, they're pretty rare, but this is something that helps cities, it helps small towns and villages, it helps you know, northwest corner all the way down to our southeast corner. So um, I do thank you for your consideration and the opportunity to, to share our views from, from our town in Connecticut. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, um, Daniela, and, and thank you for um, laying out those metrics. And uh, by the way, have you submitted written testimony to us? No, but I can. I have it written, so I can send it. Yes, that, that would be great, just to make sure everybody has a copy of that in hand, um, you know, well, well articulated. Um, this is certainly, um, you know, a backbone, a pillar in, in the state of Connecticut's economy. And by the way, it's, you know, part of the riches of this state that we're so proud of. Um, so we recognize um, that, you know, throughout this pandemic, there has been great stress um, on this industry as well. Um, and we, we must try to do everything we can. So um, thank you very much uh, for participating this morning. Are there questions from um, colleagues? Yes, Representative Nuccio. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good morning. You, you mentioned some words that are very important words for me and that's ROI. And I didn't get the name or the date of the study. I, 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 for the dollar spent, $3 in revenue, is that strictly for arts, culture, and tourism? Um, so that one was um, done back in 2012. So I don't think it looked at the arts and culture. It was more direct tourism, um, such as um, restaurants, uh, travel industry, lodging. Um, but um, so I'm sure that number would only increase if we added arts and culture into it. Um, if you have any any uh, documentation on any of the studies or the ROIs on that, if you could send those along, I would really appreciate that. Of course, I'll send them through right away. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Nuzio. Um, further questions? I see none. Um, thank you for being with us, Madam First Selectman, um, and all the best in balancing your budgets. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, and so we would like to um, proceed now. Next um, is uh, Representative Comey. Hello, thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Rep Simmons, Senator Cohen, Rep. Buckby and Martin, and Rep. Rochelle. I'm Robin Comey, a representative from the 102nd District of Branford. Uh, I'm writing, or I am presenting <laughs> in support of HB 6119, an act concerning arts, culture, and tourism funding. You know, as a child uh, growing up in East Hartford, I developed a love for the arts, um, learning an instrument in elementary schools. Many of us did. And Though I ended up really moving frequently through middle school and then high school, music was really the one consistent thing. I was able to find friendship and um, belonging with the school music programs and with the kids who enjoyed it as much as I did. I remained committed throughout the high school um, years and eventually had the amazing opportunity of performing with an award-winning marching band traveling the country for competitions. Attracted to the arts, I pursued a career in the TV and media industry. It was a hands-on industry that suited me better than an academic field did. And simply stated, uh, without the arts, I would not be with you today. And I can safely say that. 
shortly after I graduated college in the early 90s, we had the recession, as you know, and my husband and I, um, unable to, to, to find jobs, uh, actually built a family business in the media, events, and TV communications industry here in the state. We've been operating for the past 30 years. We've experienced ups and downs of an industry with inconsistent investments and supports. And even with the most recent COVID-19 pandemic, our business and my colleagues' businesses throughout the state, like many industries, have been struggling. In early 2021, um, fortunately, we're seeing some business pick up and we are confident that we're gonna weather this as we have done with other downturns. You know, I remember when we were uh, investing richly in the arts in this state, I was shocked in 2011 when uh, the budget was cut to a single dollar um, and as an employee of, in the industry, um, or as a business owner in the industry, I should say, I felt like the state did not really recognize uh, our industry as the economic driver that it was. Investments in arts and culture and tourism bring value to our local communities and to our state in so many ways. Personally, I've experienced vibrant community theater experiences in New Britain and New Haven and Branford. I've explored directing, technical directing, acting, instrumentally, um, singing, dancing on stage, and even toured for a while with the regional uh, musical theater performing group. These nonprofits and these community groups are often under-recognized for the dollars they bring into our towns and our cities. My story just reflects one of the tens of thousands in the state of how students benefiting from at a young age from exposure to the arts who then choose to pursue careers and start businesses in the industry and all here um, for the future of Connecticut. I'd just like to close by uh, shining a spotlight on a nonprofit organization that I've worked with, Projects for a New Millennium, or Projects 2K as we called it for short, that has produced many live events over the years here in Brantford. These elaborate, highly technical outdoor light shows took place in a working quarry, the Stony Creek quarry. One project would take many years to come to fruition. We wrote grants and we needed to find extensive funding as a two week run would cost upwards of 70K. And that was just considered working on a shoestring budget and was dependent on the many volunteers to make it happen. This dedicated group of artists and technical professionals held large scale outdoor multimedia spectacles every few years for about 10 years or so. Each one interwove storytelling uh, of science and of history and of fostering environmental stewardship for the natural world and in this amazing setting. Each two week run attracted thousands of tourists from throughout New England and maybe some of you here today uh, we're fortunate to experience these groundbreaking productions. We were able to bring this to the residents of the state because of partial support from the Office of the Arts, making meaningful investments into nonprofits and into these communities. We hired professionals and services, as we talked about earlier, for each production. Real jobs for food trucks, school buses, working artists, technicians, rented equipment, equipment from businesses here in the community and local community companies. And we hired people and partnered with universities and even agencies to bring this experience to life for many. In my experience, growing investments in this industry sends a strong message to our state that with job creation and economic development will be provided these ways. Thank you so much uh, for your, to the committee for giving this uh, public hearing. Thank you to Rep Parker for bringing this um, forward and I'm happy to support it and happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Representative Comey, and thanks for sharing your personal experience. And so I miss that. What's your instrument? Do you play? Oh, <laughs> not anymore. Flute <laughs> and then trumpet and then, you know, cymbals I was playing. I mean, you get to experience everything. That's the best thing about the arts, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it, it's wonderful. My kids always complained that I made them play the piano because I couldn't and it was true. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, uh, your message uh, certainly resonates with us. Are there questions um, from my uh, co-chairs or colleagues? I do not see any. Um, thank you so much, um, Representative Comey. Uh, next, next um, we would like to invite um, Senator Paul Formica. 
Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning to you, sir. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, uh, you have a bunch of great bills on, uh, on your agenda today, uh, specifically Senate Bill 710 and H HB 5174, I think are great, but uh, I'm here to uh, speak about Raise Bill 6119. I am Senator Paul Formica, and I'd like to wish good morning to Chairs Hartley and Simmons and Ranking Members Martin and Bugby. Uh, and as I said, testify in support of 6119 an act concerning arts, culture, and tourism funding. Specifically, I want to bring your attention to the provision of the bill, which speaks to the increasing of the funding percentage. A few years ago, the tourism fund was established to provide 10% of the 15% tax levied on hotel rooms to fund the combination of arts and culture venues and for marketing uh, for our state to fuel tourism. Tourism funds directed for marketing gets people here to our great museums, our art galleries, our parks, theaters, beaches, resorts, casinos, attractions, and restaurants. These destinations are what get people to support our economy and get people to come back and visit with us once again. Last year, this budget invested over $13 million in this fund. And the return on every $1 invested is $3 in tax revenue collected to the state. This is money that supports the many worthwhile programs and services that the state has to offer to those who need it. Tourism is the eighth largest industry, supporting 157,000 jobs and billions of dollars each year in the state economy. I'm sorry, my phone rang. 2019 was a pretty good year for the industry and our economy, uh, but we all know uh, 2020 wasn't so hot. 2020 by the numbers as compared to 19. Direct travelers spending down 43% from 10 billion to 5.7 billion. State and local tax revenue from travelers spending down 30% from 1 billion to 716 million. Room market occupancy tax down 49% from 108 million to 56 million. Lodging revenue down 49% from 911 million to 465 million. On top of that, 20% of the unemployment claims in February to December in 2020 were from the hospitality industry and those who participated in arts, culture and the tourism sector. Surrounding states all outspend Connecticut on tourism marketing and we need to catch up to stay even. I see Representative Rojas has introduced a similar bill, uh, 5615, which asks for additional resources for this great industry. I know the representative to be thoughtful and a committed legislator, and I would be happy to work with him or anyone in support of promoting the arts, culture, and tourism industry. I thank you all for your time this morning and for your um, conscientious devotion to all of the great things we need to do to move our state forward with regard to its commerce and economy. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Formica. And um, I'd ask that you um, make sure that you have sent us your testimony, your written testimony. Um, so all of the um, commerce members may have the benefit of those metrics. Those numbers are, are chilling. Um, I guess I just want to ask you, uh, so first of all, I want to say congratulations. I understand you are the founder, the founding father of the Tourism Caucus. Um, so uh, most appropriate and um, most needed and particularly now. Um, can you just share with us what uh, your understanding is of our surrounding states, uh, you know, what they have done in the past and um, if you know of what's going on there uh, presently? Well, we, we all know, you know, uh, I love New York, right? Everybody, when I say that, pictures what? The, the Big Apple, right? And that's the result of branding that New York has been able to do uh, by spending uh, 70 to $80 million a year in their tourism and uh, marketing uh, fund. Rhode Island spends, I think, 15 or $17 million to try to get people to their waterfront and, and, uh, and, uh, and their, you know, their cities. Uh, Boston, as you know, is, is spending a lot of money to try to get 
uh, people there. Um, our statewide marketing last year was a little over $4 million out of that $13 million fund because most of the rest of the money went to support uh, the venues that are so important to this, to this uh, industry around the state. And 4.6 million is supposed to reach out to places like Boston and Providence and Albany and Philadelphia and New York and say, hey, uh, try Connecticut. Look what we have to offer, hiking, beaches, et cetera, and all of the things that I mentioned. And um, the fact is that those dollars are expenditures, yes, but they're more like investments uh, because it does return uh, money in the economy, I think uh, business to business, it's, it's a larger multiple uh, by many times over what the actual tax revenue is uh, as a dollar spent for $3 uh, collected in taxes. Uh, th thank you, um, Senator Formica. Um, and so we have questions from uh, my co-chair, uh, Representative Simmons, and my ranking member, Senator uh, Martin, in that order. Uh, Representative Simmons. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you so much, Senator Formica, for, for your testimony and uh, for your leadership on the Tourism Caucus, and I know you've been a big proponent of this, and this is something that's you know, such an important issue for our state right now, as you said, and so important for our committee. I know, as my co-chair said, there's a couple of bills um, we have looking at this, and you know, it's, it's always been such a critical industry for our state, even pre-COVID pre times, and I think now more than ever, due to the unfortunate economic effects of this pandemic, we really need to look at how we can support this industry, help them get through this you know, difficult road we still have ahead of us. Um, and I think your points on marketing are, are so right on point. I, I constantly get frustrated with how much other states are doing on, on marketing for tourism and how much more I think we need to be doing. And you know, I'm wondering from your perspective, because we have you know, so many different um, parts of our state, what you're hearing um, you know, from Eastern Connecticut and whether you think, you know, we should be looking at our tourism marketing um, with kind of a post COVID lens in terms of, you know, attracting people from our neighboring states to Connecticut right now, as people are looking to get out of cities um, and just any, any thoughts you have there in terms of how we should be kind of rethinking our tourism marketing. Well, I think the beauty of tourism marketing is that we can market, you know, within our state uh, you know, you've heard the term staycations, right? Uh, and I, I, I've often shared the fact that I've, I spent a couple of days in Torrington. Now, you know, if somebody told me that I would take a few days off and go to Torrington, I would probably have laughed many years ago, but we had a wonderful time. Uh, there's so many things to do in that section of the state, and it's beautiful there, the hiking and et cetera. So staycations are important, and we need to be able to market people who may be just tired of being in the house uh, with COVID fatigue and may want to take a day trip to Mystic or a day trip to, you know, to, to somewhere in Hartford and go to a museum or, or anywhere around the state. So I think it's important. And then the statewide marketing that does get us on a level or more level playing field with places like Providence and Boston and New York, those people, you know, want to get out of their cities and come to a place where they can you know, enjoy the out of doors and enjoy the many attractions we have along the, you know, the, uh, the seaside coast, which runs from one tip of our state to the other. So um, I truly believe that when this pandemic wanes, whether it's through the vaccine, which is probably the best economic development program we have going right now, and consumer confidence gets back, then our economy is going to just take off. Because I I believe the underlying economy to be so much stronger than it was in the Great Recession of 2009 or 10. Uh, the fundamental uh, strengths are there, and I think uh, we were seeing some signs of it in 19, uh, as you saw the numbers that we compared earlier. And uh, Madam Chair, I am told that you do have those uh, the written testimony with those numbers, but I'm happy to provide it. And anybody on the committee who wants to join the Tourism Caucus, we have I think we had 50 or so members show up at, at the first meeting, and it is a bipartisan uh, committee caucus that really underscores the fact that every corner of our state has a tourism aspect in one form or the other. Thank you very much, Senator. And yes, looking absolutely looking forward to, to working with you and, and this committee on, on this critical issue for our state. And I think we have you know such potential to not only help 
this industry, you know, survived this difficult period, but also to rebound stronger than ever, as you said, and, and you're right, it touches all of us, all of our districts. There's so many jobs at stake. So um, looking forward to working with you and uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Simmons. Uh, Senator Martin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, uh, Senator Formica. Uh, I, agree. I, I agree regarding that statewide marketing. Um, my wife and I just last night were talking about getting away and it wasn't thinking about traveling to another state. It was actually, you know, we just need a night just to go to another part of our own state here. And, uh, you know, you mentioned Mystic and that's exactly what the uh, town that we're talking about visiting. And uh, also maybe even visiting a Flanders fish market. I don't know if you ever heard of the, the restaurant, but uh, I heard it was quite good. So I do have a question, uh, Senator Formica. Could you just, you mentioned the, the, I think it was a hotel tax that is specifically a portion of that tax goes towards tourism. What percentage of that hotel tax actually goes to the tourism and in, in dollar values, how, what is that equal to? I thought I heard $13 million and then 4.6 million. I guess I just need a little bit of clarity regarding that. So if you, if you go back to when uh, Governor Rell was in, in, uh, in office, I think the tourism fund went down to a dollar just to keep the line item open. Governor Malloy brought it up to five million and we tried to find a way to, you know, to gradually increase that being mindful of the budgetary restraints that we have. So the hotel tax is 15% uh, on a room charge. Whenever you check into a room in, in Connecticut, there's a 15% tax. 10% of that 15% or $1.50 of each of those, each of that tax gets put aside for the tourism fund. Um, that generated about $13 million uh, last, uh, last year. Um, statewide marketing, which we use to promote, um, it's mostly now online in, in ways that we can do it, was about 4.6 million of that 13. And the rest went to support venues like, uh, you know, museums in and around the state, theaters in and around the state, uh, and uh, and other opportunities, places like the Mystic Aquarium and the Beardsley Zoo, and those kind of things, all get specific dollars. I will say that when uh, the the two tribes got together and and uh, started to open East Windsor, in that bill, you all may recall that. Uh, we were able to get a 10% of the, of the uh, table game revenue uh, to go to tourism um, in a way to diversify the revenue stream. That we expected to be four or five or six million depending on how well that was going to do. Now that never materialized, but that would have helped us get to almost the 20 million mark. And I'm hoping that as these new revenues start to be talked about, for example, online gaming and sports betting, is there an opportunity to, to tag a little bit of those dollars and, and send it to tourism because we know it's an investment and more than an expense? Uh, Senator Formica, uh, given the pandemic, you know, loss of revenue, how much of an impact have they, that fund uh, been affected? It's, it was 13 million. What is it currently? You know? I would expect it to probably be half of what it was. So even if we were able to adjust the percentage, we're still not going to come back um, to the level that we were uh, last year without some kind of uh, another shot in the arm. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that those conversations can be part of the budget process as we move forward. One last question. You mentioned the out of 13, 4 million or so goes towards the statewide marketing and then the balance is distributed to museums and uh, to tourist attractions, I'll call them that. How is that determined? How are those, uh, how, uh, how do you pick the Mystic Aquarium um, to you know, the Science Museum in, in West Hartford or the distribution of that? How's that determined? So th this goes back to the Malloy administration uh, and there was a list of those attractions and venues and museums that uh, had been getting uh, line item support. Uh, some uh, theaters, for example, uh, shared a line item, others were line item specific. 
Uh, and then there was a separate area for uh, statewide marketing and funding dollars that went to the DECD uh, tourism agency to, to support um, personnel. When we put this revenue stream together based on this 10%, we combined all of those into one fund. Uh, and we tried to be as, as comprehensive as possible to make sure that every district and every spot and every available attraction, you know, got something. Um, are there some that are shut out perhaps? Um, but, you know, my hope was that as we grow this fund to 20, 20 million is my first target. And then if we get to 25, then we can, uh, we can certainly help. But the other side of the coin is once we generate economic activity in the state, then perhaps we won't need to support all these attractions because they're going to be so busy, uh, you know, making money that they won't have to worry about it. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you both. Um, uh, I just have a question, um, Senator Formica. So we've got the 15% room tax. How does that compare to our neighboring states? Uh, Connecticut's hotel tax is one of the highest in the country. Uh, you may recall in the budget last year, there was a proposal to go to 17% and then take 2% um, you know, from that, um, take the extra 2% to go to that. But it just would have really hurt the industry to, to increase the tax level. Um, so that, uh, that never made it in the budget. It stayed at 15%. But and so... Is it your feeling that the 15% is the right number? Do we disadvantage ourselves in any way? I mean, people maybe don't look at the hotel tax when they're making consideration. Um, what's your experience? Well, I'm a proponent of always lower taxes than higher taxes. Um, I think, you know, it's shown that we can generate more economic activity with lower taxes. And uh, certainly there are you know, when people book rooms, uh, oftentimes uh, it, it says tax and charges are extra, but not specific. So there is a little bit of sticker shock sometimes when they when they check out. Um, but hopefully we provided them with such a good experience that, that they wouldn't do it. So it would be nice if we could lower that and, and help us be more competitive. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't tell you uh, with definitive what the surrounding state's hotel tax is. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know that. Um, so it's a quandary. Um, we need to fund them, but yet we, um, you know, disadvantagedly distinguish ourselves by, you know, being the top end on the, um, on the, on the taxing side. Um, okay. Uh, thanks uh, very much for all your work, Senator Formica, on this. And we, we so appreciate your leadership here. Um, and we do have a question, uh, I believe, from uh, Representative Nuccio. Uh, Madam? Yes, thank thank you, Madam. you very much, Madam Chair. Um, you had mentioned, I just want to make sure I have the number written down correctly. The 13 million, was that last calendar year or was that last um, fiscal year? Because I'm, I'm wondering how much of the 2020 impact is in that 13 million or what was the year prior? Fiscal. It's the last fiscal year. Yeah. Okay, so it would have March, April, May, and June in it. Do you know what the um, last fiscal year was? Was it significantly lower or higher than the 13? You know, to be honest with you, I don't recall. It was, it's been gradually increasing as the economy increases and more people stay in hotel rooms. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, all. And I see that there was a note. And by the way, we're not supposed to be using the chat, folks. Um, so uh, anyhow, but Elaine, um, uh, Carol uh, from, I think, OPM has let us know that, uh, or, or clarified, 7.5 million of 13 uh, goes to tourism. 5.5 has been um, designated for the arts. So we'll um, get clarity on these numbers as we go along. But I thank her for that input um, and help me out, Madam Clerk. Uh, is there anyone else hand raised? I do not see so. Um, thank you, Senator Formica for your time. Thank you uh, for the generosity of your time, Madam Chair. And if you have to send this to a probe, send along a little note of support with it. 
<laughs> and we'll send a little smiley face with Senator Formica on there. Um, and we thank and you we, so much. And we do have your written testimony. It's really important because you were very helpful to um, really uh, you know, put some clarity on these numbers. Thank you, Senator. Um, you. We would move on now to um, Senator Summers from the 18th. Madam, you have the floor. Good morning. And uh, thank you to the chairs and the ranking members for allowing me to speak today in support of two bills. Um, I would just like to say um, to Ranking Member Martin, I'm glad you chose Mystic to come visit as the Senator who happens to represent Mystic and Stonington. You heard from our one of our first selectmen and the number one tourist destination in Connecticut. I'd be happy to give you a tour. Mystic is a wonderful place as are many other places here in the state of Connecticut to visit and to recreate and to enjoy. So I'm here to support Bill 6119. Um, I'm not gonna go through the numbers because you all have heard them. Um, I am have written testimony, but I'm not going to read it and I will submit it later today. But I wanted you to know, I do support the governor's proposal to add $9 million to help sure up some of the uh, shortfalls that we have experienced here in the arts and culture and tourism industries. However, I don't think it's, it goes far enough. Um, as you have heard, um, tourism is an integral building block in our state's economy, uh, creating over $1.7 billion in revenue to the state. It employs over 180,000 jobs uh, here in the state of Connecticut. And as you have heard repeatedly, although the numbers differ from which study you look at, for every dollar that we invest, in tourism, we return $3 in tax revenue to our state. So when you look at it um, holistically, um, investing in tourism is probably about the best investment that you could make anywhere um, right now. And our state, unfortunately, is not competitive with our surrounding states that as we watch them put $80 million into tourism and attract more and more folks to their states rather than the state of Connecticut. Um, so I do support looking at the formula, um, changing the amount of money from 10% to 25%, I'm sorry, from 15% to 25% um, to come out of our hotel tax. I do not think that we should raise our hotel tax. It is already one of the highest in the nations um, and that could dissuade people from wanting to come here. But I do think that there's a great opportunity to really make that investment. Again, it's an investment, it's not an expenditure uh, that will reap great rewards for the state of Connecticut, help our tourism industry, uh, help create jobs and help maintain this wonderful um, you know, tourism and arts and culture that we have currently on the move here in Connecticut. If it wasn't for our uh, COVID experience, I think we would be in a much different place. But I have always advocated for a dedicated line item for an investment in tourism. And I would like to see it be $25 million. You know, the state of New York a few years ago, uh, the governor Cuomo had made a, a, a uh, I guess an agreement with the tourism industry. And each year uh, they would come back. It started, I believe at $25 million. And they said, give us $25 million and we'll show you what we can do. It moved up to 50 because they saw the great returns and now it's close to $80 million. So I think Connecticut really has to um, recognize this and try to be more competitive. As you've heard the speakers talk previously, there are wonderful opportunities for tourism, arts and culture throughout the state of Connecticut. Um, you know, uh, Senator Formica went to Torrington. I have not spent uh, a weekend in Torrington, but just going to someplace like Kent Falls or Devil's Hop Yard, all these different places that many of us, you know, we forget. You, we get accustomed to all these wonderful places that we have here in the state of Connecticut. But I will tell you, trying to get a restaurant, um, you know, a reservation this weekend. I know it's Valentine's Day, but Mystic is booked. There's people from Washington and New York coming here. So I think we could spread that uh, throughout the state of Connecticut with the appropriate marketing dollars um, that will return a huge investment in the state of Connecticut. So I fully support 6119 as a member of appropriations. I will happily accept that bill that you will forward uh, with a smiley face and advocate to have dollars spent in the budget towards tourism. The next um, bill that I would like to speak about is also an important one. It accompanies this bill, in, in my opinion. It's bill number 624. And what this bill does is give a dedicated seat on the uh, advisory committee on tourism to something called the CTC. That's the Connecticut uh, Tourism Coalition. This coalition is made up of 
of experts, of marketing experts, of people that are actually in the industry um, that have great uh, expertise and have actually shown that they can leverage private dollars coupled with state dollars to make a larger impact for tourism. When the Blue Ribbon Task Force um, discussed tourism, an advisory board or committee was created, but for some reason, the CTC was not given a dedicated seat. I think we need to have all of the tourism industry on the same page, moving in the same direction. We don't want um, tourism organizations competing against each other. It does not work. Um, I think they bring fresh ideas and they are the ones actually doing the work. They run large hotels. They um, are people that are involved in the Mystic Aquarium as part of this. So I really think they need to have a dedicated seat. There are members that are in the CTC that have seats on this advisory committee, but in a different role. So I really think it's important that the CTC, as these people move on, have a seat at the table. And I know that you will be hearing from others on this bill today. So I thank you for your time and listening to uh, my advocacy on these two bills. And if anyone has any questions, I am happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Senator Summers. Uh, refresh my memory. Did we have this concept before us, uh, the 624, previously? Oh, I think I, I, not that I, I am aware of, but I could be wrong. This is something that I know that they were advocating for. They were part of the Blue Ribbon Task Force on tourism, um, and I think it's a huge mistake because if you look at their membership, it's a wide breadth and it covers many different industries in tourism. But these are experts. These are people actually doing the job. And I think it's very, very important that you have people that are actually in the trenches doing the job, being successful, especially in this time of COVID, that have a dedicated spot. Because you may have someone who also is a member of the CTC who's, who's representing, for example, the Restaurant Association. But as they're in that role on the advisory board as the Restaurant Association, and as they move on, we need to make sure that the CTC has a seat at that table. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your um, uh, um, your testimony here. I'm just kind of looking at information that's coming in here on the chat. Um, are there questions uh, from my colleagues? Let's see. I don't see any right here. Um, and uh, uh, yes, Senator Martin, you have a question? I'm sorry. I, I have a hard time finding this. Raise your hand uh, feature I, here. Just very quick uh, uh, comment to Senator Summers. Uh, thank you about your invite to uh, uh, the Mystic area, but I just want to remind, uh, I'm glad to hear Senator Formica visiting Torrington area, and uh, uh, but I do want to extend an invitation to you that Bristol has, you know, wonderful attractions itself for the, the 31st district, I'll say. We have lay compounds in Bristol along with the Carousel Museum. We have the Clark Museum as well. Thomaston has uh, the Opera House in addition to the uh, Railroad Museum in New England. So we also have uh, quite a bit of uh, tourist features uh, or attractions here in this part of the state of Connecticut. And I'm glad that the whole, that committee or that council is looking at the entire state as, as a tourist area for many people in the uh, New England area. So thank you. Th thank you very much, um, Senator Martin. And so um, I, uh, I have just um, been given some information that we'll share with everyone in Connecticut. Um, so we have a 15% um, hospitality tax, Mass has 5.7, Rhode Island has five, New Hampshire has 9%, Vermont 9%, and Maine has 9%. So those are the numbers, folks. Um, okay, uh, if there are no other questions, I'm looking to see, I don't see any other hands raised. Um, I thank you very much, Senator Summers, for your advocacy and being with us today. And I'd like to now invite uh, Senator Maroney. Sorry, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Buckley has a question, his hand is raised. Oh, pardon me. I missed that. I did look, though, Representative Buckley. Oh, I was kind of in between on the end of that. Sorry, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, certainly in support, and, and I wanted to uh, chime in briefly that as we're talking about great things, I agree. I think the same thing uh, needs to happen with more Western Connecticut. Uh, we talked about 
I, I loved hearing Senator uh, Fleming earlier mention Torrington, uh, become a little further south in there and you get to the best town in the USA. So uh, we can have that discussion all aboard, but I, I think that's fantastic. Um, I really wanted to jump in to ensure that uh, everyone knew, especially Senator Martin knew uh, where that hand raise button is. Are you going to participants and then slide to the right, you'll see the raise hand button there. So uh, really, I know a lot of us tend to do this a lot. We all end up going, I want, you know, here, we're actually physically raising our hands, but uh, uh, just for reference, uh, participants, then slide to the right, you'll see raise hand. That's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thanks for um, that extra little um, instruct there. Uh, and so we will move on now to uh, Senator Maroney. You with us, sir? Uh, Madam Clerk, do we know if Senator Maroney is on deck? It looks like he's not here at the moment. Okay, because I did see him yeah, um, earlier, but I, we must have popped off. Okay, so so uh, we will circle back to Senator Maroney, um, and I would like to um, now proceed to uh, Cynthia Ryder from the Hartford stage. Cynthia, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Oh, hey, how Good are morning. you? Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and to everyone on the committee. And thank you to everyone who's spoken so eloquently. I'm also here to support House Bill 6119, the arts and tourism. I'm the managing director at Hartford Stage, and Hartford Stage is one of six of the Connecticut flagship producing theaters. There's written testimony for you with some, um, some of our case of support for this. And I just want to underscore some of the statements that have already been made about there is never been a more important time to support arts and tourism. We are always a part of the economic vitality of this state and the fun of uh, whether we go to Torrington or Mystic or Hartford or anywhere else in the state, but we can really play a key role um, in the economic revitalization if we can be stable and open and the state support in that is going to be really important. Um, the regional tourism, the Connecticut flagship producing theaters have won Tony Awards, Pulitzer Prizes. So we certainly have a standing in the country to be great attractions. And we're also your neighborhood community um, assets. Even in this time where we can't be performing live, for instance, Hartford Stage is serving thousands and thousands of students and teachers virtually in school, after school, on the weekend, and we will do so again. In a normal year, the flagship producing theaters serve over 40,000 students. That's quiet work that you don't always hear about, but we're very much continuing that as well as the important work of the live art that we produce on stage. It's been an incredibly difficult time for any live performance. We're one of the first to close, we'll be one of the last to reopen. Hartford Stage, just as an example, had to uh, lay off 70% of our staff. Um, we look for the day when we can again be producing and hire more people, uh, but it, it's just not a more important time for us to be able to contribute um, in downtown Hartford, the restaurant across the street from us is closed. The restaurant down the street is closed. When we are reopened, other things will reopen as well and we'll bring people back to downtown Hartford and to where all the theaters and arts and culture are in the state. So thank you for your support at this incredibly important time. Cynthia, thank you very much um, for your leadership. You have an incredible venue. Uh, you know, the performing theaters are, um, so, so essential to our entire um, arts and culture um, economy, communities, your point about when you close, the restaurants around you close, that is also true. Um, and um, we really uh, look forward to the time when those lights are gonna go back on. We talked a little bit earlier about the SBA um, relief for the shuttered venues, which is coming about. I know you folks will be all ready with your done numbers and you know teed up to go. That's been the advice we've gotten from um, SBA. And we look forward to trying to assist in any way we can going forward. Um, and uh, so, let me just see if I have any hands raised. I see none. Madam Clerk, if I missed something, please correct me. 
Um, thanks so much. Um, uh, stay in touch and stay tuned, Cynthia. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all very much for doing this work for us. Oh, the best. Um, we will now move on to um, uh, our, our next speaker, uh, Leslie Elias Said. Uh, she is from the Traveling Children's Theater, um, art director and president. Are you with us, madam? Yes. Yes, you are. You, oh, I think you're muted. You're, you're still muted. Am I good there, now? You're good. Okay, well, it's a great honor, Madam Chair. I will be in touch if there's anything anything else. Okay, uh, thanks so much. Else has to okay. mute. Okay, <laughs> sorry. To, to all of you on, this is a great honor. Uh, Grumbling Griffins Traveling Children's Theater, I am the artistic director, and we're now entering our 41st year. We just celebrated, uh, despite COVID, outdoors um, last summer with social distancing. Um, we are grateful to be part of this state and this wonderful state. And we have performed probably in every elementary school. Hang on, let me get rid of this phone. Sorry about that. In every elementary school in this state, museum, library, every venue that you could think of, without the support of the Connecticut Office of the Arts, I don't think we would be where we are today. They have been tirelessly providing programming, um, grant opportunities, visibility so that people, that we can, uh, they have provided great things for our company and not only us, but throughout the state. We have employed countless mask makers, artists, um, musicians, composers, started and launched careers for young actors, people of all ages, people of all races, religions. Our work is innovative and we work interactively in the schools. Uh, it's been a tough year because we have had no in-school performances, which is our bread and butter. Uh, but thanks to the help with the COVID relief and other grant opportunities, we've been able to develop virtual material and interactive and uh, with Hartford Performs, where we work every year in inner city with kids, we've they've purchased four of our um, interactive educational videos that children will learn. But that was basically through a grant through the Connecticut Office on the Arts that enabled us to really do excellent virtual programming, which is interactive, which is so important right now to empower the children and disenfranchise them from alienation, which all of us are going through, but we are working very hard to continue. Without that support, we wouldn't be able to do it. And we, we social distance, we work with masks. We just produced some videos with children um, about empowerment with song, movement, storytelling, and it's, really exciting actually to get that support to continue on and inspire children, artists, people of all ages. We thank you for the work you do and we're honored to speak here today. I don't know if anybody has any questions, but in 2003, we won the Governor's Arts Award in the state of Connecticut. And we're honored as a small nonprofit to be able to be part of the fabric of this state where We've performed in almost every venue you could think of. Uh, Leslie, th thank you so much for being um, with us, but more importantly, thank you for um, your incredible um, love and expertise in the arts um, and to be traveling, uh, a traveling venue uh, on, on top of it, I know it has to be additional um, challenges, but um, so, so vital. Uh, if there are no questions, um, I, I see none. Um, Can I add one more fun thing? Oh, please do. Well, I always wanted to write a cookbook from the point of view of traveling throughout the state and all the different restaurants that our actors would, um, you know, and hotels. So we ourselves support the arts and the tourism and it's all, you know, intertwined. And, you know, I can't wait till 
the venues all open and we support other artists. We're all in it together and restaurants, everybody. So thank you so much. And thank you for the work you all do. Um, well, uh, our, our gratitude is to you, uh, Cynthia. Um, excuse me, Leslie. Uh, thank you so much for being with us and seeing no um, hands raised. Um, I'm going to um, go on to our next speaker, uh, which, and, and Madam um, Clerk, let me know, uh, we have to circle back to Senator Maroney if in fact he um, it comes back uh, online with us. Uh, okay. And so, I'll, hello? Sorry, I, I said yes, we'll do. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, um, so Tony Sheridan, um, he is uh, the Chamber of Commerce um, I'm not sure what town, uh, Tony, um, the floor is yours, sir. You want to tell us, um, I'm sorry, what chamber this is? Sure. It's the Chamber of Commerce of Eastern Connecticut. Oh, okay. And I'm so pleased to hear so much conversation going on about Eastern Connecticut, and it's all accurate, I can assure you. I'm actually here representing the Eastern Regional Tourism District and the Greater Mystic Chamber of Commerce. The Greater Mystic Chamber of Commerce partners with the, uh, this chamber to provide the administrative services for the Eastern Regional Tourism District. Clearly, um, it's incredibly important that we get the economy open again, and there's no better way to do it than through the small businesses, the hundreds of small businesses that represent the tourism industry, the arts and tourism industry. Um, let me just say uh, that I sent a letter in with all of the details on the numbers that relate to this uh, tourism in, uh, and cultural and tourism industry. So I'm not going to go into the details uh, of that with, since you have that written testimony. <clears throat> but look, at this is not just about tourism. This is about our economy. This is about jobs. The people that really have been desperately hurt are the people who are in the arts and tourism business. They have paid an enormous price. We all miss it. And um, I will tell you, there's a, um, in addition to the problems with our economy, I believe there's a growing psychological problem that, that all of us are going to be impacted by over the next um, months as we wait for the tourism business to get back to some semblance of normalcy. Uh, we, we enjoy being out. We enjoy the theater, the arts, the, the uh, visiting restaurants. And without the uh, support and, and, uh, of the state and getting us back into um, the business in a real way, and that's why we support uh, the bill before you, the, the, the um, bill number, oh, I lost a copy of it here, right? Well, it's uh, House Bill 6119. <clears throat> Uh, it's really, really important that we really put as much money into this uh, uh, tourism business as we possibly can, because that's where our economy is. That's going to be the recovery. That's going to be the foundation of the recovery of our economy. I look at I, I will leave it there. You folks are wonderful. I've, this is a new technology to me as it is to you, but thank you for making it available. Uh, yes, Tony, uh, thanks for being with us. Thanks for your advocacy. Um, and, um, you know, we'll kind of get through this together with a little Yankee ingenuity and, uh, you know, uh, the good old uh, roll up your sleeves approach. Thanks. Thanks for being with us. I don't see any other um, hands raised. And so uh, with that, I'm going to uh, move on to Colin Sheehan. Uh, Hello. Colin? I am here. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, please proceed. Hi. Uh, I first want to thank Representative Comey for inviting me to speak today. I wear many hats in Brantford, Connecticut. I am the arts, culture, and special events coordinator for the town. I'm also the artistic coordinator and director of PR for the Legacy Theater. I'm the artistic director and... Um, I direct all the musicals at Tabor Arts Bramford and the director of the Bramford High School Spring Musical. The arts saved my life and I am devastated that my students and adults have missed out on creating art for the last year. For 14 years, I lived in New York City, 
and worked in theater and television. And I moved back to my hometown of Brantford, Connecticut to create the theater scene that I yearned for as a child. My programs have tripled or quadrupled in size since 2017 and 2018. The need is there and the arts saves lives. What has helped most people get through the last 11 months? The arts. Let's create jobs for one of the hardest hit industries, bring more tourists to Connecticut, stimulate the economy, and be an arts hero and support House Bill 6119. That is it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Colin. Um, and thank you for your incredible work and agility in, uh, in this sector. Um, and thanks for coming home. Uh, are there questions from my colleagues? Um, seeing none, uh, thanks for being with us, sir. Uh, we'll move on now to Dan, uh, Daniel Fitzmorris. Daniel, you're with us. How are Thank you? Thank you. Sir? Good morning. Good to see you. So uh, I'm, I'm Daniel Fitzmorris. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I live in Orange, and I'm the executive director of the Arts Council of Greater New Haven, which is located on the traditional lands of the Quinnipiac, Pogasset, and Wappinger people. I'm so appreciative of the committee for considering this bill, House Bill 6119, which the Arts Council and our members strongly support. This is not a Zoom background. I'm actually at the Neighborhood Music School in New Haven. Um, this recital hall is usually filled every hour of every day, but it has been collecting dust for nearly a year and really won't reopen anytime soon. However, they're also teaching 100 hours of online lessons every day and running their preschool and middle school programs in person on site. Um, our artists and creative institutions were the first to close and will be the last to reopen, but these pivots and adaptations prove how essential the arts truly are to our residents. This bill will strengthen the tourism fund and represents just 0.2% of the state budget. That's 0.2%. Um, there's been a course of support for the bill, so I'm going to take this time to point out an additional opportunity. So the hotel occupancy tax is a natural fit for investing in these industries. If we are successful, then hotels will be successful too. But it's the only source of revenue for the tourism fund. So due to this connection between lodging and our industries, it makes sense. But there actually are two other related tax revenue streams that aren't going to the tourism fund that are worth considering with this bill. The first is the admission tax. Um, you might not notice this, but you pay this when you go to the movies or buy a concert ticket or a sporting event. It brings in about $40 million a year to the general fund. The second, believe it or not, is called the tourism surcharge. <laughs> That's levied on car rentals. It brings in about $5 million a year, but it doesn't go to the tourism fund. It goes to the general fund. So combined, there's $45 million of other related revenue. So allocating even a small percentage to the tourism fund would deepen this collaboration between all these diverse industries and make this special fund even more sustainable. I also wanna mention that the federal government and the governor's administration have really provided significant support to helping our sector over the last year, whether it's PPP or CARES Act funding, and even the governor's budget yesterday. But HB 6119 is really the key opportunity for the legislators to do their part and make Connecticut just as vibrant, healthy, and connected during and beyond the pandemic. I'll take questions if there are any, but thanks so much. So Daniel, I, that's what I was thinking. You are on site um, as I was noticing the background and um, lamenting the fact that there was an echo there. Yes. Yeah, I know, I know. We've got to move on and get rid of those echoes. I mean, the vaccine is, you know, someone said it earlier, one of our strongest economic tools. Um, and we, we need to, you know, roll that out, stand that up and, um, and then, yes, get back to the arts and get back to the wonderful life um, that the arts provides for us in Connecticut and the quality of life we do enjoy. Uh, Daniel, thanks so much for your incredible work um, and your artistic talent and oversight. Uh, so let me just take a peek here. Uh, yes, my colleague, Senator Martin has his hand raised. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Daniel, thank you for testifying, first of all, and uh, nice to see a different background, actually. So, Could you just quickly go over those that $40 million that goes to the general fund once more, please? Yeah, sure. So um, the first I mentioned is called the admissions tax. Uh, you can you can look up those bills. I don't have the number handy. So that's it's only levied on for profit venues. Um, so that would be a for profit concert hall, a for profit uh, sporting event. It wouldn't be a nonprofit theater or a community uh, music concert. Uh, and that brings in forty million dollars a year. Um, the other, I've always thought this is kind of funny, it's called the tourism surcharge <laughs> that's levied on car rentals. Um, and that brings in about $5 million per year. Now, both of these admission taxes and tourism surcharges have been greatly depleted over the last 10, 12 months. But once again, that's a similar opportunity to looking at the hotel occupancy tax, right? It's a pretty small investment today that will grow with the industries over the next couple of years. Um, uh, the governor's budget yesterday mentioned it might not be until 2023 that hotel occupancy tax is restored to the level it was at pre-pandemic. That I don't know what the estimate, where that estimate comes from, but I assume the same would be true for the admissions tax and this uh, tourism surcharge as well. Wouldn't know if these, when these funds were first established, they were were they meant to be designated for tourism specifically? Uh, I don't know about either in either case. They're pretty common taxes. I, with As far as the tourism surcharge, I, I would be surprised if there wasn't some original intention around that being invested into tourism, given the name. Okay. I missed that. You were so broken up there. Can you just repeat that one more time? Oh, sure. I, I can't say for sure, but I think I would imagine that something called the tourism surcharge was intended to be spent on tourism. Okay, great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Daniel. I'm just looking to see if we have other hands raised. I'm seeing none. But uh, Daniel, I wanted to ask you. Yeah, so um, I have seen and followed the, these line items. What is, do you know what the number of for-profit venues are that we have in the state? No, there's a large okay. number. I would say yeah. that periodically over the years, there will be a bill proposed to um, exempt a for-profit venue from the admissions yeah. tax, like the XL Center, for instance, right. um, or to phase it out. But but it's still, um, it hasn't had a deep impact when I was looking at the revenue from the admission tax over the years. So the revenue has been pretty consistent for the admissions tax until 2020 when the pandemic hit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what What is that? tax? Uh, it's 10%. Uh, it's also 6% for movies. So uh, it's 10% for th everything else that is ticketed, like a ticketed attraction, um, amusement yeah. center. But for the movies, it's only 6%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Thanks for um, your great testimony. Stay safe. Um, and uh, we, we're looking forward. That's it. Yes, exactly. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Daniel. Be well. Um, seeing no other hands raised, um, I'd like to invite, um, hold on a minute. Uh, we, we're like, um, I'd like to uh, invite, well, I know Senator Kelly is on deck. Is, is he with us, um, Ginger? Uh, not yet? No? Oh, okay. So if he is not with us at the moment, we're going to um, invite David Dorfman, who is with the New London Arts Council. David? Hello. Hi. Hi, how are you? Thanks for hey. having me. I'm good. Um, my <laughs> good. Uh, is my camera on? Can you see me? No, I can't see you. There you I go. Okay. You okay. Yeah. I think you can see me now. My name is David Dorfman, he, him, his pronouns, and... I'm talking to you from Mashantuck and Pequot and Mohegan land and from Namiog, the ancient name for uh, New London. Uh, thank you all for your hard work for the arts and for allowing us to speak today. I am moved by today's testimony and I am here in strong support of HB 6119. I have a degree in business, so I enjoy the figures brought to light here today, although I will not be using those kinds of figures. And thanks for this opportunity to perform. As Cynthia and others documented, we artists are in search and in need for any opportunity to form. So I, I appreciate it. Uh, 
I first hope, came to hope measure up as an audience. <laughs> I hope so. I first came to Connecticut to get my MFA in dance at Connecticut College in New London in 1979. I then moved to New York City and founded my vainly named and internationally acclaimed dance company, David Dorfa Dance, 33 years ago in New York City. But this state, and although Colin stole my line, thank you, Colin, art saved my life, and this state saved my life. I am a dance artist who has choreographed on Broadway and educator teaching now for the last 17 years at that same Connecticut College in New London, and an advocate via my counselorship on the year-old New London Arts Council, which is aided greatly by Southeast Connecticut Cultural Coalition, from whom you will hear eloquently in a bit by Wendy Burry, and also aided by the City of New London, Amir Passero and his staff, and proudly through my full-time residence in New London. I also claim a new title as of last night, courtesy of the imaginative, imaginative invention of Drea, an incredible young black writer, film director, who also leads young BIPOC folk at Writer's Block Inc. in New London. She described herself last night as an artivist, an artist activist. And I love that idea. And I've tried to do that my entire professional life. My two cents worth today, or more appropriately, my up to 25% and 40% share, i.e. once again, supporting 6119 and foregrounding arts and culture, is that, as Cynthia said, art is more necessary than ever before. It is how we understand our changing and complex world and regarding the name change, which hasn't been mentioned much today, although I agree that tourism is a win-win for the state of Connecticut, and I totally support it, I want to underscore the worth of art on a local level, a worth hard to quantify to the tens and th of thousands of people that live in and around a community, i.e. the culture of a community that gather in the dark or outside in the light to experience something together and to be transformed and to have learned something about themselves. Now, please excuse my mention of another state, although Senator Formica pleasantly beat me to it, but at my day job, we often talk about peer institutions. Uh, my days in New York State, where I lived before moving back here, were filled with incredible support for arts of all kinds. It's already been uh, mentioned to piggyback on Senator Formica and, and Senator Summers' ideas of upping our overall arts, culture, and tourism budget, and even using betting funds to help the arts and tourism and Daniel Fitzmaurice's ideas as well. I briefly mentioned the state of Minnesota's crafty arrangement where the arts and cultural heritage funds receives 19.75% of the sales tax revenue resulting from the clean water land and legacy amendment to support arts, arts education uh, and arts access and to preserve Minnesota's history and cultural heritage. I fervently wish this kind of commitment for Connecticut and I feel we are doing that today. Thank you all for being here. Lastly, this enduring worth is not just for the viewer. The worth is for the maker in the process of making art and beyond. Creating in its broadest term and most acute way of seeing it is what has brought all of us here today. You assembled legislators are creating a new path forward for the state. Thank you very much. Let art be a priority. End of prepared David, remarks. <laughs> David, thank you very much for, for with us. I just get this sense as I'm listening to today's testimony that we are graced with some incredibly talented people. Um, and um, certainly you are uh, very much amongst them. Uh, and I love that uh, we're going to coin this term, artivism. I love that. That's great. Good. Um, Good. We're going to, you know, um, Raise that that um, moniker. Um, if if there are no questions for David, and I'm checking again, um, I'm just going to thank you for being with us and for um, thank all you so much for having me. Your work and thanks for coming back home. Thank you, You're getting welcome. Connecticut. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Vita Muir uh, from the Litchfield Performing Arts, the artistic director. Are you with us, Vita? Um, so, uh, Ginger or Wendy, um, correct me if uh, we, we don't seem to have Vita at this moment. Um, we will circle back. And we were also waiting at 1130 for Senator Kelly. Um, 
And I'm not, is Senator Kelly with us? Okay, uh, we're going to um, move on to Thomas Reed. Uh, he's a graduate assistant at the University of Connecticut. Thomas. Um, Hi, can you hear me? I, yes, indeed. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Thomas Reed, uh, graduate student at the University of Connecticut. I'm a member of UConn's Graduate Employee Union, GEU UAW Local 6950. Uh, I'm writing to testify on House Bill number 5150, uh, an act establishing a state hiring program for recent college graduates. Uh, I oppose this bill as written. While I agree with its state of purpose to attract and to retain recent graduates for living and working in Connecticut, I believe the language in the bill would actually make doing so more difficult for them. Making employees ineligible to join any collective bargaining unit for their first five years of this program denies them the important benefits and security that are granted to workers who are covered under collective bargaining agreements. I'm originally from New York, uh, and before I began my graduate studies at UConn, I had spent very little time in Connecticut. So when I moved here in the fall following my undergraduate degree, I did not know what to expect. Uh, and I quickly developed a great affection for the state and especially for the quiet corner where I currently live in Willington. Connecticut is full of natural beauty. And I find that the common pace of living and my kind neighbors compare very favorably to urbanized, hectic and impersonal New York. When I graduate with my PhD in material science this year, I will apply for work in Connecticut's lively public sector with the aim of maintaining the life that I built here while at UConn. However, if during my job applications, I became aware of a program such as the one described in House Bill 5150, I would avoid any state workplace participating in this program. If that meant leaving Connecticut, I would do so. It is apparent to me that this bill would have the effect of greatly diminishing the membership of any union subject to it. A union with low membership is a weak union. And with all the protection and support unions afford members, I would be deeply concerned. I would be making myself vulnerable to a volatile and unforgiving economy by seeking employment in a position in which low union membership was being partially enforced by Connecticut. If the state wants to keep graduates and talent within its borders, then they need to provide meaningful economic incentives that are rooted in fairness and equity. Barring people from being part of their workplace's union for five years, for, for a small compensation in return is neither of those things. Thank you for your consideration of my testimony. Uh, so Thomas, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you uh, for adopting us as our home right now. Um, we don't wanna see you leave and good luck with your um, you know, completion and um, becoming a professional in the material science area, um, very, very obviously important um, sector. Uh, I am grateful for hearing your testimony. Uh, we in the Commerce Committee basically, um, you know, put out for conversation uh, proposals. And that's why your testimony is so crucial to us. Um, and we will continue to, uh, one, promote the state of Connecticut and try to embrace all those policies which help to make this state the place it is and to plant the flag here. So um, we're grateful for your, uh, your testimony. I'm trying to see if I have any hands raised, which I don't see unless I've missed someone. Um, with that, thanks, Thomas. Um, thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much. Okay, um, next, uh, if neither, uh, neither um, Vita or Senator Maroney or Senator Kelly are with us, we're going to um, ask Paul Angelusi uh, from the AFT, the SVT AFT, uh, Vice President. Paul, are you here? Yeah. Please. Yeah, hi, Hello. Paul. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good. So, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Congress Committee. My name, thank you for having me today. My name is Paul Angelusi. I am a proud plumbing trade teacher for the state of Connecticut, as well as the vice president of the State Federation of uh, Teachers. So, I submitted testimony. I stand opposed to Bill 5612. 
I won't read it. I just want to share my first year of teaching and take you through it. And, and I will stay for any questions. Uh, I came on board in 2007. And after 25 years in the trade, I'm an alum of the system. I graduated Bullet Havens. Uh, after 25 years, I wanted to go back and teach. But when you join the state as a teacher, you're non-tenured for four years. So we're evaluated differently. And there's formal observations. They consist of the assistant principal or the principal coming into your shop, watching you for an hour, deliver the lesson, making sure the curriculum's being obtained and retained by the students, as well as built upon the prior. There's also a pre and a post. Um, there's a lot to it, but here's where it gets interesting. The person sitting in front of me is a master in their craft, as am I. But those are different crafts. That assistant principal, she or he are looking for my teaching ability. And the only place I got that teaching ability were from the classes that I had to take. We're required, all new teachers are required to take three in their first year. One of those is a special ed class and the two are very basic how to teach. So you have a, myself, a master plumber, and then you have a, uh, a principal and those are two completely different careers. And what they're looking for, whether I'm gonna be moved on to the next year is, judged solely upon my teaching ability. So this bill would set people up for failure. It wouldn't be good for students. I, will, I would be open to lowering the amount of classes from 10 to maybe six, um, but they are crucial. Because if I look back in 2007, when I left the trade, I started the state at a salary of $66,000 a year I had three kids under the age of 12. Uh, that was a 65% pay cut for me to leave my career and come and teach. And for me to be, you know, erroneously set up to fail, being told, you know, I don't need these teaching classes, but the only way I'm retaining my job is I'm a good teacher. So um, I thank you for your time. I just wanted to lay that out. Any questions you might have? Uh, so, um, Paul, th thank you so much for being with us. And also the trades are so important. And this committee um, is very invested in um, you know, trying to support that. But can you help me out? I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused. You said 5312? Uh, Bill 5312, Paul? 5612, I'm sorry. 5612. It's a oh. concerning oh. teacher certification. Yes, yes, okay, yes, 5612, yeah. Okay, um, did you give us written testimony, Paul? Yes, we, yes, I did. Okay, that's very important. Um, are there questions from our, um, uh, our, our colleagues here? Yes, uh, Representative Leeper, you have the floor, ma'am. Hi, Paul. Thank you so much for submitting your testimony today. So I submitted this bill just so that I could help facilitate exactly this type of conversation Perfect. about how we can address not only our teacher shortage areas in the trades, but also how we can better ramp up these programs to meet the needs of our workforce pipeline and provide more students access to these careers and what are, in the end, really good paying jobs. It is challenging to attract professionals into these teaching positions exactly for the reason you said, when you can earn so much more in the private sector. Uh, you may not know, but my background actually is in education. Um, so I am committed to working together to deliver both expanded opportunities for students um, in the classroom and beyond. I worked for in a school district. I worked actually for the State Department of Ed and here locally as a Board of Education member in Fairfield. Um, so I certainly have no interest in preventing teachers from gaining valuable training, nor preventing students from being taught by teachers with the necessary training. So I just have a few questions. My understanding of the current law is that it allows trade professionals to teach in our technical high schools so long as they complete nine credits 
um, both in pedagogy and special education, and they have they can defer these credits for up to three years. So they can teach on day one with no courses whatsoever and, and continue to defer to take completing these courses for up to three years. So you are almost 100% correct. It is nine credits within your first year. It's 30 in total for a trade teacher. So we, our tuition reimbursement covers nine credits a year. I can tell you that every teacher, every trade teacher that comes into the district, I personally meet them and sign them up into the union. But the first thing I give them is actually my transcript, my transcript from Central Connecticut College of the 10 classes I took and the important ones. And as I said earlier, um, it would be more attractive if it wasn't 10 and it could be lowered to six and we can still be very effective. So but with that being said, you're not told that during the interview. On the job description, it does say nine, but that's nine in the first year. And then you find out it's 30 in total um, to get your professional teaching certification, your 090 in our district. So, um, and, and that's very helpful because the first three, one of them is, as I said, is a special ed class and the other two, are you know very very helpful. So I would like to work with you and lend any support I can, you know, on this matter. Because I think at the end of the day, what we want to try to do is make sure that these aren't deterrents for people who have had long and successful and fulfilling careers in the trades from entering teaching when we desperately need you to do so. Um, so I welcome your thoughts on how we can meaningfully achieve that. And then I also was wondering if there's any data around um, student outcomes between having these classes and like not having these classes. Cause I thought even though you needed to take the nine credits in your first year, you could defer that up to three years. So you could be teaching for three years without really having taken any credits as the way, as the law currently stands. They, they, um, they really, I would say out of all the teachers I've signed up and I signed them all up, I'd say about 40 to 50% of them actually take the three initial, it's a VTE 113, a 16, and then the SPED. About 45 to 50% of them take them before they even apply. And then the other 55% or so get the job. And then, um, and that's because tuition reimbursement kicks in after your first day of employment. So, um, but, yeah, I mean, the students obviously are, are better served if they, uh, you know, take those classes first. Because what, what you have to realize, and, and people miss sometimes, and, and if I could have you picture me teaching a 18 or 19 year old on a, a lift on a job site 30 feet up plumbing versus me teaching a 14 or 15 year old special needs student in, my, in a high school. You know, the, those are two very different, uh, they look very different and you need the structure uh, to get you there. You know, you, you really do. Can I ask your thoughts? And thank you, Madam Chair. I, I hope I'm not going too long. Um, <laughs> thank you. About um, almost like an adjunct opportunity because exactly what you said it is a really different teaching experience to be up on the fork teaching plumbing versus in the classroom and if there are avenues where we could be channeling and recruiting more professionals to be lending their skills to kids in an adjunct capacity rather than a full-time teaching capacity because Again, we know it is hard to recruit these people who can make four times more in the private sector. And nonetheless, we desperately need them. I, I totally agree. Uh, to your point earlier, they can't defer for three years. They can only defer for one year. So they're kind of under the pressure to get it done. But I have always wanted um, a shadowing uh, opportunity for people in the trades to come in with our trade teachers 
and really to get a taste of it before, because it is uh, like in, in 2007, when I took a 65% pay cut, my, thank God my wife was supportive, but when you walk away from all of that and, and maybe sell your business, sometimes there's no going back. So, but a shadowing um, opportunity would, would pay dividends as far as us staffing. I mean, I see the shortages in the manufacturing. Our district offers 32 offerings in total, really in 20 locations in the state. They vary from school to school. Each school has anywhere from nine to 13 offerings. But um, if we had a decent shadowing program for interested candidates, because the, higher, the onboarding process um, is time consuming, I can tell you yesterday that as of yesterday, there was 33 job postings, 14 of them, there was a, uh, our trade positions. So it'll be interesting. Those jobs were posted yesterday and I'll probably be signing those people up realistically in May or June, uh, you know. Um, so yeah, the faster we can get qualified people in, I will help in any way I can. I really appreciate those thoughts and I would love to connect again after today on, on how we can try to come up with something that can help achieve, achieve that end oh. and uh, perhaps a way to expand exactly like you said that shadowing and that training that could happen in the buildings for teachers. I understand firsthand the fear of going from a non-teaching career <laughs> to then having to face 30 yeah. kids in the classroom who are looking to you to know everything. And, and um, so I don't want to anybody to think that you would have no training. And so whatever we could do to speed that up, make it more affordable, less a deterrent from entering uh, the teaching profession for these folks. And then again, expanding opportunities so we can be serving more kids and getting more kids into trades that are both good for them and good for Connecticut's economy. So I'm really grateful for, for your testimony today. Thank you. I appreciate your efforts and I will reach out to your office. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, did Representative uh, Nuccio have her hand up? Um, maybe not. Um, so, so Paul um, and, and Representative Leeper, here's the deal. We know we've got this silver tsunami facing us with these waves of retirements coming on. We know that right now we aren't adequately staffed. Um, we also know that when you hear all the initiatives from OWS, the Office of Workforce Strategy, that um, it is crucial that we do get trained boots on the ground if we are going to maintain our edge in this economy. That's what Connecticut's always been known for. That's been our jewel that we uh, have highly educated and trained people. That's why we were able to keep um, Zikorsky here. Uh, so, so knowing these things and, and to you, Paul, kudos, you, you know, you're probably, you know, one of these exceptions where you step down from a very uh, well-paying uh, trade, you know, 65% pay cut. Is that what I heard you say? Um, yeah. you know, to go into the classroom. It's the same situation we have in the allied health with nurses who can get so much more in the clinical environment than they can in the classroom. Mm -hmm. But we can't produce the graduates we need because we don't have the people behind the desks. So, um, you know, we got to crack the code here and, and you then offer a shadowing program, but a shat I don't see how a shadowing program is going to uh, actually be able to teach a class to produce the graduates. I, I, I mean, I'm sure it's, uh, you know, valuable, but um, I'm getting a disconnect. Well, there are a number of people, since I get to meet every single one that comes in, there are a number of people, as was mentioned earlier, that are hesitant to come on board. It's, a, it's sort of a blind leap of faith, um, taking a large pay cut and entering an entire other career. But I'm glad you mentioned the silver tsunami because I want to share some numbers with you. The CTEC system 
on boards, there's 1,150 teachers. We on board about from within the past five years, anywhere from 65 to 90 teachers a year will retire, which will be replaced. Uh, when you mentioned the silver tsunami, the, I think it was 2000, I wasn't an employee at the time, but in 2003 or 2005, where there's a so-called buyout for retirement, our district, and the district has a hard enough time trying to onboard, last year it was 89 teachers from the beginning of the school year to the end. But that year of the buyout back in 2005, 230 teachers left. So um, we're very cognizant of that. And in, in the building trades themselves, it's just, yeah, I mean, it's why I left the profession to teach the next generation. It's kind of what we do, but um, yeah, there's some real concerns that are on the very near horizon for us. Well, thanks, Paul. And so uh, Representative Leeper, I uh, suggest that in, because uh, of course the clock is ticking very rapidly here. If you could, you know, work through, uh, you know, this issue based upon the testimony that we've gotten so far, we'd be grateful, um, you know, to hear from you um, on that. Uh, are there questions uh, from other members of the committee? Um, do not see any hands raised. Um, and if not, uh, thanks Paul for being with us. Um, and next we have Jessica. Uh, Thank Mar you. Th thanks, Paul. Yes. Uh, Moros. Um, Mor Madam Chair. Sorry. Um, uh, Senator Kelly is here now. Oh, okay. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Senator Kelly, are you um, on deck there? There you are. Good morning. Is it morning still, sir? I don't even know. <laughs> it is. Okay. You've got it's, the floor. We're being a, a if it's still morning. <laughs> it's, it's been a long, long morning. Yeah. Uh, but thank you, Senator Hartley and Representative Simmons, the uh, chairs of this committee, as well as uh, Senator Martin and Representative Buckby, who are the ranking uh, members on this committee. Uh, you have my uh, testimony before you, and I think this is actually a good transition with the prior speaker who identified the need for and the crucial importance of workforce development uh, considering our, I'm going to say, our aging population and particularly the experience that many of these individuals had in, in one of our flagship industries, which is defense manufacturing. Uh, and as Senator Hartley had pointed out, you know, we've been able to keep uh, Sikorsky in the state of Connecticut, and that was done uh, a few years ago because of uh, the cooperation of not only the state of Connecticut and the Malloy administration, but also Lockheed Martin uh, and uh, the team's uh, labor force. What we have in Connecticut is a highly skilled and capable workforce. And what we need to do going forward, I think, is capitalize on that. Uh, I come from the town of Stratford, which is home of Sikorsky Aircraft, which is why uh, the initiative that's before you is so near and dear to my heart and why I think it's a good path forward for Connecticut is that we do a lot of defense manufacturing in our state. Uh, we get a lot of federal money into Connecticut through that uh, industry and it's an opportunity to capitalize on that and to make sure that we not only have and maintain this current workforce but to capitalize and move it forward, to expand upon that and to use whatever tools we have at our availability uh, to start to encourage that so that not only will uh, companies domicile here, but grow and expand good paying middle class jobs. I think this is the type of initiative that we need to look at, which would utilize things like sales tax exemptions, uh, R&D tax credits, and whatever else the DECD can do, much like they did with the Sikorsky Teamster Lock Lockheed and uh, Malloy administration deal, uh, and to move this forward for the benefit of Connecticut. Uh, so you have my, my written testimony. If you have any questions, uh, love to answer. 
Uh, Senator Kelly, thank you so much for being with us and also providing written testimony, which of course we'll be sure that everybody has the opportunity to access. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. And for as long as I've known you, you've been an incredible proponent um, of this sector um, and uh, you know, trying to um, embrace it, support it, and telegraph it uh, to the rest of the world, leverage it. Um, and there's you know, so much we've done, but so, so much more we can do. Um, so I, I'm grateful that you've been put us on your list. And uh, Senator um, Martin has a question for you, sir. Go ahead, Henry. I figured out how to use the uh, raise your hand feature. Thank you, Bill Busby. <laughs> Lawlessly done, sir. Uh, very quick, uh, very quickly. Thank you, Senator Kelly. Uh, do you have a number in mind as to how much we should be investing uh, in this type of program? I know we've had some in the past, uh, particularly I think when we had the aerospace uh, bill a couple years back. I know we allocated uh, some bonding money for uh, workforce development and uh, training uh, for what was going to be quickly uh, upon us regarding the workload. But uh, do you have a, a number in mind? Um, I know you're you're requesting this to go through the DECD, but um, if, I think uh, if you had a number in mind, it might be helpful. There's no specific, uh, thank you for the question, Senator Martin. There's no specific number in mind. Obviously I'm mindful that we have a budget uh, constraint currently. Uh, and so we wanna do something. Something's always better than nothing. Uh, but I do think one of the things moving forward for our state of Connecticut uh, in a tough economy is to look at what we do well. Uh, defense manufacturing is one, in, insurance is another. And I believe that if we start to invest in this, uh, we can expand upon it. Uh, now, the more I think we do, the better response I think we'll get. And I think there'll be a return uh, for every dollar that we put in, we'll get uh, jobs and more manufacturing back into the state of Connecticut. So uh, if it's a small amount, I think that's something that we have to keep mindful of because of the current financial situation of the state budget, but also, you know, look at the, the reward that we can get here. And so I wouldn't say there's a specific number in mind, uh, but I think we need to focus on making sure that we have a workforce that remains and can continue to make these world-class uh, whether it's a helicopter, submarine, jet engine, uh, make sure that we continue to make these world-class products here in Connecticut because our workforce is that good and the men and women that serve in uniform around the world depend upon them. Well, thank you, Senator. I guess what comes to my mind for me anyway is, you know, we have all these workforce needs and, and uh, you know, we've, uh, I know the governor's recent workforce council uh, plan or strategy that they put together, they've identified uh, not only the manufacturing sector, but the medical sector, the financial sector, and even the prior speaker, you know, we see there's a need uh, within the trades. Um, and and that, let's not forget the medical industry as well. So I'm wondering, you know, I'm envisioning a big pie here and, and uh, how much you know, how much money do we have for this big pie for these workforce development needs? And how do you cut it up or slice it up to make sure that we're covering each of the sectors? So, but thank you, uh, Senator. I appreciate the, uh, your comments here. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, um, Senator Martin. Um, uh, Senator Kelly, so um, yes, you know, you um, remind us, need we be reminded about uh, you know, the climate that we're working in and what our bandwidth is and our ability. And so therein is the challenge of uh, prioritizing. We prioritize and we laser focus um, our resources, you know, to hopefully leverage, grow the economy um, and, and be resourceful. Now, uh, you are very well because your um, district um, is, uh, the lifeblood of a manufacturing um, uh, legacy there. Uh, the MIF, the Manufacturing Innovation Fund, um, was stood up uh, a number of years, I'm wanting to say maybe 
four years, five years ago. Um, and it has been, um, quite frankly, the, the anchor in um, uh, supporting, growing, um, and, and, and leveraging in, in our manufacturing industry. We uh, now recognize that that funding is, um, it, it's basically um, been uh, utilized and the program needs to be recapitalized. Uh, where would you put this on the priority list? Well, I think when we we talk with our constituents and you, and you look at just the economic numbers, I think the one thing middle-class families are really concerned about are jobs, uh, the Connecticut economy, uh, and healthcare. I think those are like the top three if you were to, to boil this down. So I would put uh, jobs and manufacturing high uh, because these are very good paying middle-class jobs that can actually, you know, uh, I'm going to say raise a family, pay a mortgage, uh, educate our kids, and to make sure that we have positive influences in our neighborhoods. Uh, so I think, you know, and particularly given the fact that Connecticut labor is so good, they're so highly skilled and capable uh, that capitalize on what we do well. And this is one thing that we do do well and grow that footprint. And this isn't like the old factories like our parents worked in. These are very high tech, uh, very different types of manufacturing settings. Uh, and I think it's a place where Connecticut can be the leader. Uh, and so, you know, like I said, we make the world's best helicopter. Uh, and that not only is good for, I'm gonna say our, our armed services, but it also does a lot of uh, health, safety, uh, rescue work. And that was really Igor Sikorsky's dream was that it be used for humanitarian pur purposes. Uh, so I would put this high on the list as uh, something that we need to focus on because it's so important for jobs and the economy in our, in our state and getting us out of, I think, some of the financial issues we're in. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I would put it kind of right at the top of the list. Um, but, but thanks very much, Senator Kelly. I don't see any other questions. Wendy, uh, Madam Clerk, is, am I missing anybody? If not, thanks so much for being with us, Senator Kelly. And thank you for your leadership on this and other things as well. Um, thank you for having the opportunity to be with you this morning. I, I do appreciate uh, your efforts and the time that this uh, committee puts into making sure that our, not only our workforce, but our, our entire commerce of the state of Connecticut is uh, on pace. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Kelly. Um, we would like to move on um, uh, to Jessica Morozowski, which I probably did not do justice to your name. Jessica, are you with us? Um, hmm. Okay, do not see, and I'm not sure uh, what she, what in, um, entity she's representing, but um, okay, we're going to move on um, to uh, uh, Bruce, Bruce Flax. Is Bruce with us? Yes, hey, hi, I'm here. Hi. hi. You've got the floor, sir. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good afternoon to you, uh, all the members of the um, Commerce Committee. And thank you for the opportunity to speak um, to the committee in support of Bill 6119. Uh, my name is Bruce Flax. I'm the chairman of the board and the current interim director of uh, the Greater Mystic Chamber of Commerce. As such, I represent uh, the number one tourist destination in the state, Mystic. Um, you got the Mystic Seaport Museum, Mystic Aquarium, Old Mystic Village, Downtown Mystic, Stonington Borough, uh, Foxwoods Resort Casino, Mohegan Sun, and more connect the dots quite clearly. And within that uh, clearly defined boundary are hundreds of businesses that rely on tourist dollars and that we represent. The Greater Mystic Chamber of Commerce appreciate working with the state to secure tourism funds through the Eastern Connecticut Tourism District in partnership with the Chamber of Commerce of Eastern Connecticut. However, more funds are needed. The amount of money we're working with is simply not enough. Tourists have many choices throughout New England, New York, and Pennsylvania, and more needs to be done to keep tourist dollars inside our state. As you all know, there's no better return on investment than marketing money spent on Connecticut's unique tourist destinations. As been said before, for every dollar spent, the return is three. 
additional dollars spent on tourism in the state is the smartest investment we can make um, in a time that requires fiscal, fiscal responsibility uh, given the challenges that we face. Uh, due to the hurdles we've all had to jump in this pandemic, now is the time to reassess the investment for 2021 and beyond. Our businesses have found creative ways to serve those who are still visiting our state. However, this has not come without costs or challenges. Directing additional resources to the tourism fund will not only pay off threefold, but it will also contribute to job creation in a market where people want and need to get back to work. This investment will also generate additional tax dollars for the state. Um, tourism should always be a top focus in Hartford, but especially in this climate. Additional tourism funding will help bring tourists to our state during all seasons. Um, the governor talks of a Connecticut comeback. One place that can lead the initiative with your help is tourism. Thank you. Bruce, thanks very much for being with us. Thank you for what you're doing um, uh, and working through this. Uh, hopefully um, we will be at the end of the road sooner than later. I don't see any questions, Bruce. Uh, Bruce uh, so I'm going to say thanks again, um, and we will move on to uh, Christopher Regan. Um, uh, are you with us, Christopher? I'm right here. And then to be followed by Senator Maroney, okay? Thanks. I appreciate it, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, I'm Chris Regan from Omistic Village um, in the best town in Connecticut. <laughs> um, I'm uh, on the executive committee for the Connecticut Coalition for Tourism. I'm on the executive committee for the Eastern Regional Tourism District and serve as chair of the marketing committee. Uh, also on the executive committee for the Mystic Chamber. So I'm very involved in tourism. Uh, the village has celebrated its 48th anniversary. Um, so tourism advertising is a vital uh, uh, lifeline to our industry, which is a big business. And, um, you know, for the, the for HB 6119, uh, I fully support getting as much dollars into advertising as possible for the state of Connecticut. But it's twofold. I think with regards to uh, the, the uh, Connecticut Office of Tourism to do the macro uh, advertising as the state as a whole, and then we need to get money out into the districts of like Eastern Regional Tourism District is 41 towns. We did a private public partnership in the district. We raised, we took $212,000 of state money and raised an additional $180,000 in private sector money. Um, so that is, I think one of the things that we need to try to uh, concentrate on is do the macro and the micro at the same time. That means we need to get the private industry to uh, put up additional money that could be matched with state dollars and leveraged, um, which gives us a bigger push. As an example, with our merchants at the village, uh, we increased our advertising budget. Um, we ended up uh, spending about $260,000 on holiday displays, which generated uh, record numbers for our retailers in the village, their best years ever during the pandemic. Some of the restaurants have had their best years also. Um, not every single one of them has had their best years, but there's been significant uptick in regards to um, business, which is great for, for our particular uh, venue. Um, but at the same time, this is not a time when we need to stop and then cut our budget. We need to increase the budget to be able to get more business back to Connecticut. And that's what New York, that's what Rhode Island, and that's what Massachusetts is doing. And Rhode Island and in, in Newport, they get additional hotel tax locally. Their budget's bigger than what we spend in Connecticut. And it's, it doesn't even come close to it. So that's what we're competing against uh, to try to get people to come here. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, you guys will make it a priority that we need to get um, the additional dollars into tourism. Also, the other bill, um, HB 624, which is to get a permanent seat for the Connecticut, to uh, Connecticut Tourism Coalition on the Advisory Council. Uh, I believe in their mission. Uh, they fight for tourism. 
and they want to, uh, and, they, and they've got a wide range of uh, uh, members throughout the state. So it's not just locally in one area. So I think they have the best interest. That's one of the reasons why I got on that board and on the executive committee. So I would like to uh, have you guys support that bill also. But I appreciate your time and open to any questions if you have any. Okay, thanks very much for, uh, for oh, sorry, Chris, for being with us. Um, well stated, um, we've had good representation on these two bills here today. I don't see any questions from members, uh, so I'm gonna move on okay. to Dan. Hello, did I miss someone? Okay, um, thank you very much, um, Chris. Uh, Dan McFadden, are you with us, Dan? I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Oh, hey, hi, Dan. Go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak in support of uh, HB 6119. Um, I will echo a lot of what Chris said, so I'll be pretty brief. Um, we need your help. Um, I represent Mystic Seaport Museum. I'm the communications director. I'm also on the executive committee of the Connecticut Tourism Coalition. Um, our museum brings about 250,000 people to, um, through our doors. Um, half of them come from out of Connecticut, um, mostly from New York and Massachusetts. Those are very expensive markets to buy advertising in to get them here. And that's why we need, we need the state's help to do that. We are a non-for-profit and we can't, we don't have the budget to really market to New York and Boston the way we would like to do. So we rely on the state to do that. And everybody who comes to Mystic Seaport will stay overnight, maybe. They will buy a meal. They will go downtown and shop. Obviously, the attraction, they may go to the aquarium as well. We hope they do. Um, but we, we are not in the position to do it all by ourselves. And so what we really rely on the state to do is to help us do that. Help us reach the markets that bring people here overnight, bring them to Connecticut, and get them to you know, have a great destination. I'm a former New Yorker, and it was it was enjoyable to hear other people on on the on this uh, meeting earlier to say I lived in West Hartford, Old Greenwich, Old Lyme, and I can testify too that Connecticut is a great destination. It's part of the reason my wife and I moved here. Uh, Mystic's a great destination, but we can't do it by ourselves. We need the state support to help draw people into the state as a whole. We've got a lot to sell. We just need to get the word out. So I encourage, and stability is another important issue in terms of stable funding. So we know what the marketing is going to be. Um, we're recovering from COVID as we all are. We're trying to figure out what our summer plan should be, what our summer hiring should be. So there's uh, not a more important time to really invest in tourism and arts marketing. Um, so thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, thanks for being with us. Uh, Senator Martin has a question. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hi, Dan. Thank you for testifying. Very quickly, Dan. So, uh, you know, Senator Formica mentioned that we currently invest, uh, I thought, the number of $13 million uh, that the state put in. Uh, I guess at one of the previous speakers talked about some private companies uh, being, I guess, part of uh, marketing efforts, right, to yes. to stimulate their economy. Uh, does the council, the tourism council currently, do any, is there any private money that comes into that oh, that would help the 13 million that the state puts in? Or, uh, or is them funding strictly all from the state of Connecticut? No, so this is, and thank you for bringing that up. I appreciate that. Um, so our museum puts in uh, $25,000 a year into marketing Mystic as a destination. And we work together. And fortunately at times last year, we've had matching funds. So it is public and private. And that is an, for us, that's a fantastic way for us to both build our destination, build the town as a whole is a public private partnership. So um, it has varied over the years. We are a huge supporter of that. We will always put money into a public private partnership to help drive uh, tourism to Mystic. Um, in addition to, to state marketing the state as a whole, 
Um, it's been successful for us. Uh, it's been, and we do a partnership with the aquarium, for example, and we market our joint ticket through that. Um, we, we will always take the, take advantage of that opportunity to do that. And I think it's a great way for the state to leverage scarce dollars. We'll put money in. And I know other people around Mystic will, we have in the past, we will again. Okay, so I guess I get, I have to ask DECD or wherever the funds are appropriated from the state, if that's part of, I guess, the, I, don't, I, I don't think it's in statute, but be interesting to find out if, gee, if we give you guys 13 million, um, you know, are you guys able to contribute to that there's some type of partnership so that we can best leverage the funds uh, you know to attract more tourism here in the state of Connecticut so but thank you for your answer I appreciate it, it looks like you got you wanted to add something go ahead no I yeah. just uh, we're a big we're a big believer in public private partnerships and we really we really think it's a great way for to you know a matching grant 50 50 doubles the money we'll do that any day of the week sure great thank you Dan for signing again thank you thank you Dr. Yeah, thank you, Senator Martin. And in fact, um, if I recall, Dan, when we were doing the uh, business relief programs, that was something that a Department of Economic and Community Development stood up with the museum where there was um, a, a match. Yes, yes. Like it, it's, uh, it's come and gone over the years. I, I, it's not in statute, um, but um, it's really worked well. And I know in our community, we've been able to rally people to that. And as Chris Regan mentioned uh, in his testimony before me, um, even last year, we were able to do that. You know, we're, we don't have a lot of money, but we really believe in working together. And with a little state help, we'll, we'll, the private sector will step up and, and join. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Seeing um, no other questions um, that I haven't missed. Um, thanks for being with us, Dan. Thank you very uh, much. And Senator Maroney, I, 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 we've, I'm hoping you're there now. <laughs> good, good afternoon, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for, for calling on me. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, co-chairs Hartley and Simmons, ranking members Buckley and Martin, vice chairs Cohen and Rochelle, and esteemed members of the Commerce Committee. Uh, my name is James Maroney, and I'm the state senator from the 14th uh, Senatorial District. And today I would like to testify in favor of SB uh, 627, an act concerning opportunity zones. Um, I am submitting written testimony. I'm not sure if it is in yet, so um, I do apologize for that. But I would be uh, remiss if I didn't start by uh, commending the Commerce Committee uh, for its work on opportunity zones in the 2019 session. Um, the passage of that bill led to the creation of uh, ConnecticutOpportunityZones.com website, a single point of contact at the D DECD for opportunity zones, uh, the Opportunity CT conference that in October of 2019 attracted over 400 investors uh, to look at investing in uh, Connecticut. And ultimately has led to many investments in our 72 opportunity zones that are spread throughout the 27 communities uh, in our state. Uh, but today I'm here to testify that our work isn't done, um, that there's still more we need to do on, uh, with the opportunity zones. And I wanna make recommendations on how we can build on that previous work. Um, one of the things you know, for the opportunity zones, they were created by uh, federal legislation and the majority of the benefit is really the uh, federal tax benefit. Um, for those who aren't aware, you can defer paying, you can reinvest, they're designed to help you unlock unrealized capital gains, and you can reinvest those capital gains into an opportunity zone and not have to pay your capital gains tax until 2026 uh, with some reduction, depending on how long you've uh, left the money. But the real benefit for most of those investors is that you do not pay any capital gains tax on the new investment. And that's what's going to uh, the real incentive for investors to invest in these areas. Uh, but as I've mentioned, they tend to be in distressed communities. Uh, it's based on census track. And so there is a requirement that they are um, you know, for unemployment and other issues there. And the way the code is written, the majority of the benefit tends to accrue to people who do not live uh, in these communities. And so, uh, in fact, many of the investors may be out of state uh, investors who are getting the majority of this benefit. So uh, with that in mind, I would like to make a few recommendations so that we can make sure that the people who lived in these opportunity zones before they were declared as such and um, who are currently living in these opportunity zones also see uh, some of the benefit. 
Um, you know, I do have in my written testimony, I have some more specific recommendations and I would actually uh, welcome the opportunity to continue to work through the Commerce Committee as this goes, you know, as we go through the process to develop uh, further recommendations. But basically it'll boil down to two things. One is requiring any company that gets additional state benefits uh, within the opportunity zones to sign a community benefits agreement in order to uh, maximize whatever benefit that we can give them. And so within the community benefits agreement, there are a few things that we should look at doing. Um, one of them uh, that I think is important is, you know, offering mentoring uh, to businesses. And so a lot of these uh, developments are going to be mixed use with retail on the first floor and you know, and residential up above. So we want to make sure that the bakeries and the shops that are going into these uh, retail and professional are the people who live in that area. So giving them the resources uh, to succeed, but also looking at the students who live within these areas and making sure that they have access uh, to opportunities to develop themselves, whether it's through workforce development, but also through requiring companies that take uh, state money to offer internships and to help uh, provide those opportunities for students who may not have them otherwise, but also for all the students who are coming into our colleges and universities. Um, I was glad to see in the strategic workforce plan for the state that we're looking at engaging campus Philly in finding ways to help retain more of the college students who come through Connecticut, uh, looking at expanding the UPass to the private colleges is a great way, but also requiring and expanding upon internship availability. ability, availability is another way. Um, and so years ago, uh, Yale had done a survey of companies that were started through the Yale Entrepreneurial Institute, half left and half stayed. Of the reason that the half stayed, one of the reasons the half that stayed cited was they formed a relationship beyond the campus. And I think we want to work on facilitating relationships beyond the campus for our college students, and then also providing opportunities uh, for disadvantaged youth who may not have connection to those uh, opportunities. Another barrier to starting business is a uh, lack of access to capital, especially in the opportunity zones. And I, was ex I am excited to see uh, the DECD's proposal for repurposing the Small Business Express, whereby we would be underwriting some of the risk uh, and encouraging, incentivizing community banks and others to lend. Um, and what I would uh, recommend is that for people who live within the opportunity zones and are starting a business within the opportunity zone, we look at relaxing um, the requirements in terms of Normally, you have to have been in business for at least a year to qualify for these programs. But if we want to incentivize more new businesses, perhaps for people who had lived within the opportunity zones, uh, we can make the requirement, make it available upon uh, starting up. Um, and so not have that requirement for having been in business for a year. And also providing more mentoring resources uh, to those people, uh, the, those, but the people who live within the opportunity zones who are starting businesses. Um, CT Next has a great platform, so expanding upon that and making those uh, mentor mentoring opportunities available to more people. Um, with that, I, I will uh, leave it to any any questions, and also say that I will be submitting um, my written testimony. So thank you very much for the opportunity to testify, um, Senator Maroney. So who could have thunk that we'd be testifying in our sneakers and from our cars? <laughs> exactly. Thank the only you. problem is I'm not wearing the mask, so I had to shave today. But <laughs> we were looking. Um, listen, thank you so much for your work on this from the start when the federal legislation was first stood up. Um, working uh, with the Commerce Committee um, on this sector to try to leverage opportunity zones um, here in the state and the investments in, in, in particularly in those communities. Um, one of our frustrations, quite frankly, has been the fact that we cannot get our arms around since this legislation has passed um, what the activity has been. There's no central um, you know, uh, repository or um, uh, identifying who's, you know, participated. Uh, so that's one of the things that um, this committee is going to be, oops, uh, did I lose you all there? <laughs> Hold on. Um, my goodness. Um, okay. I, okay. I, somehow I, I hit something wrong. Um, anyway, uh, so that's one of the things that we're going to be concerned about. Now, 
um, let, let me just mention, so the federal program, I thought there was a 2023 deadline in there with regard to um, being able to claim the benefit. That I'm not sure of. I know that it is um, deferred till 2026. And so if you reinvest your capital gains, you don't end up paying that whatever taxes do on the initial, you know, the previous investment that you had sold to, to realize those capital gains until 2026. If the money had been left in uh, for seven years, it reduces by 15% your outstanding, um, you know, the, the, your outstanding debt due on your capital gains tax. And if it's in there for at least five years, it's a 10% reduction. But from what I've heard, um, the real benefit is not in that reduction of your previous capital gains, it's in the fact that this new investment, you would pay no capital gains on that. So they do think that it's not just for these next two years that we're going to see a significant investment. It's, it's over a really a, a several year period. Mm -hmm. I, and I'm not sure of when the deadline was, um, Madam Chair. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think we need to go back and review uh, what the, what the, the, you know, the criteria and the the dead the the time frames were on this, um, and and you are so right about the fact that um, and, and this is typical, isn't it? That so many um, investors they are not um, local; they may be uh, you know out of state, um, and therefore the the actual uh, residents of a particular zone um, may not be able to enjoy or benefit. Um, in the way that this was anticipated. So, um, however, we as a state can help to um, address that, I think is, is crucial. Um, and that's why I'm grateful for your proposals um, and the mentorship and the apprenticeship, obviously it has been proven to be a tool that um, connects uh, students to their community, to our state, um, and actually helps to stem the, you know, the brain drain as, as we go forward. Um, and then the access to capital point um, is obviously been, you know, a real flashpoint, uh, uh, you know, in, in this particular sector. Uh, and so the elimination of the criteria for a year in business, um, you know, has been talked about, floated with the department. Um, so we're going to, you know, take another look at that. You've shared, you've given us some uh, written testimony, have you, Senator? Um, yeah, I will be submitting it if it's not in uh, yet. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, my, my co-chair, uh, Representative Simmons, you have the floor. Thank, thank you so much, Madam Chair. And, and thank you, Madam Chair, for your leadership on, on this as well. And wanna thank you so much, Senator Maroney, for your advocacy for opportunity zones, and um, you know, as my as my co-chair said, you were right on the mark um, introducing this legislation um, last session or maybe two sessions ago. Feels like forever ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, but just so grateful for for all your leadership on this and and, and what it's led to, um, as you said. And and I really appreciate your your ideas and feedback on how we could continue to enhance our support for opportunity zones in Connecticut and with these really thoughtful suggestions about, you know, enhancing student internships and mentoring um, and getting those community agreements in place uh, with businesses. And, you know, one question I have is, are you aware of, are other states implementing models like this or kind of adding or enhancing what, you know, the federal legislation um, put in place, um, you know, with uh, additional uh, state legislation, like the ideas that you're referring to or any, any models you recommend we look at that other states are doing on um. that? So we were in the top 10% of states, I think, in terms of adding state benefits. I think Maryland has done a lot. Uh, Kentucky has done a lot. And I, uh, their LISC, uh, um, and I forget what it stands for, but they've put out a lot of recommendations for what you can do in terms of community benefits. So I think we should look further at their work as well. Um, but I do think it, it is you know, incumbent on us to make sure that the people people who lived in these areas before they became an opportunity zone don't get priced out of their neighborhood and they also get a chance uh, to benefit uh, from any new developments that go in there and can participate in that. 
Absolutely. I think that's so, so critical. And especially right now with what we're facing with COVID and, you know, these you know, people in these communities need more, more help than ever and want to make sure that it, the, the intent of the, the bill in terms of, you know, supporting jobs and helping distressed communities is, um, is taking place and that, you know, this, this, you know, these benefits aren't just going to, to developers. Um, and so want to make sure that it's really going to helping the people in need. So really appreciate your, your advocacy for this and looking forward to continuing to work with you on this bill. Great. Thank you very much, Representative Simmons. Yeah, thank you, Rep. Simmons. Um, and so uh, I, I just wanted to ask one thing, but um, on deck here is Representative Thomas, Senator Martin, and Representative Nuccio. Um, but uh, Senator Maroney, you mentioned uh, the signing um, and the executing of a community benefits agreement. Can you yeah. talk a little bit more about that? So who... Uh, brings this together, who puts it together. I mean, you know, I've worked on these in the past and, you know, we've had different structures um, with the CEO, uh, you know, of a, of a municipality, you know, being the party of putting a, a community benefits agreement together or, or others. But can you talk about that particular piece of your proposal? Yeah, so that would be in order to maximize uh, the benefit. And so we, you know, as you know, I guess for the benefit of the people who are on the committee now who weren't before, what we had done is um, we had layered some state benefits that were existing benefits on top of the federal benefits. So we weren't really creating a new fiscal note, but we gave uh, bonus points uh, within the brownfield. Uh, and we expanded uh, the historic tax credit for people um, who had invested it within the opportunity zones. And so uh, what I would recommend is that they would have to sign some form of a community benefits agreement to get those benefits. But also there was a benefit we had looked at that we didn't ultimately add in. And that is the state does have the ability uh, to waive sales tax on investments. And they do it you know, for manufacturers um, if it's part of the process. But um, perhaps looking at that as another, a further enticement for someone to do a community benefits agreement. So it would be um, if it was a business who was getting this, then it would be the business who would enter into that agreement. So they may um, agree to a certain point uh, amount of local hiring um, to, you know, whether it may be a, apprenticeships, internships, um, or, you know, workforce development classes, something uh, within, you know, that they're providing for the people who live within that community. So um, it also could be a, a developer if it was more of a mixed use development um, and not necessarily the business that they may also have other you know, benefits um, that they would have to agree to. Um, yeah, so you're suggesting it's kind of um, uh, a case by case basis on how a particular uh, community benefits agreement is um, structured. Yeah, and, and I think that leaving it that way, there may be benefits we haven't thought of uh, that they could provide and they, they could bring to the table. And so, um, but by requiring, you know, we could give examples of things you would like to see, but by allowing the individual uh, companies or developers to come uh, up with that community benefits agreement there, they may be more creative or they may have ideas of things that have worked in other areas because they are bringing in a lot of national, you know, developers or investors for these uh, different developments. And are you aware of any other state that is um, using, you know, such a program uh, on in conjunction with the OZs? I do believe that Maryland does, but I would have to double check uh, my notes and I can get you a list um, of the other states who have, if any other states or which other states have done that. Um, yeah, that would be interesting. And also, I mean, it, we're, this is still rolling out. It's relatively new, but be interested to see, you know, what the experience has been in some instances, uh, is it viewed, you know, as, um, an additional restraint? Has it, um, you know, in any way advantaged or disadvantaged, uh, the, um, the, the, the use of the program. So anyway, yeah, anything you have on that, um, Senator, that would be very helpful. Um, I, I will, 
I do remember there, I think there were some of the investments outside of Baltimore that it had entered into the community benefits agreement. So I will get some examples and get them to you, uh, Madam Chair. That'd be, that'd be very helpful. Um, and so Representative Thomas, you're, you're up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator, for being here. Um, uh, you mentioned LISC earlier, Great Organization Local Initiative Support Corporation. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> you're welcome. You're welcome. I Thank you I also. <laughs> I know it's a hard name. Uh, I think going by LISC is much easier. Um, thank you for the history lesson. I am new to this committee. Um, so one thing I wonder if any uh, conversation has, be, has been held about the internship uh, portion of your bill. I always worry, especially in distressed communities um, where interns, uh, one, it's usually used as free labor, which I'm very right. much against. And in a distressed community, that sometimes becomes more problematic because people can't afford to labor for free because time is money and it's right. often, you know, a very dire situation. So can you talk a little bit about how you envision that or if conversation has been held? Yeah, no, you bring up an excellent point, right? And that's why oftentimes if you are requiring an internship to get a job, it does disadvantage people who don't have the opportunity to go without making money. Um, and so, um, you know, as far as I have thought of it, in other ways than I have proposed it here, like in, in terms of creating like a statewide nutmeg fellowship program where you would have some form of a stipend, you know, for students who would do an internship and then getting different companies to participate in. I don't think that uh, it's not fully baked yet, that idea. And um, that is not really this proposed. This proposal will be more just to ensuring access um, and one of the things, you know, I've spoken with uh, my friend who works at a, a local bank um, and because in other states, you know, they, the community banks have given more internships because as part of the Community Reinvestment Act, you know, one of the things is time, right, that they, they give money and investing in actually the opportunity zone areas would get them higher points, but because of the risk. Um, they don't always make those investments or because of their area, you know, they may not be in an area where it would count. And so that's why I think that the state underwriting a portion of the risk is great through the, you know, repurposing the small business express. Uh, but he had mentioned, you know, his concern for providing more internships to students uh, would just be if there would be some liability shield for them in that, you know, what if he had an intern in and he recognized one of their you know, one of the neighbors and then afterwards you said, oh, I know you bank at or they saw a social security number or something, you know, so um, maybe perhaps, you know, providing them with a, a, some form of a, a liability shield, limited liability shield um, to encourage them to do more internships. But you do bring up a, a, an excellent point and that's why um, you know, the, the public hearing process works, right? So that we could get more input and more ideas to try to improve on legislation. So I would love to work with you. On that. Yeah, I would love to, to talk further. Like, I wonder if there's some sort of fee in lieu of, you know, that a developer or someone who has taken advantage of the opportunity zone could funnel into some neighborhood institution that has already had some sort of structured paid internship program or, you know, a nonprofit or some sort of development center. Um, but yeah, that's an excellent idea. And that's similar to how when, yeah, but yeah, there, there's definitely ideas that are similar. We could pattern that off of, so. And um, my last question, I was, um, you mentioned in the bill, uh, the Renaissance zones, uh, and I was just curious. It was a develop uh, a requirement for the development centers locally to have some sort of office hours in these Renaissance zones. And I confess, I'm ignorant what the practice is now in those types of centers. Do they not have some sort of community easy access? They um, so they have locations, um, different locations in the state. And so the idea would be to um, make sure that they're meeting people where they are, right? And so I think now that we do more by Zoom, it's probably 
it may not be necessary as necessary as it was um, before, but I think um, again, in some of the you know, neighborhoods, you know, some for some groups, it's lack of access to capital, but lack of access to human capital and advising. And so, just making sure that you know it's not enough. I don't think to just give people the money, right, to lend them to start, but we need to give them the resources and making sure that they. Uh, everyone has access, the same access to those resources, right? Because we know equality of opportunity doesn't take equality of resources. And so. Great, thank you. And thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Senator. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, thank you, uh, Representative Thomas. And, um, you know, if, we're, if folks are, you know, flushing out certain um, uh, parts of these conversations, I uh, suggest that you do it um, with great speed because you know the calendar and the clock is moving. So um, you know if, if you're going to come back with us to us with you know additional proposals or um, you know iterations of what we're talking about, it needs to be sooner than later for us uh, you know to look at it, consider it and um, you know, see how we move forward. Uh, so Senator Martin had to excuse himself for another meeting. He was on deck. And after that is um, Representative Nuccio. Uh, you're with us. Representative, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Senator Maroney. Um, so I, I've been reviewing the bill and I have a couple of, um, just a couple of questions on here. I noticed there's a lot of requires, requires to do this, requires to do that. And you had mentioned a couple of things that were on my list, um, intern liability and the human capital part of it. So if somebody is required to have interns and they don't get them in, how does that work? Is there a way to soften the language to highly encourage people to bring in interns so we can get diversity in our, our youth to try to figure out you know, what they wanna do with their lives, et cetera. But um, I'm concerned with a lot of the requires and, and what would the um, offset be if they're not able to um, to find that human capital? Yeah, I, I think, um, well, one of the things is, you know, it, it only requires it for you to get the maximum benefits. So there are other benefits, right? You'll still be getting the federal benefits and it would be, you know, further incentives from the state. And so, um, you know, I, I, while I do share your concerns that we don't want to necessarily put too many requirements or mandates, I think, you know, when we're giving state money, I think we do have more purview in, in how that's, that's spent. I think uh, Representative Thomas actually just brought up an excellent idea of perhaps just offering the opportunity to invest in another organization that is offering those internships instead. And that would be similar to what's done, you know, with, with developers uh, who are building like a large a new housing complex, right? They have to either set aside a certain percentage of the land or invest into open open space funds. So I think that that, I think you raise a very valid concern that I hadn't thought of before. And I think that, um, you know, we would look at, we could look at doing something as Representative Thomas had recommended. Yeah, I, I was listening to what Representative Thomas said and I thought that's a, that's a good idea, like an either or. Uh, I'm thinking most places would want interns, but if I'm just worried about the ones that might not be able to find it. Um, in the opportunity zones, there's the idea of them is that there's so many different opportunities and ways to bring people in and that, but um, cultivating people to, to, you know, it's almost like you're going to spend a lot of time looking for somebody to come. If you don't have like one of those popular things that everybody wants to intern at, you know, you're going to spend time saying, if I want to get the maximum benefit here, I have to go out and find somebody. And then that takes away from what they're doing. So I love the idea of, of either having like an either or, and I, I'm just kind of, that was really the, the, the juxtaposition of it for me is just the required kind of scares me. And I agree with you when it comes to state money, we, we wanna make sure that, you know, we're incenting the right thing and we're bringing in as much benefit as we can. And, and again, that's also why I think, you know, af after submitting the bill, I realized it would probably make more sense just to require a community benefits agreement and to allow more flexibility. And so if you weren't able to offer internships and you knew that weren't, there may be some other benefit you could offer to the community, right? Absolutely. And so I think that's why in listing things that we often find that that encourages them to happen, but 
we also want to encourage the creativity from the, the companies or the developers who know what they can really bring to a community. So I, I like what you just said. I like the amendment that you just put on there rather than requiring interns, if we can't get the interns requiring some sort of, sort of community um, agreement, some way to help the community as a whole. I, I love that. I think, I think that, would, that would make it a little better for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thank you very you. much for your time. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. And I miss your background with all the books. I was disappointed. I thought that was your real house. I didn't know. Oh my until gosh, you no, I wish it was. That's like the dream. You know, if I had all those books, that's the dream. Um, uh, but I found that one and I was like, this is my happy place. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> thank, thank you very you. much, though. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I don't see any other hands raised, um, Senator. So with that, we'll say, go back to safe driving, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much, Senator okay. Hardly. Be well, be well. Um, so we now have um, our Artemis uh, Luke Luyakas. Um, are you with us? Um, I know, you know, folks have been waiting a bit. We'll try to get through this, but we do have um, a long list of uh, people signed up. Okay, uh, going on to Peter um, Roas uh, from the Mark Twain House. Uh, Peter? Don't see him. Okay. I'm sorry, I am here. just give him a moment. I am here. Oh, oh, there you are. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yes, that's okay, that's okay. Uh, hi, I'm um, uh, Peter Roos. Uh, thank you for uh, letting me speak today. Um, I'm the executive director of the Mark Twain House and Museum here in Hartford, and I am speaking in support of HB 6119. Connecticut, as we all know, has an outstanding arts and cultural community. It's really one of the richest in the New England region. And that community also sits in tandem with amazing natural beauty and great attractions that we all enjoy and they're along the length and breadth of the state. Arts and culture are, I think, sometimes hard to quantify. But there's no doubt that they really supply much of the why. You know, why do we live here? Why do we visit the state? And um, it's also true, as so many people have said today, that this pandemic has hit the state hard. It has hit the arts, uh, the cultural, and the, com the hospitality industries in really a devastating way. Um, our museum will survive, uh, but it has been very hard. Our own budget took nearly a million dollar hit. Our museum employs 70 full and part-timers. Um, almost all of the part-timers were laid off as there was no work for them in a shuttered venue. And I and uh, all of my full-time staff are on 20% furloughs. We want a way to work our way back and our earned income through our ticket sales and our visitation is really crucial to that. In a normal year, we see 70,000 visitors a year. They come from all 50 states uh, every year and 60 to 65 countries. Um, I know Dan McFadden and I, uh, we heard him testify a little earlier. Most of our visitation comes from out of the state every year. And we give people an experience of Connecticut's nationally significant history. Although I am first and foremost a museum director, I'm speaking to you not only as a career museum professional, but one with a long experience in tourism and the hospitality industry. I was a member of Speaker Arasimowitz's Blue Ribbon Panel in 2018. And for nine years, I was a tourism official in the state of Rhode Island. Um, there was some reference to Newport and I was a board member of Discover Newport for nine years. With this expertise and experience in mind, I note that for a number of years now, every state that borders us has substantially outspent us in tourism marketing. Even Little Rhode Island outspends us by many millions of dollars, as has been noted, really about double what we spend. But pound for pound, we have as much or more as any of those states around us, but we don't have the budget to market ourselves. We're getting beaten by other states as the travelers to those states going through the rest of New England, drive right through Connecticut on our interstates and we should just be doing better. Um, so I think we've got, I think the positive thing is I think this bill is great. We have an opportunity and the time is now. The pandemic has created a tourism desert in the Northeast. There's no other way to put it. But as that devastation starts to recede with the vaccine, people will travel. Um, but they're gonna keep it in driving distance a lot of times. And I think a lot of people have noted that here today too. So we can bring them here with a solid marketing effort. And I really cannot emphasize that enough. 
the, the New England state that acts first uh, in terms of marketing is going to reap rewards. Um, tourism and arts and culture, as have been noted by others, are an investment in our future. The dollars that we invest here will not only make the Connecticut economy healthier in a lot of different ways, um, they will also be returned many fold in tax revenue from increased usage in the form of bed taxes, food and beverage taxes, retail taxes, and income taxes. Um, and this will also support small business, create jobs, and offer visitors a truer picture of the best that we have to offer, which is so great. Um, there was a question earlier about where there is more information on how investment in tourism comes back to us in terms of return on investment. And I would uh, direct you to the findings of the 2018 Blue Ribbon Commission. Uh, the economic impacts were really very carefully spelled out in that report. Um, as a last note, I can say um, Connecticut's tourism market budget has risen and fallen, as we have noted here, but um, it, it took its largest dive in the middle of the last decade. And at the museum, we have been able to look at our statistics and note a gradual erosion of our visitation. As Dan McFadden said at Mystic, um, we cannot hopefully hope to uh, put the kind of marketing money in uh, that will attract people from all 50 states and 60 to 65 countries every year. We really depend on the state to do that and all of the states around us do a better job. So I'm gonna finish with a Mark Twain quote because why not? Um, so the one I picked today is thunder is good, thunder is impressive, but it is lightning that does all the work. So my thanks to the committee and I really urge you to support HB 6119. Thank you, Peter, and thanks uh, for those Mark Twain words. Um, they're always so inspiring. Um, He's got one for everything. <laughs> and that's true, and they never get old. Uh, you know, it's some of my favorite literature. Um, so it, thank you for the incredible work on the, um, the 2018 report on that commission. Um, that was um, a very illuminating um, report the work that went into it, um, and it couldn't be more timely uh, in all in all candor. Um, and I'm looking to see if we have any hands raised. I see none. Um, Peter, thank you uh, for being with and um, and and being you know a resource that we could go to. Uh, uh, we will now go on to Laura uh, Freezy. Uh, University of Connecticut. Laura, are you with us? Okay, don't see Laura. Uh, William Hosley, Terra Firma Productions, creative director. Is William with us? No, do not see William. Um, okay, uh, Steph Burr, Northwest uh, Connecticut Arts. Steph? No. Um, Charles uh, Perro Perosino. Um, I'm not sure where Charles is from. Oh, hi. yes. Oh, hi, hi Charles. Hi, um, thank you for having us today, um, Chair Hartley and Chair Simmons. Um, my name is Charles Perosino and I'm a resident of Tallinn, Connecticut and a senior at the University of Connecticut. And I'm testifying today um, in opposition to HB 5150, which is the, the state hiring program for recent college graduates bill. Um, several provisions of the bill as written concern me, especially as someone looking to enter the workforce in this state in the coming year. Um, in my view, the bill inappropriately sidesteps the collective bargaining process and will have the effect of suppressing wages. Um, HB 5150 would preclude workers participating in the proposed hiring program from joining a union for at least five years. And by exempting these workers from the terms of their colleagues' collective bargaining agreements, this program will create an underclass of workers receiving lower wages and less benefits, even though they are performing the same duties as their colleagues. One of the stated purposes of the bill is to replenish the aging state workforce, but I worry that this program does that by slashing pay in the long term. Sure, workers would be able to join a union once they are no longer in the program, but the damage will have already been done. Any increased pay or benefits negotiated through the collective bargaining process will be from a baseline of years of wage suppression. The bill also states that a worker taking part in the hiring program would have up to 10% of their salary withheld to be paid to their student loan servicer. 
And this may feel like an appealing option, um, especially as a student who is facing a significant debt burden once I graduate myself. But agreeing to such terms for a period of at least five years would lock in an employee to a contract that may hurt them financially. Um, numerous financial analysts have recommended cash strapped borrowers take advantage of the current relief period that the federal government has offered to refrain from monthly payments for student loans and instead direct their savings toward more high priority bills during the pandemic. By agreeing to the student loan repayment terms of the hiring program, a worker would not have this flexibility if similar opportunities arise while they are under contract. An employee not in the program, however, would have this flexibility and would likely earn more money as they would have their wages and benefits negotiated by their union. So why would the state keep workers on the payroll that they could replace with new hires through the program outlined in the bill? Unions built this country's middle class, and I don't believe that the state should be in the business of undercutting their ability to advocate for workers, nor the workers' ability to be represented by a union that can vouch for their needs at the negotiating table. That's why I urge you to oppose this legislation, and I thank you for your time and consideration. Uh, yes, thanks. Thanks, Charles. So what are you studying? I'm studying Spanish and political science. Oh, uh very good combination. And, oh, thank you. And the, and the best to you. Oh, oh, did you say you were a senior? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to be graduating in May. Oh, okay. So um, I don't know. Hopefully soon we can have those graduation ceremonies again, huh? Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> You'll probably see me on Zoom in May, but hopefully, you know, I'm, I long for in-person interaction. Yeah. So yeah. I know we all do as well. And, and thanks, you know, for being so proactive and also taking your time um, from your studies to testify today. Um, your testimony is um, very important to us. And um, I'm just checking to see th uh, that no other hands are raised, Charles. So best of luck, you know, stay safe and um, congratulations to you soon on your graduation, sir. Yeah, thank you, have a great day. Yes, thank you. Um, Eric Glam, also a, a Trinity, Trinity Music. Hi, Eric. Hi, thank you, Madam Chairperson and members of the Commerce Committee. Uh, as a member of the Arts Committee and a member of an arts presenting educational institution in Connecticut, I write in strong support of HB 6119 to increase funding for arts, culture, and tourism. I am Eric Gaum, Professor of Music at Trinity College, where I'm Chair of the Music Department, Co-Director of the Center for Caribbean Studies, and Co-Chair of our Urban Global Arts Initiative. I'm also the founder and producer for the annual Samba Fest celebration, and in more than a decade, this event has provided direct service to more than 60,000 individuals at related events, including public school presentations, community music and dance workshops, conferences, and more. Music and the arts are vital components of human expression, and arts education helps lead to an understanding of human experience. People learn from music and the arts about what is important to helping to define one's own values. And through the study of music and the arts, one can begin to understand the purpose and value of artistic expression in human society. This is at the core of what I strive for as an arts educator. The arts have long suffered financial neglect in state funding across the country and the COVID-19 health pandemic has decimated the arts around the world. Why is it important to consider the arts when pondering our economic structure? Prior to the March 2020 shutdown, national arts revenue annually generated 4.5% or $878 billion of the United States gross domestic product. Those facts are from the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis. Since March 2020, the arts suffered an impact of $150 billion in lost revenue and more than 2 million unemployed artists through July 2020. As you've heard here today in other testimony, Connecticut has seen similar reduction in arts-related revenue and employment organization, uh, employment organization, I'm sorry, employment period. Organizations such as the Greater Hartford Arts Council and the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving have distributed emergency funding for artists, but the need is much greater than funds can support. As a performing artist, educator, and arts presenter in Connecticut, I strongly support passage of HB 6119, but I sincerely hope that we don't stop there. 
Since the arts have been so negatively impacted, we need to continue developing sustainable ways to support arts and culture so that they are not continually returning to the legislature with financial appeals just in order to survive. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, um, Eric. And thank you for your testimony with us today. Um, seeing no hands raised, um, we're going to move on to uh, Bob Murdoch from the Connecticut Convention Center. Is that right, Bob? Convention and Sports Bureau. So we're a little bit different than the center. Um, so thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to speak today. I'm uh, speaking in support of House Bill 6119. Uh, again, my name is Bob Murdoch. I'm the president of the Connecticut Convention and Sports Bureau. Uh, I'm also on the board for the Connecticut Lodging Association, a board member of the New England Society of Convention and Visitors Bureaus, as well as uh, executive committee for the Fairfield County Sports Commission. So um, it's important for to strengthen funding for arts, culture, tourism sectors in Connecticut. We've definitely been hit very hard by COVID. Um, and these industries are revenue generators for the state. We don't with other programs, but instead help pay for them. So it's, um, again, it's a return on investment. It's really a, an important investment for the state. And then just talking about our bureau, since we're, we're not, we're a little bit different than a lot of groups out there. We're um, a public private entity. We're, um, we're not state employees, but we are primarily funded by DECD, the Office of Tourism. And we are the only statewide meetings and sports events sales marketing organization. Our mission is to sell and market the state of Connecticut as a premier destination for national, regional, and statewide group businesses, business, conventions, and sporting events. We um, look to collaborate whenever possible uh, with other, uh, with the, the, our uh, Connecticut communities and other um, entities that have that same mission. And we're really trying to drive economic growth, tax revenue, and jobs through bringing events uh, to the state. And we, we're really a facilitator. We'll work with colleges and venues to bring these events really wherever it makes sense for that event planner. Um, and again, we, we are partially funded through the state. Uh, for every dollar uh, that the state funded us in uh, fiscal year 2020, uh, we brought $7.97 in state sales tax revenue uh, back to the state. So again, almost $8 uh, return on investment for every dollar that was given to us. Um, and that was roughly $3.4 million in uh, um, state sales tax for fiscal year 2020. And you know, again, just to sort of tell our story, we go after all sorts of meetings and events for the state. We work with event planners to find them what they need in Connecticut, wherever that is. Um, our primary focus is going after large events. We have a small staff of five. We're going after multi-day events where people stay overnight, eat in restaurants, visit museums and attractions, spend money at retail, buy gasoline, spend money in Connecticut. That's really the primary focus. Multi-day events, getting people from out of state to come to Connecticut. Um, and we ideally look for events that also bring television exposure or some kind of media exposure to the state as well. Um, you know, some of the events that we work on um, that are coming up that are, are sort of in question at this point are some of the pre-Olympic tour events. So we have USA Softball coming to Stratford. We're still sort of working out dynamics of that if, if that can happen. USA Gymnastics on their pre-Olympics uh, coming to Hartford. That event is broadcast on NBC. Uh, we have NCAA Division One, Two, II, and Three men's lacrosse national championships that would be at Pratt and Whitney East Hartford. Typically, that draws a hundred thousand people a year. Um, so, we're trying to salvage that event at this point. So, uh, and that's broadcast on ESPN. So, I think all those events are going to happen because of the television element. But it's, you know, we're going after large events that make economic impact for the state. So, helping. The funding for us, uh, we can continue to go after these large events that feed the other markets, the arts, the restaurants, uh, the hotels, um, and you know, 
obviously we want we want to do this in, in a safe way. We've changed our dynamics on what we do currently to go after those drive markets. Um, people aren't flying as much as they used to fly. So we're trying to, again, within the parameters uh, set by the governor, bring events here um, and find safe and convenient places for uh, event play, excuse me, event planners. Um, so again, we're in favor of this bill, you know, really looking for long-term consistent planning, uh, cons consistent funding so that we can plan for the long-term. Um, planners don't plan their event for next week. We're working on events for 2027 and, you know, down the line. So, um, you know, having that funding that we can go after these markets for the state of Connecticut is really important to us. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, and thanks for being with us. Uh, can you help me out? What's the line item DECD to um, the Connecticut Sports Association? We, we're not a, a line item. We're, we're just funded through the Office of Tourism. Through the Office of Tourism? Yes. Okay. And, and can you tell me what those funding levels were? Um, about when we were, we were created about uh, in 2012, uh, we received a million dollars then progressively dropped. Uh, we received $450,000 in uh, 2020, and then we were reduced again for, for this fiscal year to $425,000. We also raise, and it's a little more challenging in COVID, but we typically raise between two hundred dollars to $250,000 of private funding um, you know, to supplement our budget as well. It's a little bit down this year because some of the things that we normally do, we can't do such as uh, we're part of the tourism conference, um, which was canceled, uh, which usually brings in, you know, around $20,000 for our budget. So. Uh, so uh, tell me again, what are your um, venues for raising private dollars? We, uh, we have members. Uh, which are primarily hotels and attractions, um, such as the Mark Twain house, uh, since we're just up with that. Um, you know, people that would benefit from a large event coming to Connecticut, restaurants, hotels, attractions are, are primarily, and meeting venues, such as the Connecticut Convention Center or the Excel Center, uh, Webster Bank Arena, um, Chelsea Piers, people like that. And, and so they... Um give you, um, you know, per event or is it? No, it's an annual membership. Oh, oh member membership. Okay. Yeah. I see. And then we promote them through our website and other collateral. We partner uh, with venues to go um, on sales missions when we can do that um, to, to uh, meet with planners where they are, whether that's at conventions, trade shows, or, um, you know, doing, going to, for example, Northern Jersey and going after the pharmaceutical companies to have them bring their event to Connecticut. Um, and so, for example, in the last year, how, well, not the last year, let's go back to maybe what was it, like a more realistic year, 2019. So what did you raise on the private side? Um, around $250,000. Oh, okay. Okay. And, and, and there's, so it's not a line item in this budget so we're not a separate line item now. Okay, but is there any designation for what amount you are represented in this budget that is now before the legislature? No, we're just part of the Office of Tourism budget. Okay, so it's okay. not a separate broken out item. Yeah. Okay, and then my last question is: so sure. yeah, you are, um, events and so forth. Yep. I've I've never seen in the state of Connecticut, and I think we have great potential for it, to host an Ironman. Um, we've got great, yeah. we've got natural lakes. I think, quite frankly, of, um, uh, you know, near Northwestern Connecticut, the area by Lake Quatapog, they have run some very successful, um, you know, uh, events, but never, and I think they've actually been hosted by Ironman, but never uh, had that um, kind of an event. And so I'm just we curious. We actually had an um, Ironman bought an event uh, that used to be at uh, an event that was at Lake Quasi, uh, and they 
at an Ironman event for, for one year before COVID. Um, yeah, that was from Rev3, yes. Yeah, well, you formerly Rev3, yes. Yeah. They were around for, for one year as Ironman, and then uh, just with COVID, they canceled their event, uh, the next two events that they had. So I'm not sure they're gonna come back as Ironman just because of the of COVID if they're gonna ever come back uh, as an Ironman brand. But yeah, that'd be a group that we would go after an Ironman group. And so my question was, have you gone after them or they just came as a natural, because there were some other events there that you know I think maybe were run by Rev3. So that may have been the natural evolution, but you know, yeah. we're, Talking post COVID here, we're certainly yeah, just, well specifically on, on that Ironman event. Um, Rev three sold their rights and sold their brand that race to Ironman. So that's sort of how that came about. Um, and Ironman loved the demographics of Connecticut and the location. You know, everything about Connecticut works for them. So um, it, it, sometimes it's a challenge to go after you know a standalone Ironman event because they want money from the state, and money from us. Uh, sometimes significant money. Uh, we went after the CrossFit Games, which were, it's a huge event, ended up going to Madison, Wisconsin. We were the runner up, but you know, they wanted $100,000 from Connecticut to have that event come here. So there, there's sometimes some challenges on the financial side to, to get some of those events. Madison, Wisconsin gave them money. We didn't have the money to give them. <clears throat> we were the runner up for CrossFit? For CrossFit World Games that ended up in Madison, Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah, because they were previously, <clears throat> and um, yeah, it's, a, it's a huge event. It would have been a great win. It's it still sort of bothers me that we didn't get that one, to be honest. But um, you know, quite a bit actually. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. we, had, we had a, bet, a really good bid that um, the the uh, Excel Center, Pratt Whitney, and a couple groups collaborated on. We had a great bid, but it just came down to finances. Really. Will we be in? Will we be in the competition in the future? Um, we could be. CrossFit Games sort of took a big hit with their um, their spokesman saying things, but um, yeah, we you know, we go after events big and small. So yeah, we'll we'll definitely relook at CrossFit Games um, as well as other events. We're looking pretty much anything we can, you know, really huge events to you know. We also work on, you know, family reunions. You know, it, it could be really anything. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll definitely look at CrossFit and triathlon. Triathlon can be tricky, you know, just with some of the logistics of it. Um, we do work with local planners, for example, Hartford Marathon Foundation, which put a uh, triathlon on, on in Stanford for the first time. So uh, we do work with local promoters as well, helping them grow their events as well. So it's not just new events, it's also helping people that are here to grow. So, and that's how we really got involved with Rev3. I was working with them before Ironman bought them um, with Eric at Rev3. And then uh, you know, it, was yeah. nice. it was a nice win for them to become Ironman. Right. Well, yeah, I just think, you know, we kind of are a natural and it, because we've got those venues, you know, that Rev3 ran. And so this is just like the next step. And, you know, yep. the photography uh, is a huge attraction. You know this, um, you know, to, to the athletes who participate. Um, and I would love to see it. And, yeah, so keep going after those. because There's all they, sorts of cool events that were, you know, yeah. Sometimes I don't want to say what they are because I don't want to like doom them, but um, you know, like a women's cycling event that would primarily be in Connecticut, but would also start in New York City and end in Boston. So that's something that we've been working on for a couple of years. So it's all sorts of really cool things out there. It's just sometimes it comes down to financing, finding sponsors, you know, and then some of the logistics of, you know, a triathlon or a, a bike race of, you know, traffic and... Yeah, like who's going to strike roads and that kind of thing. I got it. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, Representative Simmons. Oh, thank you so much, Madam Co-Chair, and really enjoying this discussion. And um, thank you so much, uh, Bob, for all your leadership and and all that you do um, for our, you know Connecticut sure. Convention and Sports Bureau. And uh, really enjoy hearing your testimony, and especially during this difficult year. Thanks for everything you've been doing. Um, 
I'm just wanting to get your sense on kind of looking ahead, you know, where we are right now, unfortunately, uh, you know, so many meetings and things have had to been shut down, you know, per your testimony. And where do you see, um, or you know, what do you see um, in terms of how we can best help um, from the Commerce Committee and, and as a state in terms of supporting your efforts? I know you do such a good job in terms of, um, you know, selling Connecticut and recruiting um, businesses and events to, to come here. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, as we recover from COVID, if there's anything we can do to support your efforts, because we know that demand is going to be there once things fully open back up. Yeah. Um, I wanted to get your sense of any specific policies we can put in place to support your efforts and help make up for kind of the lost revenue and lost time that we missed. Yeah, I mean, the, the funding is definitely important. You know, you know, it comes through tourism to us, but be able to promote the state to planners being out there, you know, and again, we're, we're, we've been doing this all along through COVID, you know, in different ways, you know, uh, initially it changed to, you know, Connecticut's a safe place to come, you, you know, this is what our hotels are doing, you know, if you have a meeting, if we're allowed to have certain sizes, what you can do and what you can't do. So we've always had that education process. And, and last year wasn't a complete lost year for us, you know, youth sports, the governor did allow Bob Murdoch works for us. So we actually um, were able to salvage some events and, you know, people did at first reluctantly go to hotels and that built over time. So, you know, sports was definitely a, a win for us and going forward, you know, as our industry, um, we're again, we're a little bit different. You know, our primary goal is the large events and that's been a huge challenge because we're, we're not, we just, it's not safe to do large events at this point. So um, when I talked to Commissioner Lehman, you know, we're talking about at some point, we'd love to go to a percentage of capacity rather than a set number, you know, because something like the Connecticut Convention Center, 140,000 square foot expo hall, you know, right now we could have 100 people on it. It doesn't make sense for them to open. They haven't been open since last March and they're not going to open until July. Um, you know, that's our largest venue in the state. It's been shuttered. It'll be a year plus. Um, so, you know, just looking at things on um, percentages would be helpful. And again, it, it has to be safe to do that. Uh, we have to completely understand that, you know, that would be helpful for especially the larger venues and the larger hotels. Um, and then any kind of benchmarks so that we can plan for the future. Um, planners, you know, our large events, you know, work, we're working on stuff for, you know, I probably won't be working here anymore, but they'll be retired. But you know, way down the line, uh, this isn't talking about, you know, some of the events are next month, but other things are 10 years from now. Um, so being able to have some kind of benchmarks that we can tell people like, hey, when we hit X, then we can have your event so that, you know, we can just plan a little bit better. And I know that's really hard, hard thing to do. You know, something again, we, we bring up with Commissioner Lehman. We're just trying to reassure planners because people are hesitant to book business right now they're they're not even we have limited stuff for the summer except for outdoor sports um and you know people are still hesitant about the fall and it's just they don't know what they can do and they can't do they and again a lot of that's just unknown at this point but you know any at any point where we can set if we hit x benchmark we can do this just for planning purposes we're just trying to figure out ways that we can plan and reassure folks that they can have their events. And we're, you know, again, this is longer term. Got it, yeah, thanks for that. Some that funding would be great too, so we know we're gonna be here in you know, next year or the year after, so we can take a longer term view of things as well. Sure, absolutely. No, thanks for that answer and, and all of your efforts. And and in terms of the, the events that you do have coming up, do you feel that you have enough support in place in terms of PPE equipment and, you know, supplies and, um, you know, support to ensure those can happen safely or anything we can do to support you there? So we're, again, we're a little bit different because we're, we're an agency where I don't own anything. Like we don't own a venue. We don't own, we're more of working with the convention center or Excel center or hotel or uh, meeting venue or sports field on planning. So we're, we're sort of like a step, back from that. Um, I'm sure that, you know, so I can't really answer that because I, I, we don't actually have, that's not where we are. We're, you know, if we're working with the convention center, that's sort of on them to have that material. Um, I've, I've never heard anybody say they don't have 
they need more you know PPE or whatever it happens to be that's never been um, a stumbling block to date anyways so um, I think that unfortunately that's, I that I don't have knowledge of like what those venues need on that front so I, I can't really answer that real well but for, for us as an agency I haven't heard that and it's not something that we would need. Got it. Okay, that that's good to hear. And then, um, final question is: if if legislators, um, you know, want to want to work with with your office, um, could can they reach out to you for? Oh, absolutely, uh, yeah. Touch, yeah, yeah. Because you know, one of the things, you know, one of our best advocates for selling Connecticut is the people in the state, and pretty much everybody on this call belongs to something that you know you have meetings, whether it's you know your job or your your religion or your hobby. Um, you're going to meetings, events, and trade shows, and we always like, let us know what those are, you know, let's bring those to Connecticut, like, help, help us bring those events back home. So, I mean, that would be one thing. Um, we do, um, I did ask Commissioner Lehman about it, and um, to have some kind of video that we can put on our website, and that we can use as a sales tool, again, when the time is right, Connecticut's open, you know, come here, bring your event here, um, you know, ideally that's the governor doing that, um, that we can use as a sales tool when we're talking to, you know, just another positive message to, to say about Connecticut. And, uh, and again, we're in a great spot. You know, people are looking at Connecticut. We, we had some events just last year that we wouldn't have had, <laughs> you know, COVID just sort of helped us get a couple of events that we wouldn't have gotten because people are leaving cities or they're leaving places that they were always, and they looked at Connecticut and they came here. Uh, so, um, you know, being a safer venue, which we've always talked about, and, and again, not being New York City or Boston has its advantages in this case. Um, so, you know, being able to really just, whenever we can promote Connecticut and bring your event here, I mean, that's really what we're trying to do. Great. Thank you so much, Bob, for no, no, all of your you. work and all, all that you, you do. And uh, thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Thank you. Um, and so we'll move on. Mary Bugby. Thanks very Mary. much. Yes. Bye, Bob. Uh, is Mary with us? Hey, Mary. Hello. You've got, got the floor. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Mary Bugby. I'm a graduate assistant at UConn, where I'm a member of GEU UAW 6950. And I'm also a resident of Manchester. And I'm testifying on House Bill 5150, an act establishing a state hiring program for recent college graduates. So like my colleague, Thomas Reed, who uh, testified earlier, um, I also oppose this bill as written. While I agree with its stated purpose to incentivize uh, recent graduates to live and work in Connecticut, I really believe that the language in the bill will impede that purpose. So making employees ineligible to join any collective bargaining unit for their first five years through this program denies them the important benefits and security that are afforded to workers who are covered under CBAs. I'm a very proud Connecticut native and I want to live, um, I want to be able to live and work here after I graduate, whether that's going to be in the public or private sector, hopefully the public sector. And in fact, um, I've worked as a unionized Connecticut state employee um, for the first three years after earning my undergraduate degree. Um, I was a research assistant on two large Department of Defense projects that brought in hundreds of thousands of research dollars to UConn. And this job provided me with fair compensation and great benefits that gave me the economic means to live in Connecticut um, while also saving and planning for graduate school and also paying down my student loans from undergrad. I'm now in a graduate program at UConn where I'm researching health policy both here in the United States and in Mexico and I hope to be able to put my policy knowledge to use in a career here um, upon graduation in 2002, 2022, excuse me. Um, but if during the process of applying for jobs after graduating, I were to come across a program such as the one outlined um, in the bill as written, um, I really wouldn't be motivated to apply. And I would instead search for jobs that wouldn't be barring me from a collective bargaining unit, um, whether those jobs were in Connecticut or elsewhere. Um, I really believe that to have a competitive economy and to continue to build a talented state workforce, Connecticut needs to retain and attract talented workers and building an anti-union program to build this state workforce will not further these goals. 
So I think that if the state wants to keep graduates and talent within its borders, then they need to provide good faith economic incentives rooted in fairness and equity, um, barring people from being part of their workplaces union for five years, to me is neither equitable nor fair. Um, and I thank you all for your consideration of my testimony. Uh, thank you very much, Mary, um, for being with us and um, kudos to you on your research now, which couldn't be more important and best of luck in that pursuit, uh, Madam. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, so we'd like to move on now. Uh, Diane Blosch, uh, who is the Arts and Culture Collaborative, who I'm uh, pleased to say is from my own, um, my own area. Diane, you have the floor. Thank you, Senator Hartley, Representative Simmons, and all the members of the Commerce Committee. Thank you for hearing us about Bill 6119. My name is Diane Plock. I am the administrator of the Arts and Culture Collaborative for the Waterbury Region. We've been in existence since 2006 under the auspices of the Greater Waterbury Chamber of Commerce Foundation. And we serve artists, performers, theaters, arts and cultural organizations and their audiences in 16 towns in, Water, in the Waterbury area and Naugatuck Valley. We are one of eight such regional arts organizations covering the whole state. I am also a longtime member of the board of the Connecticut Arts Alliance, a statewide arts advocacy organization. I urge you to pass Bill 6119 and its key action, actions, especially to increase the percentage of hotel and lodging tax that is allocated to the tourism fund increasing it from 10 to 25%. Why? This will help prevent further economic injury, address the impact of the pandemic shutdown and accelerate recovery of not only the arts and culture sector, but all of Connecticut. This bill does not impact the hotel and lodging tax rate, which we discussed earlier. It simply allocates a larger percentage of that tax rate, that tax revenue, to the tourism fund. Which brings me to the next point that I wanna draw your attention to about this bill. And that is renaming the tourism fund to the arts, culture and tourism fund. This would more accurately describe its role in providing state funding to all three of our sectors. One relies on the other and supports the other. Our hope is that when we talk about tourism, we also talk about arts and culture as an integral part of that. Thus the need to rename the fund to arts, culture and tourism fund, like the arts, culture and tourism caucus has been renamed. A note about how that fund is broken down, 60% currently goes to tourism and 40% goes to arts and culture. As I understand it, this bill would help cement that breakdown. And I think all of us in the sector are good with that breakdown. The arts and culture industry spurs economic activity, as you know, and provides revenue to the state. In normal times, Connecticut's arts and culture sector is a vital economic engine that represents 5% of Connecticut's economy. It generates 9 billion in economic activity annually and supports 57,000 jobs. Just the nonprofit art sector alone returns $7 for every dollar invested by the state. So we are grateful for federal legislators and Governor Lamont in facilitating financial relief for arts and culture to address the economic impact of the pandemic. This bill 6119 provides Connecticut legislators the opportunity to add their support to this. So arts and culture mean business and they are key drivers for tourism in Connecticut's economy. This bill can help the arts and culture sector as it rebounds from the pandemic. So it in turn can help the state to rebound. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Uh, Diane, thank you so much uh, for being with us and also for uh, your patience on the wait. Um, it, but it, it's a testament to um, all of you in the arts, culture and tourism sector. 
um, uh, of being here with us today um, and reinforcing this message um, to us and also your um, conversation with regard to the renaming of the, of the fund. Um, so I, I thank you for your leadership in my own district, um, which has been invaluable um, and also for your work on a statewide level. I see no questions. And so um, we can proceed um, on to our next speaker, uh, Rufus Duram from the uh, Warner Theater. Are you Rufus? Yes, hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Rufus Duram. Uh, I use the pronouns he, him, his. I live in Kent, Connecticut, and I uh, am the executive director of the Warner Theater in Torrington, Connecticut. And I am testifying in support uh, for HB 6119, an act concerning arts, culture, and tourism funding. Um, I won't go through the specifics of the bill um, as we've already um, done so. I just do want to underscore the idea that uh, this is not increasing taxes, nor is it taking funding away from other legislative priorities, um, but it is a way that the legislative body can support our uh, industry. Um, and provide help in the immediate recovery, but also more importantly, provide a sustainable base uh, for long-term support of uh, a, a fairly vital component to our uh, downtowns uh, in both urban and uh, rural areas. Um, the Warner Theater uh, is uh, the largest arts organization in Northwest Connecticut. Um, we serve um, between anywhere between 80 to 100,000 people a year and generate $8.1 million of economic activity uh, into the economy. 96% um, of our patrons are actually Connecticut residents. Um, and we are a vital part of uh, the downtown Torrington economy and the uh, cultural heart of Northwest Connecticut. Um, state support helps us fulfill our roles as educator, convener, presenter, and allows us to leverage public support with further private donations because private donors like to see public support, um, especially for venues of our size. Um, we uh, were closed on March 30th, and we are looking that we probably won't reopen to anywhere near normal capacity until fall um, and early 22. Um, just as a point of uh, reference, um, the six major presenting venues of the state, so Bushnell, Palace Theater, Waterbury, Palace Theater, Stanford, Guard Arts Center, uh, and the Schubert Theater, um, and the Warner, uh, in fiscal year 1819, we, we served close to 750,000 patrons which generated an estimate of $20.7 million just in audience ancillary spend. So when you go out to a theater, you're gonna go eat at Sasso's and go drink at Brinks or one of the local breweries. Um, and this is a vital part uh, in a way that we support our small businesses. Um, and I also just wanna echo uh, my colleague Daniel from New Haven earlier said uh, urging people to support uh, or think about at least other revenue sources to support this fund. Um, the admissions tax is one, tourism surcharge is another, and others that are being considered in the legislation this year, um, such as marijuana tax and perhaps sports betting as well. Um, the more variety of revenue sources, the more sustainable this fund becomes. Um, and it helps not only large venues such as mine, but also a lot of smaller nonprofits um, that also use our spaces as well. Um, so thank you for considering this um, and thank you for um, doing your part to help support the arts and <laughs> a time that we need arts more than ever to come together as a community to heal um, and, and grow and learn from from this situation. 
Uh, thank you, Rufus. Thanks for being with us today. Um, and also, you know, my hat's off the Warner Theater, um, along with um, the other performing uh, venues, uh, really have, you know, made uh, Connecticut and their, their regions destinations in this state. Um, and for that, we are so proud. Uh, Representative Buckby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your uh, testimony today. I had to jump on because I, I know two people of the same name that live in Kent, Connecticut. It's kind of fun to see. Uh, yeah. so Robert, thank you so much uh, for, for giving testimony. Um, this is a, a bill that I uh, believe strongly in, the co-sponsor of the bill. Uh, Warner Theater means a lot. and I love seeing the fact that we have some Western Connecticut people testifying today, uh, not just the folks from, uh, from Mystic, which is lovely. Uh, but when you get up to our corner of the world, it's nice to see uh, uh, people stepping up and, and standing up for what they believe in. And uh, uh, Torrington's a wonderful place. And Warner Theater is, is a place we can't really do without. Uh, so it's a, it's definitely a historic piece of Connecticut, as well as a, uh, a great, just a great place. <laughs> and the dog really likes that, too. That's OK. Uh, <laughs> But I really wanted to just pop on and say thank you for, for taking the time and coming in. And uh, uh, there's a lot of support in Western Connecticut for you. Thank you, Representative Buckby. I'm, I'm sure my dad says hi. <laughs> <laughs> sure he does. And, and uh, yeah, I just, I want to, uh, speaking of that, I think Western Connecticut, especially Northwest Connecticut, is just really special. I grew up here. Um, I lived in New York for 12 years. I've come back. I came back three years ago. And I haven't been back to New York since because there's so much, Maisie, oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> She's in support of Bill HB 6119 as well, but thank you so much. <laughs> there you go, thank you, Rufus. Give everybody my best. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, moving on, uh, Brett Thompson. Brett, oh, here you are. Hello, Brett, you have the floor. You're, I think you're muted, Brett. Try hit the mute button. Try. Go ahead, Brett. Up. Uh, no, you're you're still muted. Um, we're not hearing you. Have you hit your your mic? Hit the mic button. Uh, Wendy or Ginger, do you have any expert um, advice here? Brett's having a hard time to get his mic activated. There, I think you're wrong. Oh, what's that? Sorry, I just, I, I'm not sure how to fix it on his end. It looks like he's unmuted, but his audio isn't coming through. Can you hear have us? You tried have you tried clicking the arrow next to, um, you know, where the mic is and making sure it's computer audio? Mm. Is that you, Brett? Does that work better? Yes. Yes. Okay. Hey, did it. So yeah, I have a new monitor, so it doesn't seem to be working very well. So bear with me. I'm working off a laptop now. Um, let me get my stuff up here. I appreciate your patience and I thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm Brett Thompson. I live in the beautiful Connecticut River town of Deep River and in the neighborhood of uh, Goodspeed Opera House, Gillette Castle and the Iverton Playhouse. I'm also the Interim Executive Director of Connecticut Arts Alliance and am submitting this testimony on behalf of our members from across the state. We are a nonprofit organization that advocates for the arts community, educates decision makers on the importance of the arts and organizes the arts community to speak with a strong unified voice. We fully support HB 6119 and respectfully request that it be moved forward in the legislative process. We are confident that it will help protect and restore jobs, prevent further economic loss, and accelerate recovery for the arts and adjacent industries, including restaurants, hospitality, and hotels. In normal times, Connecticut's art and culture sector is a vital economic asset that generates significant tax revenue, 
employs a sizable workforce and makes our state an attractive place to work and live. The many museums, performing venues, historic treasures, arts educators, artists, and other creatives all comprise an economic engine that represents 5% of our economy, generates 9 billion in economic activity annually, and supports about 57,000 jobs. The nonprofit sector alone returns $7 for every dollar invested by the state. But as we know all so well, these are not normal times. Like all Connecticut industries, the pandemic has devastated the creative sector. Lost ticket sales, closed revenue, uh, venues, and other business impacts have resulted in unemployment for more than 33,000 creative sector workers, $400 million in lost revenue for the nonprofit arts community, and an estimated $2.4 billion in lost sales across the economy. State funding for the arts um, is also at risk. Uh, the hardships that, uh, that I just mentioned are impacted by an arts community that is still struggling with the state funding cuts as a result of the 2008 recession. While progress has been made on that front in recent years, today our funding still lags where it was more than a decade ago. These short and long-term funding uh, issues are why HB 6119 is so important. Raising the percentage of the hotel and lodging tax to 25%, will in the short term help ensure that the tourism fund is able to support the arts community at its 2019 level before the uh, pandemic hit. While it's not a cure for the economic uh, devastation of the pandemic, it's a necessary part. Once our state recovers from the pandemic, the economic picture brightens and the hotel and lodging tax uh, revenues grows, the resulting boost to the tourism fund will move state support to and beyond its pre-recession level. The arts community will at last have resources that reflect its vital role in our state's economy and community life. We especially note how this additional funding will benefit arts and humanities organizations across the state through the work of Connecticut Office of the Arts and Connecticut Humanities. The arts community is, an important, uh, is important to Connecticut's economy, an integral part of its tourism industry, and a major factor in our quality of life. Our state needs this community. In fact, we can't recover from the pandemic without it. We urge you to join us uh, in helping to ensure our arts community survives and thrives by supporting HB 6119. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Brett. Um, thanks for your testimony. Um, we hear the message loud and strong. Um, I don't see any hands raised, so I'm going to go to uh, Larry Rizzolo. Larry. Larry, hello. Hello, can you hear Hi. me? Hi, yes, can we you can hear. hear. Me now? <laughs> yes, you've got the floor, sir. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I thank uh, the chairs and committee members for the opportunity to support uh, HB 6119. My name is Larry Rizzolo. I'm a medical educator at the Yale University School of Medicine, but I want to emphasize that these are my own thoughts and do not necessarily represent Yale University. I will summarize my submitted uh, written testimony. Arts add a, a rich texture to our lives and also serve a critical function. I wanna to speak to how arts education in our elementary, middle and high schools uh, are essential for medical education. Uh, committees that incorporate arts and humanities throughout the four years of medical school. Uh, human dissection uh, violates so many societal norms and has a lasting impression on our students. During and at the end of the course, we ask students to reflect on their experience of human dissection. Many students process their, emotion, their emotions by writing prose, poetry, and through the visual and performance arts. Stresses inherent in medical education throughout the fall years. Imagine being a medical student, having your first experience of the death of your patient, and then having to tell the family. Imagine running a family meeting where the, where, uh, the terminally ill patient had to choose between a last ditch effort at chemotherapy or a comfort care to ease the path to death. Imagine a family member asking you doctor, Remember, you're a medical student. Doctor, what would you do? 
Yale and many medical schools provide writing, art, and music programs to give students a venue to process their emotions and to relieve their stress. How important is this? Recall your own interactions with clinicians. All highly skilled, but classically trained clinicians have a practiced emotional detachment, allegedly to maintain their objectivity. But it's known that empathic clinicians elicit more complete patient histories, which aids diagnosis, and are more successful in explaining to patients what they must do, and therefore get better patient outcomes. Because of the value of arts and humanities, leading medical schools like Yale favor applicants with strong backgrounds in the arts and humanities. Yale could fill its entire class with straight A science majors, or even with PhD scientists. Instead, Yale looks for well-rounded students capable of becoming empathic clinicians. I speak to the importance of arts and medical training, but isn't it true for any number of professions, including police, firefighters, emergency personnel? Think deeply about your own work as legislators. Even if you're not a skilled artist, I bet you developed an appreciation for the arts beginning with your K through 12 education. You may not appreciate it, because it's become an integral part of who you are, even if you didn't like those uh, activities when you were in school. It helps you put people first in your service to them. Thank you for considering this testimony and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Larry. Um, and thank you for that, um, that perspective on, on this conversation today. That, that is unique um, in, in what we've been hearing and I think really illuminating. Uh, I, don't, I don't see um, any raised hands. Um, hold on, I'm just double checking. Uh, so thanks, Larry. Um, and, and we so appreciate uh, this perspective um, on today's conversation. You're very welcome. Uh, and I'm sorry. I. I'm sorry, I was muted, or I was, my video was off. Okay, so moving on here, um, Scott Dulch, please. Scott, I see you're on deck. Hey guys, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. All right, uh, good afternoon, uh, Senator Hartley, Representative Simmons, Senator Martin, uh, Representative Buckby, and members of the Commerce Committee. Uh, my name is Scott Dulch, and I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Restaurant Association. On behalf of Connecticut's 8,500 restaurant and food service locations and Connecticut's 160,000 food service employees, the Restaurant Association appreciates the opportunity to be here today in support of House Bill 6119, an act concerning arts, culture, and tourism funding. This timely legislation will provide enhanced resources to the state's tourism budget, which will have a significant impact not only on the restaurant industry, but many other hospitality businesses in our state. Over the past 11 months, our industry has watched more than 600 restaurants close. Even for those that have managed to stay afloat, they have faced incredible challenges as they have had to adjust to the limits of their business and have worked extremely hard to find new ways to operate while keeping their customers and their employees safe. The purpose of testifying today is to highlight that culinary tourism in Connecticut is real and we need to provide the proper resources to showcase this benefit, not only to our residents, but to those who travel to Connecticut from around the world. Our state has some of the best dining experiences in the world. However, I feel that we sometimes take this for granted. We have landmark restaurants like the Griswold Inn, Louis Lunch, Jay Timothy's, Millwright's, Frank Pepe's, Modern, Sally's, Lenny and Joe's, Carbone's, Ryan's Deli, Max Downtown, Abbott's Lobster in the Rough, Union League Cafe, Colony Grill, Columbus Park, and so many more. Even this week, Barstool Sports founder, Dave Portnoy, tweeted that in his opinion, New Haven was the pizza capital of the, of the US. And we even have state legislators proposing a new bill to make pizza the official state food. Connecticut's restaurants are the cornerstones of our communities. And our restaurants and our communities have been devastated by this ongoing crisis. Even as we look to reopen beyond 2.1, this spring and summer, we need to be encouraging tourists to come visit our sports venues, theaters, museums, aquariums, parks, breweries, restaurants, hotels, and more. Our state has a chance to be a leader in business recovery, but without an increase in the tourism fund, we will quickly be left behind by our neighboring states. Just this week, Governor Lamont talked about Connecticut's comeback. 
And I'm hopeful each of you see the value in increasing tourism dollars as it will allow us to come back stronger than ever. Thank you for your time and for considering this testimony and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, so Scott, uh, first of all, thank you. Um, and to the association, um, you know, you have been uh, working tirelessly um, as your members, uh, uh, you know, through this incredible, um, unimaginable, challenging time. Um, you know, it, it's chilling to hear you say that we've lost 600 restaurants. Um, but I mean, and I just know in my area, you know, I'm watching um, so closely. What's the chance of any of those reopening? Uh, I hope strong. I think uh, what I've just been doing stories today before hopping on this, um, what we're seeing right now is a lot of other restaurants uh, temporarily closing. Um, we've seen more temporary closures in the last few months, what they like to call hibernation. Um, I've told the media I don't like that word as I try to explain to my kids, you know, you think of a bear hibernating, they're full for the winter and they're going to come back in the spring. Great. But a restaurant that's deciding to temporarily close is is making it a very difficult decision with, you know, financial straits that are very difficult. They're, they're carrying a lot of debt. Um, you know, they're, they, they're bleeding out and they're making a decision to close with the hope of reopening. Um, but, you know, I think even those temporary closures, Senator Hartley, or even the ones that have closed permanently, we need to do as much as we can um, to help them, you know, make a decision to come back. I think there's definitely areas uh, that you know well that that have been hit harder, hit harder than most. Um, our urban centers of, of restaurants, you know, downtown Hartford, New Haven, uh, Bridgeport, Stanford, that rely on business traffic, that rely on events, um, which is a part of this discussion today, uh, to get back on their feet. And uh, that's why it's so crucial. Um, we try to attract people back safely, obviously, um, but get them back this spring and summer. I think, uh, you know, Senator Fermika earlier today talked about staycations. Uh, which is great and we need that, but we also need people to come outside of the state and the region uh, to make a trip to Connecticut and have some pride in, in what we have to offer. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, you know, to your point, our, our, our chances about building back better and, you know, being uh, a leader in, in recovery is, um, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be a challenge. Would you, so would you say that the industry in the urban centers, you know, have been hit harder? Uh, I think, I mean, as you guys can imagine, and I don't think anyone asked to be in the roles that we're in and being on a Zoom call here, I'd love to see you guys in person. You know, I never would have imagined what I've dealt with, but, you know, I, I, the people that I talk to every time I get a call, uh, Senator, you know, I give them five minutes to explain their story, their restaurant story, because everyone's affected differently, unfortunately. Um, you could be in a city and be okay. Um, you could be in a remote, you know, area and be hurting. Um, you know, it depends on what your cuisine is. It depends on who your clientele is. You could be in Stanford, as Representative Simmons knows well, Columbus Park. You know, their, their clientele, even though she is in that, she's not in this age group, but their average clientele is between 55 and 65 to 70. And, you know, they struggle. And down the street, you have Taco Daddy and John Nealon has a much younger demo um, that they've, they've weathered the storm and also what their food is, is weathered. So, Everyone's been affected. I just think, you know, I worry more so, like you said, about the urban centers because we don't know what the future holds for our businesses. You guys here at the state capitol usually support a lot of those Hartford restaurants when you're at the capitol. And that unfortunately hasn't happened in well over 12 months. Um, what travelers, Hartford, Aetna, UBS, and Stanford, you look at some of these large business, what's their future hold for their employees to come back to work um, is going to have a huge impact on our restaurants. And and uh, that, that's something that we're gonna keep a close eye on and try to help support. Um, and then I have heard anecdotally that, for example, you know, there's tears in every association. And for example, like the five star restaurants have been disproportionately affected because it's the kind of venue where you go in and it's a long, um, a, 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 you know, a, a, a long, dinner as opposed to, you know, something that's quicker, um, less formal. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think the fine, the full service restaurants have been hit the hardest, the fine dining, um, because of, you know, first of all, when, when we were closed for two months in March and April, um, you had to adapt and take out to go use on average is about eight to 10% of your restaurant business. It's now anywhere between 40 and 50%. So, you know, if you were a five star restaurant that, you know, wanted to, to be a James Beard, like, how did you pivot? How did you adapt? Uh, to this changing climate. And some have done it okay, but it's been a much more of a struggle um, for them. And then a whole nother sector that I think people get lost in our industry is, is catering and private events. Um, that's a huge part of our industry. Every restaurant has a catering license for the most part. Uh, I actually sent a letter today, which is timely to the governor and legislative leaders uh, working with the Connecticut Event uh, Industry Coalition. You had Bob Murdoch on earlier from Connecticut Convention and Sports Bureau. Uh, our letter was asking for some some guidance and a plan for indoor events um, into the spring. We are losing uh, weddings um, dates uh, left and right um, in in quarter two and even early quarter three, uh, which scares scares me. You know about that sector of this industry that's been devastated. They've lost an entire year of revenue. Uh, we don't. I don't want to see them lose the second and third quarter. So if we can hopefully be like New York and New Jersey and put some dates out there and some planning to give some confidence to our consumers. Um, but yeah, I mean, everybody's been affected in our industry in different ways and it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, but you know, I'm trying to fight every day that I, that I can to, to help this, this industry make it back. And I think the tourism side of this, I think it, for so many, I've been in this role for three years, I know it's been talked about and everything else, but I think it's a huge opportunity here for, for us uh, all, especially the legislators to step up and, and, you know, you look at $3 return on investment for every dollar invested, but um, really taking a, a step up in the right direction to make, be proud of Connecticut. I name those restaurants off. Every single one of you guys can probably name four or five restaurants in your own district that are landmarks that you know. The um, last thing you want to see is see them close their doors, but also how do you encourage people to go, you know, and, and eat out them and support them? So that's why I think these dollars can, can really go a long way. Uh, and then lastly, I will ask you, because this is maybe you know, a little bit uh, in a different lane, but, uh, you know, this committee was looking at the list of EOs that were put out to see which ones from a business perspective and small business per perspective may be worthy of codifying. And so I would ask you to get back to us with, um, you know, response on that, sir. Absolutely, John. It's, uh, you know, I know there's uh, we are appreciative that the executive orders right now in certain capacities, I don't know if it overlaps commerce as I got to understand your guys' committees a lot, but obviously uh, the to-go alcohol piece of general law was a, definitely a boom. We hope to keep that going. We know that there's a expanded outdoor dining. We're trying to the 7MM uh, EO is extended through April 20th. We want to see a resurgence of expanded outdoor dining in all of your districts uh, for at least through 2021. Um, as I talk to the towns, your, your mayors and first selectmen that want to do plan and be creative for that. So there's a couple of pieces to, to what the governor has done, which there's definitely some, some good that he has with these EOs. And we hope to continue that through legislative um, bills here at this session. So I'm happy to keep you guys in the loop. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, the silver lining, um, you know, as perverse as this might seem, is developing some of these other business lines, so to speak. Um, and, you know, we, of course, are interested in, in embracing that from the Commerce Committee level. Um, uh, Representative Simmons, Co-Chair Simmons. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. And Scott, thank you so much for your testimony today and for all that you've been doing to support Connecticut restaurants during this past year. And I know your leadership and, and advocacy for um, you know, helping them get through when things had to shut down in March, you you were really on the front lines advocating for a deferment on the sales tax and advocating for more grants and access to capital and um, rent and mortgage relief. And I think, you know, your voice and um, hearing from all the restaurants um, was was really helpful to us in, in working with the governor's office um, this, this past year to advocate for those initiatives. So thank you for that and for being here today. And I know that we still have a difficult road ahead of us and, you know, wanted to ask, um, you know, in terms of legislation, what we could do on this committee to help, you know, as you said, not only, you know, save our restaurants, but help people get back to work and, and return to those jobs that they may have lost. Um, anything that we can do legislatively um, to support the restaurants, which, as you said, are really the cornerstone of our community. Yeah, I mean, I, I will continue to, to get back to, obviously, uh, Caroline, you and, and Joan and, and all members of this committee, if you guys have ways and ideas, I think, you know, today was, was important for me to testify on tourism, because I think that sometimes 
I, I continue to bring up the culinary food tourism thing is a real thing. People get lost on that. And, and uh, we have to make sure that, that we're doing different things and working as I work with Randy Five Ashes team as much as I can uh, to incentivize that. But it's, it's a start, but there's, there's going to be a handful of other ways um, that we're going to need support, you know, whether it crosses into this, uh, this committee specifically or not. I, I you know, I, I know, you know, help with, as you mentioned earlier, tax taxation or other ways to, to, you know, grant programs or anything else. I know the 85 million that the DCD put out, um, the 50 million and $5,000 grants, and then the 35 million in helping those 2008 businesses with 10 to $30,000 grants was, was definitely a bridge and, and it's, and it's helped. But, you know, when you compare that to some other states, though, I still think there could be more help on the horizon. You look at Massachusetts, uh, they did a, you know, we did, we did a $35 million program that is $660 million program. So, you know, I'm not saying our state has that, that coffers for that, but I think we, we also will continue to look to, to help um, this, these businesses get back on their feet and, and in a long-term plan. You know, I think we, we want to be leaders, as you said, uh, Caroline, in, in this process, I want to be, you know, I want to be a revival of our industry more so than I'm competitive than other states. How do we, you know, be incentivizing people to reopen their doors or also people to come in from out of state to say, hey, you know what, that's a great restaurant climate and environment. I think I want to try to do that in Connecticut. So any way that we can do that, I'm, ha I'm all ears too, to, to each of you on this committee of, of ways that we can help. And I really, really appreciate each of you uh, reaching out to me individually and, and conversations within your towns. Um, it, it's, it's really been supportive and helpful. Got it. Thanks so much, Scott. And yeah, keep us posted if there's anything um, that we can do. And thanks so much for mentioning all those restaurants before and the shout out to Columbus Park and Stanford. You're making me hungry just thinking of <laughs> going there. Um, and I know um, legislators have all been doing a good job of this, but just, you know, continuing to work to encourage constituents to to order takeout and, and, and go to these restaurants, you know, safely, of course, and, and following all protocols. Um, but, you know, but on that note, you know, one other bill we're looking at, or one other measure um, that that may be before us is, you know, looking at the the fees that um, companies like Uber Eats and, and Grubhub charge on on takeout and delivery orders, and, and wanted to see if you've heard any feedback from restaurants on that, because we know that the margins are so small already, and that when those companies take a thirty percent cut, it can be hard for them to make, you know, make any revenue or profit on the delivery. So, wanted to just get your sense of that. No, it's a I knew I had a feeling that might come up. And obviously for me, um, you know, it's, it's been tough. I think that, you know, when you talk about the third party delivery companies, the initial reaction you guys hear from restaurants is, you know, it's 30% like this isn't, and it's hard for me to sit here as a business trade association and try to tell you, Hey, you need to mandate or make sure that they, they low, you know, like I, I, I use the analogy all the time in my restaurant tours. I don't go to the food purveyors and say, you have to sell chicken at three ninety nine a pound. And that's it. Like we're capping it. Um, you know, they are, there are, individual relationships that these guys do. And, and I give DoorDash, you know, especially a lot of credit for you guys to know two weeks ago, they provided a half a million dollars to our foundation. And we have launched what's called the Connecticut Restaurant Relief Fund, where, you know, besides the federal and state grants, we're going to be giving out 5,000, over 90 plus $5,000 grants to the hardest hit restaurants across the state. Unfortunately, I had 760 completed applications on Friday. So I'm like, great, it's, it sounds great, but then you just wish you had more money. But you know, they, they are coming to the table to be helpful. I think the challenge with the cap side, uh, Caroline, is just, you know, like a lot of the caps that you've seen in other states around us have been tied to the pandemic. By the time a bill maybe passes, we might be beyond the takeout, outdoor dining and such. But there is a bill that that you guys, it might cross over here that that we've talked with Representative D'Agostino and General Law, which actually I have support from most of the third party companies. Um, but it's about consent. So just to, not to get into the weeds with you guys, but a lot of these companies come in and they don't ask the restaurant for consent and they put up their menus and they put up that restaurant uh, on their website. And then all of a sudden you'll call and order something and it might be an old menu, it might be a different price. And then they, they don't get mad at the door. They don't get mad at the third party company. They get mad at the restaurant and they're like, wait a minute. I, so we're trying to get at least, I saw in Cal California has a bill, Texas. So we've, we've written some language similar that we've given a general law to look at. Um, and I know, I know it probably has some crossover here that we'd love to see get through just, um, and, and also we have support from the third party because some of them have done it early on, but they're like, we get it. Um, I think that'll go a long way uh, with these companies into the future that we make sure, um, you know, there's protections for the restaurants and, and there's the consent, not so much contract, but at least consent to use their IP and their menus, um, you know, cause I've seen some horror stories, but I think the capping side, I, I just, I, I, it's not something I, I'm almost trying to go to the partners alone and trying, that's why the DoorDash came to us with what they did. They're also offering free commission fees 
for anybody new that signs up for 30 days. I talked to Uber Eats last week. They're trying to do some different things as well. Like, you know, I'm trying to go that route. I, I, I prefer not to get into a business to business legislative side, um, but I also understand this piece and let's keep talking about it. Um, but I would hope we can, we can get this consent bill done on um, this session because I think it will definitely help the restaurants, not only in the pandemic, but for future, future years. Great, thanks for, for that answer. And thanks again, Scott, for all the work that you're doing. Thank you, no Madam problem. Chair. Thank, thank you, uh, Representative Simmons. Um, I don't see anybody else's hand up, but that was very um, helpful to hear about, uh, you know, these conversations with the third parties. Um, Scott, yeah, because that is certainly preferable, um, you know, in terms of, you know, otherwise putting on legislative guardrails. Um, so uh, that's a, a TBC, sir. Um, and then, yeah, anything else on the EOs um, or or the like, um, but it's timely. So, so, you know, get back to us quickly if you could. Um, thank you. I see no other hands unless I've missed something, have I? Um, okay. And next, I think it's Elaine Carroll, is it from the New Haven Symphony? Yes, hey, Elaine. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Good afternoon, Co-Chair Senator Hartley. Also to Co-Chair Representative Simmons, Vice Chair Senator Cohen, Vice Chair Representative Rochelle, and all of the esteemed members of the Commerce Committee. My name is Elaine Carroll, and I am honored to serve as the CEO of America's fourth oldest orchestra, your New Haven Symphony. HB 6119 provides much needed resources that will strengthen the arts and cultural ecosystem in Connecticut and help us to recover from the pandemic. At your symphony, each of our 65 professional musicians have been without performance work throughout the crisis. Prior to the pandemic, New Haven Symphony performed for 50,000 people each season, 20,000 of them students. Your symphony remains a resource to schools during the pandemic and has launched new virtual programs to support distance learning. Online tools that we created to serve Connecticut schools are now in use on every continent except Antarctica. We've reached 32,000 listeners since the shut shutdown. And in addition, the New Haven Symphony has won national awards for its innovation and leadership in addressing diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice in the arts. The New Haven Symphony spends over $2 million annually, mostly in wages to professional musicians. Our economic impact of $3 million generates $273,000 in state and local revenues. As we rise to move beyond the pandemic, arts organizations will play an essential role in the healing and reopening process. I ask for your support of HB 6119 to ensure a vital revenue stream that invests in our reopening and promotes the stability of our sector into the future. Thank you for your service to the citizens of Connecticut and I appreciate your consideration of this request. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Um, and thanks for hanging in there with us um, and the work that you do. Uh, and that's, that's a great um, uh, credit, the fourth oldest um, orchestra. Take a bow, take a bow. Um, are there others um, online to comment? Seeing none. Um, Elaine, thank you for being with us today and for your testimony. Much appreciated. Uh, we will go on now to um, John uh, Mathers, uh, Madison Beach Hotel. General Manager is John with us. Do not see John. Um, Wendy Burry. Um, I'm, I'm here. Thank you. Oh, oh John. Thank okay. Did, didn't mean to be. It didn't mean to be um, uh, hasty. You have the floor, okay. sir. Thank you. All right. Uh, Co-chairs Senator Hartley and Representative Simmons, Vice Chairs and all co uh, Commerce Committee members. My name is John Mathers. I'm the general manager of the Madison Beach Hotel, the beautiful shoreline town of Madison. I'm also a board member of the Connecticut Logic Association and a member of the Connecticut Restaurant Association and the Connecticut Tourism Coalition. Today, we've heard several excellent testimonies about the importance of tourism to the state economy. In order not to echo the comments of the other speakers with whom I agree, I would like to address more specifically the impact our little hotel has on our local and regional economy. The Madison Beach Hotel has just 34 guest rooms, a beautiful waterfront restaurant, a small spa, 
and banquet facilities that allow us to host weddings and social events and corporate meetings. We're one of the few AAA Four Diamond hotels in the state. And as part of Hilton's Curio Collection, we've been consistently recognized as one of their top destinations globally. Now I'm not intending to exploit this forum to brag or to uh, advertise my hotel. Rather, my intent is to illustrate the significance of each and every business that makes up Connecticut's tourism industry. We're just one small hotel in the state, but prior to the COVID era, our annual payroll was $2.4 million. And we contributed approximately a half a million dollars in occupancy tax to the state each year. That's in addition to the 7.35% sales tax generated by our food and beverage revenues. Roughly 55% of our, of our visitors are from out of state. Like other lodging establishments throughout Connecticut, we are bringing outside dollars into the state where they continue to trickle throughout the economy. Our guests shop with our local merchants and they dine in our local restaurants. Many shop owners in downtown Madison will tell you that our hotel guests represent a measurable and much needed percentage of their sales. And realtors will tell you that they have sold houses to tourists that have visited and fallen in love with Madison and Connecticut. My little hotel's marketing budget for 2021 is $600,000. That includes sales, payroll, advertising, and other marketing expenses. Now we choose to invest that money because it generates revenue for us, ROI. It would make no sense for us to cut our marketing budget in an effort to save money. We know that reducing our marketing budget would result in lower revenues. The same principle applies to the state. The less Connecticut spends promoting tourism, the less tax dollars we will generate as we watch travelers choose other highly visible destinations, namely our neighboring states. Randy Fiveash, the director of our own governor's office of tourism can provide you with state financial reports that demonstrate, as you've heard, every $1 spent on tourism marketing generates $3 in revenue for the state. It's very important, however, to note that this three to one ROI is realized within 12 months. The Office of Tourism can also provide data that clearly shows the direct and almost immediate relationship between the tourism budget and tax revenues. Historically, as the state has attempted to save money by cutting tourism spending, we have suffered even greater losses in revenue. Conversely, each time our investment in tourism has grown, we've enjoyed a three to one return. Prior to 2012, I spent much, much of my career in Massachusetts. I've served on the board of the Mass Lodging Association, and I currently serve on the board of the New England Inns and Resorts Association. I can tell you that not only do our neighboring New England states understand the value of tourism marketing, they relish the fact that we don't. As a hotelier and as a resident of Connecticut, I strongly encourage you to support HB 6119 considering all that we have to offer with the proper investments, we can and should convert Connecticut from being the drive-through state to the drive-to state. Thank you so much for holding this public hearing and I really appreciate you providing me this opportunity to speak. Thank you, John. Um, and it sounds like just a quintessential, beautiful spot down there, um, the Madison Beach Hotel. So is your um, uh, season, season, you know, typically spring, summer, fall? Well, we're a 12 month hotel. Um, historically, um, the hotel has been here for well over a hundred years. And until 2012, it was only open seasonally. But since 2012, uh, we've been open 12 months a year. And obviously our prime months are June through September, June through October, but we do enjoy uh, business throughout, this, throughout the year. In fact, this weekend I'm sold out. Uh, and it just shows you that particularly with New Yorkers, they love a getaway from the city. We're two hours from New York City and uh, an easy place for them to, to retreat, for people to retreat, so. Are you, are you right on the water? Directly on the water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Sounds lovely. Um, <laughs> we uh, we um, clearly um, appreciate uh, the message that you all have um, so clearly delivered to us today. Uh, thank you. Thanks, John. Enjoy the weekend, and I'm glad you're booked. Thank you. Uh, we are, too. Uh, okay, going on. Wendy Burr, please. Um, uh, Southeast Connecticut Cultural um, Coalition. Wendy. Hi, good Hi. afternoon. Oh, there you are. Yep. Hi. Hi, good afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Madam Chairman, for this opportunity. And I first want to say this is actually really a, an amazing experience to be testifying virtually, uh, which I actually hope the legislatives uh, you know, in the future sessions will be a hybrid. Um, this makes it accessible, easy. Um, I'm not going to spend 10 hours up in Hartford today um, doing this, although I will say it's been great to see my colleagues and a special shout out to Scott Dolch, who's been an amazing champion uh, this past year and a colleague um, recently. So I'm Wendy Berry. I'm the executive director of the Southeastern Connecticut Cultural Coalition. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization that serves the 42 towns that make up Eastern Connecticut. We serve more than 500 arts, cultural, and creative businesses, including sole proprietors, artists, small volunteer run organizations, historical societies, museums, performing arts centers. I serve on the board of the Connecticut Arts Alliance. I'm the chair of its Arts um, Policy and Issues Committee. And in 2018, I served as the co-chair of the governor's, uh, Governor Lamont's uh, Transitional Arts, Culture and Tourism Policy Committee. Uh, we certainly um, support this bill and we considered it, uh, consider it essential by the industry. Um, one of the things I just, because all the points have really been hit, um, but one, a couple highlights that I wanna just kind of just drive home. You're hearing some different numbers around the three to one and the seven to one. Uh, you're hearing different numbers around economic impact. Uh, and you're hearing some of, the, some of the previous history around the silos that were arts and culture in one bucket, tourism in another, restaurants, lodging, hospitality, gaming. And over the past few years, what you are seeing today in this bill coming forth is this real um, uh, representation of the recommendations from three years of very thoughtful and collaborative work through the arts, culture, and tourism leaders, including restaurant, lodging, hotels, uh, and the like. Um, this, recommend this bill actually represents uh, and has been supported by the Governor's uh, Policy uh, Transition Committee, the Speaker's Blue Ribbon Panel, the Connecticut Arts Alliance, the Connecticut Tourism Coalition, um, and it's been much needed and much deserved for, for many years, um, and now it really is essential. Um, so what you're seeing is this wonderful breaking down of the silos of these industries who used to compete with each other for funding, who have now come together and found the solution that we know will help all of us and a rising tide lifts all boats. I encourage you all to look at the Tourism 101 document, Tourism Fund 101 document that many of the organizations that I just mentioned share. And that really does provide the overview of where the Tourism Fund invests, which is state government offices of tourism, arts um, and uh, uh, the like, humanities, the individual uh, direct line items of organizations and the statewide tourism marketing. And this is where you're seeing different numbers and different information because each one of those entities has their own economic impact data that, that is attached to it. Um, a couple of just key uh, other points. Right now, as of um, the most recent data we have, it's $2.4 billion in lost revenue for the creative uh, economy here in Connecticut in 2020. 56% unemployed creative workers in Connecticut as of in 2020. That is over 33,000 workers who are now uh, made unemployed by COVID. 57% of creative workers have experienced a drastic decrease in their work. Um, so this bill actually, you know, obviously helps to address some of the pandemic's impact, but more important, it's that it's that long-term, smart, and consistent investment in a major economic and community driver. Um, some things that we want to point out. Uh, we know that once we start to reopen, and everybody's talked about the reopening and we're excited for it when it does happen safely, but the data shows that 69% of visitors come here for the arts and cultural offerings. So the entities that help drive the revenue to the state are asking that the state reinvest a larger proportion, not 10 cents on the dollar, but 25 cents on the dollar, reinvest it back into asset development. And we're asking that so that, the, so that in the end, right now these arts and cultural or organizations are at risk and uh, we can't market and promote the state to the outside of the world uh, when everything is said and done if we haven't taken care of those assets that are here suffering right now. But they are asking for you to reinvest a small portion, one quarter of the money that they help drive to the state to go back into making sure that they're gonna be okay, that they survive, recover, and once again thrive. 
If there is an opportunity for improvement to this bill, my colleagues have mentioned it previously, it's diversifying this revenue stream. Uh, we've all clearly seen that the tourism funds dependence on one revenue source, this lodging tax, which has been decimated, has led to an enormous deficit in the tourism fund. And it's now under the budget and the legislators to help rectify to prevent further economic injury. So dedicating small portions of other revenue streams, existing or new, um, is really gonna help protect the fund uh, and its investments from radical swings in the fund balance and the need for legislators to provide unanticipated fixes along the way. That consistent, stable and predictable funding source that you are hearing consistently from all of the partners that are here um, is absolutely critical to help them with planning. So beyond all the things that have been mentioned, obviously it's a decision making in terms of where businesses get located, uh, where people choose to live or visit and travel, arts and culture and tourism uh, are a huge part of that decision making process. Uh, this bill supports the state's goals for workforce development, innovation through cultivation of creative thinking, strong communities and high quality of life. Uh, but I think what, what's what I'm most proud of is seeing is after, the, after three years of a lot of work and discussion, you're seeing this united effort from all the adjacent industries and the hospitality kind of sector abroad who have really come together to create a solution here that we all agree with, that we all support, and we all know will benefit us and the state as a whole. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, when um, industries come together, unify, uh, present in a, you know, coalition fashion, um, it really does help us in the legislature, um, because the truth of the matter is, any legislative session, but in particular this one, there is so much, you know, coming forward, and this just helps us to laser focus it. And your remarks were were very um, specific and and informative. Do you did you give us written testimony, Wendy? I did. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's very good. Um, so, uh, having said that, um, I'm grateful. For for your participation today and in particularly for what you do and your advocacy. Um, I see no hands raised, um, Wendy. Thanks for hanging in there with us. All right. Um, and with that, I would like to go on to Ed Levy, um, the SVFT AFT president. Mr. President. Hi, Chairperson, are... Hi, Chairperson Hart Hartley and Chairperson Simmons. Um, I am Ed Levy. I am the president of the State Vocational Federation of Teachers from the Technical High School System, where I began teaching in 1985. Um, I am here to speak in opposition to Bill 5612. I did hear the conversation earlier today between our Vice President Paul Angelucci and the members of the committee, and so I will go from my written testimony and just mention a couple other topics. Our shortages in trade teachers are partially due to the problems of recruitment, um, much of which has to do with the salaries. Uh, but the other issue is retention, that it is hard to maintain trade teachers when, they, when they're not properly, when they don't come into the system with the classes or they don't take them immediately. I started teaching in 1985. Uh, I'm an English teacher. And my first year was rough, as they tend to be. But I had classes and student teaching experience that I could look back on and said, okay, I know that works. And I'm going to use that to get me through. I also had the realization that I had a degree in English and I was trying to raise a small family, a young family. So the options of leaving didn't exist. That's not true for our trade teachers. That they come in and they have left a career and that has been successful and they have not had the classroom experiences. And I have seen over my 36 years that it's those, those classes that help them and those courses that give them moments during their first year where they say, oh, that did work. And oh, I can be successful in this profession. When you spoke to Paul Angelucci earlier today, he talked about changing professions. And that's the way our successful teachers, trade teachers believe, that they have, they have changed professions. They're not adapting their profession, but they go from an electrician and change their profession to an electrical teacher. The biggest change I've seen in my years in the system is the educational demands that are being put on our trade teachers. That when I started 
they really weren't expected to be proficient in special education. And now they are. They weren't expected to be able to scaffold uh, skills and, and do summative and, uh, and assessments. And now they are. And so it's an educational profession. And this, these courses really provide that. I think that without that, not only will our teachers be less successful, but therefore our students will be less successful. And when teachers, trade teachers get frustrated and leave during the school year, that creates a basically a full year where kids miss out on technical education. Not only do they not have adequate teaching at the beginning, but they have substitutes at the end. And it's very hard to get a substitute welding teacher. Um, so while I know this bill was well-intentioned, I do think while it might slightly improve the recruitment of teachers, it will devastate the retention of teachers. And I think that that's something that we just, that creates far more problems than it solves. So thank you. Hey, thank you, Ed. Um, yeah, look, this is a quandary. Okay, we get it. Um, you know, uh, you've got, um, uh, a dearth of uh, people who are um, going into the trade. That's very important to, um, you know, put the teacher behind the desk because that translates to the number of graduates. We are on the other end looking forward and putting pressure uh, to get those graduates in particularly out of our trade schools, um, all that's going on in our manufacturing industry. Um, so that's the genesis of this particular proposal to have this conversation and, you know, to try to find what creative things that we could do or what it is that, you know, we need to do better. But you do, but you do say that the educational demands that are put upon teachers, um, and it is true that, um, you know, there has been, um, you know, a series of requirements, some more recent than others, um, on teachers. So do you believe that those are appropriate, appropriate um, and, 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 you know, well-placed or what's your opinion? My experience in the system is that it's a pendulum but the pendulum doesn't really swing back and forth. I mean, the, what they call the Overton window keeps shifting. Um, when I started, there were almost no demands on the teachers. When the CAPT came in, that did change the educational demands that suddenly we had trade teachers who had literacy goals as, you know, system-wide. They all had a literacy goal. And so we're asking someone who is a automotive teacher to also be responsible for literacy. Some of that went to my opinion, way too far. Um, that, that we did need to return to more time in the trade, more time learning the skills of the trade. I do feel, however, that as trade teachers identified themselves they, when they put the stress on the second part of that title instead of the first, instruction improved. Um, that they do see themselves now as teachers the same way I saw myself as a teacher or a Spanish teacher sees themselves as a teacher, that it is another, it is a, they teach a subject that they know well. Um, and I think that's been very helpful uh, to our students. And, you know, uh, What's required in the trades has also increased tremendously. Um, you know, you no longer have a son-in-law that can fix your car unless he's a mechanic. Because, you know, I went to get my transmission fluid changed the other day and they said, oh, it's a sealed unit. I said, all right, well, forget that. You know, that's, our kids have to learn those skills. So the level of skill required in the trade itself has also gone up. And so that's a big demand. It's, it's been a big change, but I think, we are getting a better, we're doing a better job of getting that balance back so that we are concentrating on the trade work more. Uh, I do think that that's helped. And I think, especially the Manufacturing Association has been uh, very uh, vocal about that. Um, yeah, uh, I know I'm 
somehow sitting back watching this and sometimes feeling, you know, very um, frustrated. Uh, one last thing I'll ask you about it is, um, so we had some testimony, you know, we have a manufacturing caucus mm -hmm. um, and, and most of which uh, actually, probably all of which the members of our committee are on. And um, the testimony came to us through that um, venue that, you know, the state through the, um, the CARES money or the, the um, ESERT, um, whatever fund, it was one of those funds, um, we um, engaged in the purchase of a technology Chromebooks because of all of the virtual um, mm -hmm. going on, you know, kids not being in the classroom, but that uh, it came back to us that uh, students, particularly in the trade schools, in, in the Botex, were saying that the Chromebooks, the programming and so forth was, you know, not meeting the requirements that were necessary uh, for the work that they needed to do. So it was kind of, a, you know, a, a lost um, investment, if you will. Do you have a comment on that? Yes. The issue with the Chromebooks are in the computer based trades, information systems technology, for example, some of the graphics, the architectural drafting, that the Chromebooks didn't really have the capacity to handle the programs. Then you go to the other trades and I'm sorry, you can't learn how to do auto body repair over a computer. Like that's not happening. Uh, that's a hands-on trade and you learn that from experience, you learn it from muscle memory. Um, so the trades have been really affected by COVID. We are working with the administration to come up with programs, uh, we being the union, uh, to come up with programs in which our teachers can provide skill remediation, especially for seniors who are leaving so that they will have, um, they will have more of the skills that they need to be successful in their first year on a job. Um, I know that when we talk to uh, people who hire our students, one of the things that they like is not only do they have the work ethic um, and they've committed to the trade, but they have a skill level that's simply higher than you just get off the street, of course, uh, because they've spent really the equivalent of two full school years doing it. Um, but COVID has absolutely been a problem. Um, the, the Chromebooks were necessary, but they were, yeah, I mean, it was in, we discovered as we did it that like you couldn't run the programs that the seniors needed in the, in the technical trades, in the computer based trades. Uh, okay, th thanks Ed, but based upon that, what's the remedy? So we're, we're in discussions with running summer classes that are, um, that will be uh, offered to help with the skill remediation. We did some talk about working with the administration to bring in, uh, to have the, some of the seniors from last year return if there's room in the trades for them to get the skill-based work, you know, back in the trade during the school year, um, you know, and, and making contractual allowances for that to happen, that, that are still allow kids to be safe. Uh, it's a conversation that thankfully with the vaccine coming now seems to be picking up steam. Um, but it is something that we're considering because we do want, it means something to an employer when you come out of a, of a tech school and we want that to continue. Like that's, that's why we exist. That's our mission. Okay. Um, and then lastly, the manufacturing, um, a caucus uh, advocates who came before us pointed out the fact that, um, well, first of all, two things. Um, some time ago, there was a proposal to stand up the Votex independently of SDE um, because of the nature of what they do um, and, and quite frankly, you know, their specialties. And then secondly, that in fact, there has not been um, uh, bonding um, initiatives for, and I can't remember whatever the period of time was, I don't know, I want to off the top of my head say two decades um, as a um, program for Votex as opposed to what has been for the traditional LEAs. Well, Comments. We, 
we always, we are always leery. Uh, and again, I'm speaking for the SVFT, but I think I could speak for the, uh, the system as a whole. We're always leery of, of local school districts that want to take what we do and say, oh yeah, we can replicate that because they simply can't. Um, they don't have the infrastructure in place with trade backgrounds and trade, trade syllabuses and trade experts. And they just don't have the time. Um, when I talk to people throughout the country who teach technical education and they realize that they have our, we have our kids for seven hours a day in the trade for half the year, that they can't under, like that is a miracle to them. And our kids have so much more hands-on experience. In terms of the, and, and I would agree, I do get frustrated. In fact, I often write testimony about the funding of local school programs when we don't, when we don't adequately fund our own. Uh, you know, the state's taking money out of our pocket and putting it in another pocket so people could do it less well. Uh, I also believe strongly that we need to expand the use of our school into evening programs and, and that kind of thing. And I'm, I'm working with a bunch of groups to do that. Um, in terms of the moving us out of the State Department of Education, um, that is something that has been in process for a very long time, about five years now, I think. Um, we supported it at the time and uh, we still support it. My understanding is that the current, the governor's budget would push that back an extra year, uh, which would make it happen not next year, but the year after. I do think there is a value in that. Um, I, don't, I don't particularly believe that the relationship between the State Department of Education and the system is always, uh, is always as, as efficient as it should be. Um, that, and, and much of that depends on, frankly, on the commissioner. Obviously, Dr. Cardona was a graduate of our system. He kind of got it. Um, so that was fine. In, in other cases, it's been less fine. Uh, okay, thanks, Ed. Um, and lastly, so going forward, because we know that there is more uh, federal stimulus money coming specifically to education, um, is, is there something that you would, um, you know, prescribe with regard to the investment in you know, hardware such as technology. I mean, going forward to say, look, this is what we need as opposed to this cookie cutter, um, uh, you know, uh, purchase of technology because clearly there are areas um, that are specialty areas. Yeah. I, I would I would leave that up to the expertise of the consultants, uh, our trade consultants, um, especially in the, in, the, in the production trades, uh, Patsy Carliglio and, and Brett McCartney, both of whom uh, are former members of ours and terrific educators in their own right. Um, you know, I would leave that. I, I do think expanding programs that would allow us to address the skill deficiency in the trades is necessary. Um, it's probably necessary across the board in every school district, but for us, you know, I mean, I remember the masonry teacher calling me in late, like early April last year and said, Ed, I finished all my theory work and none of the kids have bricks at home. What am I supposed to do? And there was nothing to do. Like, so he reviewed and he did some demonstrations and he showed YouTube videos. He did everything he could but those are seven hour school days. Like that's really hard to fill seven hours with demonstrations where in reality, when our teachers are at their best is when they're walking around and working with the kids who are doing it by hand. Like that's that kind of teaching is, um, as I wrote in my written testimony, when you go to an offsite production site where they're building their own home and you see the electrical teacher with kids on three different floors all over the place and they're walking around and trying to make sure that the kids are safe and showing working on their skills and it's like that kind of teaching is so impressive and as an English teacher it's just terrifying like I just I always had the kids in front of me they had pens nothing bad was going to happen 
Um, and so it's, it's some of the most impressive education I've ever seen. But that just didn't, that hasn't happened since last February, for since last, you know, March 13th of last year. Yeah, thanks, Ed. I don't mean to monopolize this conversation. Um, uh, Representative Leepor. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thanks, Ed, for your comments. And I appreciate that you heard the conversation a little bit earlier. I mm -hmm. uh, worked with SDE and had the privilege to witness the incredible work that the technical high school system says for kids. And there really is nothing else like it. I'm constantly informing people, especially down in my neck of the woods who aren't always as informed about the great work you do. Um, how life-changing it is for over 10,000 students every every year. And you said something that really um, caught my attention, which is that our technical professionals, when they come to teach, are changing careers. And one of the things I think that we are approaching with a high degree of urgency is can we get some of those professionals to not have to change careers and lend their expertise to these kids so that we can be getting more students through your excellent program and not in any way um, throwing professionals into a classroom where they feel um, unprepared and unsupported. That is not at all the objective of this proposal. Mm -hmm. It is more to give more children access to the incredible work that you all do. So, we, uh, through AFD Connecticut, the president of AFD Connecticut's Jan Hockadel. She was my predecessor as the president of the SVFT. She comes out of tech schools. And she had developed an apprentice program where people could come in, they would work at a couple of different schools and maybe not work full days, but be able, like maybe work till noon and be able to develop their abilities and to frankly see if they liked it. Like that's, you know, that's an issue. And, um, you know, all of our success stories are people who got into it and said, oh, I love this work. Not everybody loves it. Um, but the problem, and I know you'll be shocked, was funding. Um, it's just hard to fund those programs. So, you know, I, I, I do think that, I mean, many of our trade teachers continue to work in the summer uh, you know, I'm telling you the licensed trades, especially, but our hairdressers as well. Our, our health tech teachers often do nursing on the weekends, um, in part because they did take a pay cut and supplementing their income, and in part because what's happening in the field changes, and if you don't go into the field, you don't know that. So, I mean, we had a huge issue going back 15 years when all our machinists were very good on the Bridgeport machines, but nobody had ever run a CNC machine before because why would they? They left, they left the trade 20 years ago. And so all of that is, is something we have to work on. Um, the other thing, since you didn't really bring it up, but I'll mention it. One of the things we could do in the licensed trades is right now we require an E1 or a P1 or an S1 um, license to become an instructor. And there's no real reason for that. The department head needs those because they have to pull permits to do work. But if we were allowed to have an E2 license or a P2 license, which is if you work at a two man plumbing company, one of them has a P1 and one has a P2, like that's the way it is, one two person plumbing group. Um, that would allow people to come in both a little younger and um, at a less, less steep cost in pay. This is something that we have been bringing up. I don't know, I've been an officer for 14 years now. It's like, we bring it up every year. And by the time we get a superintendent to the point where yes, we're gonna do that, that person leaves and somebody else comes in. So we just start all over again. Um, the average length of stay for our, our superintendents is about three and a half years. So, um, but I think that that's a way that we can practic do a practical job of getting more people involved, more people active. And, um, and then, you know, when they, then they can get their license in the same way they get their college classes. And we can provide, frankly, we can provide tuition reimbursement for that. So it would be cheaper. 
this is very helpful. And I find this level of detail extremely important in making sure whatever we do is going to effectively achieve the outcome, which is to get more kids, your excellent training and not more kids in front of teachers who feel unsupported and unprepared to do the job. So I want to respect the time of the committee and maybe we can connect about this um, afterward. Well, yes, I, I would be happy to do that. Um, we also, uh, I know have a, through AFT Connecticut, have a meeting scheduled with you on Wednesday. So we will be able to do a talk then. Um, That's wonderful. Because we do have, I have ideas after, that I've picked up over 36 years and say, okay, this will be helpful. And I, I do think we're cognizant of the issues we have and the problems we have. Solving those from the outside seems is nearly impossible. Um, solving them from the inside is nearly impossible too, but at least you have, you know, you have an idea. Um, so I would, I look forward to that conversation because it's a great system and uh, we need to do a bit, we need to nurture it. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Thank you. Chair, for yeah. the introduction. Thank you. Um, uh, very instructive. Um, don't forget the clock is ticking. So in your conversations to get back to us um, and see other hands raised. Uh, thanks, Ed. And we're going to go to Julia Wilcox, please. Julia. There you are. Hello. You've got the floor, Madam. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Senator Hartley, um, Representative Simmons, Senator Martin, Representative Buckby, and distinguished members of the Commerce Committee. My name is Julia Wilcox, and I'm manager of uh, public policy and advocacy for the Connecticut Community Nonprofit Alliance. The Alliance is the statewide advocacy organization representing the nonprofit sector. Community nonprofits provide essential services to over half a million individuals and families each year in Connecticut and employ 14% of Connecticut's workforce, improving the quality of life in communities across Connecticut. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. The Alliance urges you to support HB 6119 and act concerning arts, culture, and tourism funding. The legislation seeks to strengthen the arts, culture, and tourism sector in Connecticut by, direct, by directing additional funding into the tourism fund, renaming the fund to better represent the full scope of the sector and ensuring more equitable funding among arts, culture and tourism initiatives. Um, and you've certainly heard a great deal of very compelling testimony this afternoon. Um, and hopefully you have my written testimony um, before you. Um, so I will be brief. Um, I'd like to underscore just a few of the key points if I may. Um, as you've heard throughout the day, um, the creative economy is essential to Connecticut. And just a few of those primary points that I'd like to um, just underscore once again are the $9.3 billion generated annually in Connecticut by the creative economy, 9,000 creative workers in Connecticut, or I'm sorry, 59,000 creative workers in Connecticut, and the data that confirms that return on investment for the creative community um, within the nonprofit sector is $7 for every $1 invested. Um, you've also heard quite a few examples in terms of the ways that the pandemic has devastated Connecticut's um, creative economy. And again, just a few points of note, um, 2.4 billion lost revenue for the creative economy businesses and 33,000 creative workers in Connecticut who are now unemployed due to the COVID-19 um, COVID crisis. Arts, cultural, and historic preservation programs that enrich our communities are provided um, by hundreds of nonprofit organizations in Connecticut. Um, it's important to note that the impact of the, of the pandemic for this population is exacerbated when combined with years of underfunding and ongoing uncertainty regarding the potential for recovery. Is there anything with me? I think someone's got a mute here. Go ahead, Julia. So sure, so in closing, the Alliance supports all aspects of the legislation um, as proposed, um, which is in line with um, the legislative priorities of the Connecticut Nonprofit Alliance, um, as you've heard the Connecticut Arts Alliance and um, our collective statewide partners throughout. Um, and rather re than review each of the items within the bill, um, I would respectfully um, recommend that you please refer to page two of my written testimony and the additional, um, uh, additional attached um, 
resource documents that include the US Bureau of Economic Analysis on which um, a great deal of this data is based. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. And um, we just, in closing, I'd like to say that the bill provides policymakers with a roadmap opportunity to support the creative community, community which has suffered so greatly to continue to contribute to the state in a meaningful and sustainable way. And thank you again so much. Uh, Julia, Sorry, Julia, hanging in there with us um, and also for your fact-based research testimony, which is um, on file with us. Um, thank you and, and for the work that you do. Um, uh, okay, we're gonna move on to David uh, Greco. Um, is David with us? Uh, hello, David. Hi, you're on. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Senator Harley and the Commerce Committee for your time today. Um, I am Dave Greco. I'm the co-founder and the director of Arte Inc., a nonprofit based in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, and I'm here in support of House Bill 6119. Um, and before, uh, I'm here to talk about my organization uh, but before I do that, um, I'm a, in a unique situation because I spent 17 years working in the hotel industry in the state as a regional director of sales and marketing. Um, I worked for five years for one of the tourism districts um, and then for 17 years um, with Arte Inc. that I co-founded. And I've always said that the state has underfunded um, tourism and arts in the state. And when we would travel as a hotel business or as a, uh, the Convention Visitors Bureau, to large conventions like um, Meeting Planners International, the Association of um, um, the American Association of um, uh, um, Meeting Planners and uh, powwow with tour operators. I was always um, kind of embarrassed about what the state was spending and what these other organizations or these other cities and states were spending on tourism to attract meeting planners, to attract tour operators. Um, and I believe that this bill would not only provide crucial funding for the hard hits art sector, but would create a long-term sustained funding. And the bill would restore funding back to levels prior to the recession. Um, and it would also deplete the tourism fund, which I think is really important. The funding is especially important for small organizations like Arte, uh, because we provide free enrichment and education programs for underserved minority youth urban youth who do not have the same exposure as their suburban peers. Um, we have served thousands of youth since 2004 with multiple after school programs. Um, we've pivoted everything to, to virtual at this point. Uh, we have 24 after school programs running. We have a very successful Saturday Arts Academy running. We had 62 students logged on this past Saturday. Uh, we do workshops, cultural events, college bound road trips, college readiness programs. And we've awarded over $93,000 in scholarships. Um, we employ 24 part-time employees and 12 student employees. And obviously COVID has greatly impacted um, our youth and their social emotional well-being is in jeopardy right now. The isolation and lack of exposure is gonna have long-term effects on our students. And we've already seen that uh, and transpire in them. Um, arts programs can increase academic achievement, decrease involvement in delinquent behavior, improve youth attitudes about themselves in the future. And this bill and this additional funding would help organizations like ours uh, reach more at-risk youth and help them overcome the negative, uh, the negative effects of the pandemic and cultivate positive role models, not only now, but in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, David, um, and for the work that you do, because uh, in addition to you know, being in the arts, um, universe, you have also focused um, on an underserved population, which um, is so many times does not have exposure to arts. Um, so thank you for that incredible work that you've done and also for hanging in here to testify. I see no hands raised, sir. So I'm gonna thank you um, for uh, being with us today. Thanks so much, uh, Dave. Steve Cohen, uh, Mystic Aquarium, Steve, hello. Okay, don't see Steve. So moving on, I do see Christopher Tracy, right? Okay. Oh, sorry, Madam Chair, Steve is here. Just give him a moment. Yeah, oh. I'm, I'm just having trouble. Uh... Hi, Steve, I don't see you. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> sorry. 
Senator Hartley, Representative Simmons, members of the committee, uh, thank you for uh, taking the time this afternoon. I'm uh, testifying on uh, Bill 6119 and uh, together with Beardsley Zoo and the Maritime Aquarium, we've submitted testimony on the, supporting the bill. Uh, just a couple of points in addition to what others have said uh, today, uh, because I think a lot, most uh, people who testified in favor of this really covered the return on investment, the uh, importance of this to arts organizations and tour tourism organizations uh, and supporting the, uh, the tourism and the arts economy. But with regard to that, I would just suggest that we think of this as an investment in the state and in the state's overall economy. The strength of our marketing uh, for tourism, for the arts, for culture, really has an impact on the overall uh, economy. It has an impact on how investors look at Connecticut. It has an impact on how uh, the, the, the general public looks at it, looks at the state uh, and so forth. So it's, it's most definitely an investment with a very high return on investment return on investment and a lot of residual uh, effect. Um, the second thing I wanna just mention is there has to be a baseline for, for funding tourism and the arts and cultures. Uh, this is a great formula. A lot of people have commented today on the, the fact that there's consensus around uh, the formula that is proposed, but there has to be a baseline. Uh, otherwise, you know, we get into a situation like we are in with the pandemic, uh, when we need funding uh, most critically in, in, under this formula, unless there's a baseline, if there's any kind of situation like this, uh, we're gonna be left high and dry on an important investment for the state. Um, one of the key things is that uh, funding the tourism budget in the state uh, is really important to all of these institutions with regard to our two most immediate markets, Boston and New York. These are the most expensive media markets in the country. And it is difficult, if not impossible, for even the largest institutions like ours, Mystic Aquarium, to pay for media and advertising in these markets. One of the things we've been very successful with at the state level over the last few years is to beef up, to use the resources that were available at the state level to invest in the New York market. And we've seen tremendous return uh, on investment in, in that market uh, as a result of, of the uh, uh, dollars that were spent on advertising. And then one final point I wanna make um, with regard to uh, comments about matching grants, uh, certainly at the local level, this has worked very well uh, in the Mystic area uh, where uh, organizations have come together and matched state funding. But at the state level, we need a strong centralized state marketing effort. Connecticut is too small uh, not to have a centralized marketing effort that's robust. And we are competing against uh, every other state in the country, but certainly we're competing against Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New York State, and others that are investing far more heavily in centralized marketing than Connecticut is. So thank you very much for your time today. That, thank you very much, um, Steve. Um, and yes, we are hearing this message from yourself and um, other members um, in, your, uh, in your sector. Uh, are there any questions? I do not see any. Um, thank you, Steve. Um, we're going to, sorry, uh, Chris, yes, uh, Steve, and now on to uh, Christopher Tracy. Thank you. Christopher. Are Good you afternoon, with Madam Chair, uh, Senator Hartley and Representative Simmons and uh, uh, also Representatives Thomas and uh, Lanou and uh, Leeper and those who are there. And of course, ranking members Buckby and uh, Martin and uh, the honorable members of the Commerce Committee. I'm Christopher Tracy of Guilford. I'm here in strong support of HB 6119. Uh, and uh, I'll forego a reading of the testimony that you have along with the other hundred plus um, and knowing that there's 20 more people behind me waiting to speak. Um, but I'll cut to uh, some of the, the high points, I guess. I'm a native nutmegger born under Governor Rubikoff 60 years ago. Uh, I, my first recollections are of uh, going to the Jorgensen and seeing my brother 
um, play Winthrop. He went on to co-found Palabalas Dance Theater, which is based in Washington. Um, my eldest sister coming back from seeing uh, Comedy of Errors at the American Festival Shakespeare and uh, winding up working with Rex Everhart uh, later as our mentor when we started an equity theater down in Greenwich. Uh, he had played uh, the Dromeos in that. Um, the rich history of uh, the arts in Connecticut goes back 150 years, certainly includes um, uh, many of the organizations, obviously, that we've that we've heard from, but um, I just want to guess speak on behalf of, uh, as an audience member, as a an, a student for culture, as a tourist, uh, and also as a, a former and occasional performer, producer, uh, creator of jobs, and tenure member of economic development here in in Guilford. I get the ROI, I get all the points people have made up until now. And I, I just want to echo what Ms. Plock said, arts and culture mean business. You just heard it from uh, one of the most powerful um, uh, tourism sectors in the, in the state down Southeast. So just taking it through, I gave you a history in my letter, but um, I, I can't even uh, thumbnail all the different things that brought me back after moving upstate New York with my father who couldn't raise five kids as a professor at UConn um, and then going to Penn State and meeting my bride in Manhattan. Um, coming back here as newlyweds and immediately starting a theater company and an educational platform uh, that went equity that brought in Rex Everhart uh, right out of his rags performance to recreate his Tony uh, Award nominated uh, role in, in working. The cultural resources in this state, uh, my, my, my son was backstage in performing Nutcracker with uh, the New Haven Ballet and signed his name next to my brother's where he had performed 40 years before with the Lovelace. Um, obviously in that Schubert theater where uh, Oklahoma uh, tried out, you all know what it means to have what we have in this state, you've all enjoyed it. Um, so all I can tell you as the husband of a playwright whose work has been performed at the Stanford Center for the Arts at the Lyric Hall in um, New Haven at the Andrews Theater where John Jory started the Long Wharf uh, over in Clinton, as Senator Cohen's district. Um, as the father of a young boy who, as I said, uh, danced with Noble Barker, the late Noble Barker in the New Haven Ballet. Um, worked up in Hartford at the Trinity uh, location where uh, uh, Cobblestone Corridor was filmed um, and now is going to Sarah Lawrence and filmed a student film down in Westbrook. Um, I, I just, I have to say the last year of virtual shutdown left our arts and humanities struggling to survive and this return of their status as a recognized and funded component in tourism, uh, alongside tourism, is critical to their survival. So I implore you to vote in support of HB 6119 and send it on to the next committee as a step toward restoring our state's glorious legacy, going back to James and Eugene O'Neill, William Gillette and Christopher Plummer, Mark Twain and Hal Holbrook, who until recently visited his second wife in North Branford regularly. Um, the countless actors, dancers, singers, designers, directors, writers, painters, sculptors, producers, and audiences who you've heard from and will hear from, and who come here in Connecticut and see their work, which made up such a significant part of our economy and an even greater portion of our culture for which we are so righteously proud. So I thank you all. I thank uh, uh, committee clerk, Ginger Rodriguez for facilitating this and representative Parker of the 101st for writing it. And, uh, and as again, to echo Ms. Plock, Arts and culture mean business. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Christopher, uh, and also for sharing your your deep um, passion and lifelong experience um, in, in the arts. Um, appreciate you hanging in there with us today, sir. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to Thomas Lagerman uh, Wadsworth. Are you here? Oh, there you are. Hi, Thomas. Yes, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you so much. My name is Tom Lohman, and I serve as the director and CEO of the Wadsworth Athenaeum, and I'm speaking today in support of HB 6119 mm. as well. Um, there is no question that our state is exceptional for the quality, diversity, and strength of its cultural sector. 
We have been at the forefront of creating rich and meaningful experiences with the arts for the public benefit for two centuries. And the world has come to know and appreciate that tradition. Our community has come to expect that excellence from us. As a survey conducted in Hartford two summers ago revealed, culture is the top asset of our capital city. And as many of you have heard me say in testifying elsewhere at the Capitol, I'm just celebrating my fifth month of my fifth anniversary as director of America's oldest public art museum, the Wadsworth. Our institution, this institution belongs to the public trust. Our institutions belong to you and they are an inheritance in which we can all be proud. Our founder, Daniel Wadsworth actually tore down his family homestead at this crossroads here in Hartford in 1842 in order to build at his own expense and for the enjoyment of all, a place for art on Main Street, America's first public art museum. And to this day, we are an institution fully committed to converting private funding into public good. There is no question about the role that our institutions play in the lives of, th of the thousands who come to visit and transit through our state. Each year, about 18% of all who visit the Wadsworth come from out of state. An additional 30% come from communities across our state well beyond Hartford County. They grab lunch, as I did today, at El Pollo Guapo on Front Street, or they go to Max's downtown. Some stay at the weekend at the Goodwin or down at the Madison Beach Hotel. They introduce their children to core STEM concepts at the Connecticut Science Center and to American culture by way of visiting Hamilton at the Bushnell or Oklahoma at Goodspeed. They continue on to discover justice through the Amistad trial story at the old state house down the street from here or over at the Stowe Center. Others come to the Wadsworth having first been drawn to town by the chance of experiencing the home of Mark Twain or learned about us at one of our 22 colleague institutions of the Connecticut Art Trail, which is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. The Connecticut Art Trail's members are places great and small like Weir Farm out in Wilton, the Aldridge and Ridgefield, Hillstead in my hometown now, Farmington, the Lyman Allen down in New London, the Yale University Art Gallery in New Haven, the Norwalk Center for Contemporary Printmaking, and so on. <clears throat> Our sector's self-funded regional tourism efforts need more octane, frankly, and would benefit from the reactivation of the state's partnership through a robust regional tourism authority approach, as Senator Formica spoke to this morning. There is no question that a virtuous cycle of benefits flow from the purposeful deployment of the room tax to raise the state's tourism profile and to support arts and culture. The combination worked effectively up in Massachusetts where I used to work at the Clark Art Institute in the Berkshires and where I served as president of the Williamstown Chamber of Commerce. It has worked famously in Rhode Island as my colleague Peter Roos has attested to personally earlier in this hearing. It works nationally where there is a strong arts ecosystem and a practical partnership un uniting hospitality tax revenues to institutions of cultural relevance and impact. And it has begun working here in Connecticut. While the bed tax funds have not flowed directly to the Wadsworth, they have been aiding my colleagues in the overall arts ecosystem, and they could do more, as was the finding of the 2018 Blue Ribbon Commission on Tourism. The multiplier effect of reinvesting the bed tax into tourism and arts and culture is proven. The efficacy of the 60-40 ratio between tourism and arts and culture appears to be sound. And so I urge you, please consider HB 6119 and its practical, proven, and prudent approach. Pre-COVID, we saw the first fruits of this more conscientious way of developing and perpetuating a livelier tourist and arts and culture economy. During COVID, we've kept it together as we prepared for the future. You know, we've been partially open here at the Wadsworth now since September 5th, and we're drawing significant visitation, increasingly so since the holiday, in those same proportions of 18 out of 18% out of state from those uh, states with which we have a reciprocal travel agreement, and about 30% from, from uh, constituents outside of Hartford County. When I think about it, what better time than now as we reopen our great state and emerge from this global crisis 
to install the legislative structures that have the best chance of making a difference. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Tom, um, and for your well-stated testimony. I'm assuming you've given it to us in writing, have you? No, but I'm happy to send what I just said in. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Thanks for being with us. Um, okay. Seeing no hands raised, um, I'm going to move on to Kevin Dodd. I do see Kevin. Hi, Kevin, you've got the floor. Thank you very much. I appreciate being here. My name is Kevin Dodd. I am the president and CEO of the Essex Steam Train and Riverboat and Lady Catherine Cruises, as well as the vice president of the Connecticut Tourism Coalition. In the interest of time, I'm going to dispense with pleasantries. Um, I am here in support of House Bill 6119, funding arts, culture, and tourism in Connecticut. One of the, the main ideas I want to convey here is that tourism is an overarching umbrella in Connecticut. It embraces hospitality, entertainment, restaurants, amusement, lodging, very, very much every part of everyone's life. Tourism is actually a quality of life issue that affects employers. It affects schools, attracting new employees, new industries, new students. It's a part and a key to their success as well as our success. Our concern is, is that the state is going to have to make a significant investment for us to remain and be competitive with other states surrounding us. One of the most significant increases was the state of Rhode Island, who went from a $750,000 tourism budget to more than $5.5 million in budget. So in order for us to be successful, we need Connecticut to advertise outside of the state to make our state visible like a national brand beyond our borders. Another issue I wanted to address here is that there's a misconception that tourism is a lot of low paying jobs within the state. And that's not true. Just to give you a couple of examples, the Essex Steam Train and Riverboat has many highly specialized mechanics who are working on restoring and maintaining 100 year old equipment, steam train, diesels, the seaport has specialized trade skills. The aquariums have hugely skilled people handling the animals and research. These are a lot of very high dollar positions. They're hard to fill positions. Once we lose this basic technology and these abilities, it's going to make it very hard for us to restart once the pandemic is over. Right now, as an industry, people are looking and planning activities for the future. We've seen huge decreases in our traffic here at the railroad alone. We've seen 79% decrease year over year in our income. The expenses were not proportionate. Our insurance, our other experience, costs and expenses have remained fairly steady. Overall, my point here is, is that without the state stepping up, helping to revitalize these important industries, we can't be successful. Tourism in Connecticut was lacking before the pandemic and many venues had stepped up, increased their marketing dollars. As an example, the railroad had more than doubled its marketing budget prior to the pandemic, but with the current economic statuses, we can no longer afford that. We're still financially extremely viable, but we cannot afford the outlay of expenses to market beyond the borders and so forth. And we need these out of state dollars because we've saturated the dollars and super saturated the marketing and advertising within the state. So we are heavily in support of bringing these dollars in to make sure that Connecticut has a strong tourism marketing budget going forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, um, Kevin, um, and, and laying it out. And it is true as your, um, you know, front door receipts have totally diminished and flatlined, your expenses continue. Um, so um, we recognize this and that's really what a lot of the relief has been about, but standing this up going forward is, is crucial. Thanks um, for hanging in there with us. And I see no hands raised. I'm going to move on um, to uh, Eric Dil Dilner. Eric. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Com Commerce Committee. Um, I'm taking uh, the lead from Senator Maroney that uh, it's okay to be in a car during this little moment here. 
Uh, thank you for, for indulging me. I'm just outside of an ice skating rink. Um, my name is Eric Dillner, and I'm the CEO of the Shoreline Arts Alliance, and I sit on the board of the Connecticut Nonprofit Alliance, and I live in Madison, Connecticut. I'm also the founder and chair of the task force to reopen Connecticut arts venues through science-based safety in conjunction with the Yale School of Public Health. I'm submitting my testimony on behalf of Shoreline Arts Alliance and the Reopening Connecticut Arts Venues Task Force. We fully support HB 66119 and respectfully request that it be moved forward in the legislative process. For 40 years, Shoreline Arts Alliance has served the people of Connecticut as their arts council, believing that the arts are for everyone. Our mission of is to transform lives through the arts. We impact all ages, all social and economic backgrounds. We, in the last five years, have leveraged over $6 million in college scholarships for Connecticut students. These students in turn have contributed to the Connecticut economy and recently one of these scholarship winners has returned to Connecticut and opened their own photography and videography business. But when COVID-19 struck our state, we knew we had to find a way to help the arts community survive. In March, Shoreline Arts Alliance partnered with Yale School of Public Health and we created the task force reopening Connecticut arts venues through science-based safety. And we wanted to do this free. We did not want to charge any of the arts organizations uh, anymore uh, to burden them in this current time. Our goal is to cl offer clarity, practical scientific advice and address misinformation. We offer employers and institutions information on how best to build a plan with and for their audience, visitors, staff, artists, and students. We help them understand the essential elements needed for their plan and how this will best protect themselves and their employees and of course their audience. To date, our webinars have reached over, you ready for this, 11,000 arts leaders in over 15 states and four countries. We've conducted numerous Connecticut site visits, virtual site visits and consultations, again, all free of charge. We have held site visits in many of our historic landmarks, including a lot of the folks who've spoken today, Mark Twain House, New Haven Museum, Connecticut College Ar Arboretum, the historic Florence Griswold Museum. We've been to the New London waterfront stages, various dance companies across the state, New Haven Symphony, as we heard from today, uh, outdoor venues producing comedy and live music events, and of course, teaching and community impact organizations such as the Arts Collective in Hartford. All this to ensure success and long-term viability for cultural institutions, uh, the arts sector as a whole, and the tourism industry collectively. Such a project requires resources today and for years to come. Madam Chair, members of the Commerce Committee and those on this call, if you know of an organization or venue in your district that perhaps needs our help in looking through the lens of science for their reopening or to stay open in a healthy and ha happy way, please reach out to me and Shoreline Arts Alliance. Recovery for the arts, culture, and tourism for our state is imperative. As all of our state citizens are suffering from not only financial challenges, but perhaps more importantly, stress on their mental health and well-being, we urge you to join us in helping us to ensure our Connecticut arts, culture, and heritage community survive and thrive by supporting 6119. Thank you again so much for your time. Thank you. Um, th thank you very much, um, Eric, and um, for, you know, the um, uh, amazing um, operation that you have stood up and also the reach of, of the uh, Shoreline Arts. I do not see any questions, Eric. Uh, thank you for being with us. Um, I'd like to now uh, you. invite, John, th you bet, Eric, John Murphy. You have the floor, sir. Hi, John. Oh, I think you're muted still, sir. Okay. Better? Go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon, Senator Hartley, Representative Simmons, Ranking Members Buckby, Martin, and members of the Commerce Committee. My name is John Murphy, and on behalf of the United Auto Workers Region 9A, I am testifying in opposition to HB 5150, an act establishing a state hiring program for recent college graduates. This bill is a blatant attempt at union busting. Recent college graduates would be enticed to give up collective bargaining rights for five years in exchange for participating in a forced mandatory student loan repayment program with a 3% lump sum bonus 
of the employee's regular annual, annual salary upon every year of completed service. In exchange for their indentured servitude after five years, they will be given preferential treatment in hiring into a real estate job. That means that these recent college graduates will have no right to due process in their workplace because they will be considered employees at will. The bill will establish a caste system within state employment. Assuming that these workers with no union rights will be working side by side with regular state employees, there will be resentment among coworkers. This new lower class of workers can be disciplined or fired with no recourse and will see real estate workers having due process in the same exact circumstances. There's one positive concept in this bill. Instead of creating a lesser class of workers, new hires could be enrolled in a voluntary student loan program to allow them to withhold an amount of salary to be paid directly to the employee's student loan servicer. In direct opposition to another concept of this bill, workers enrolled in the student loan program should be allowed to deduct from income on state income tax returns the portion of student loan interest paid by each worker. We hear leaders from all work, walks of life call for unity in our communities, our state, and our nation. This bill does nothing but create disunity, discord, and disrespect for state employees. Please vote against House Bill 5150. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, um, for your um, pointed um, testimony. Uh, I do not see any hands raised. Um, and so, uh, I, I thank you for hanging in there with us. Um, thank you for your stamina. <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to move, move on to uh, Ashley Zane. Uh, you've got the Can floor. Ashley, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Chairs Hartley and Simmons, Ranking Members Buckby and Martin. My name is Ashley Zane. I'm a Government Affairs Associate with the Connecticut Business and Industry Association. We represent thousands of businesses across the state, both large and small, and we pretty much cover every sector um, of the economy through our membership. I've submitted a bunch of bills and I'm just gonna touch on a few of them today and I have submitted written testimony for you. Uh, before session, CBIA set a policy priority agenda through our Rebuild Connecticut campaign, focusing on issues including workforce development, small business relief, and streamlining services using technology. So in terms of business relief, CBIA really supports uh, SB 711. We in particular support the um, provision that would prevent their experience rating from going up due to layoffs of COVID. A lot of our businesses were deemed non-essential during this time period. So it would be great not to be penalized for things that were out of their control. Um, we also support exempting PPE from the sales and use tax. Ideally, we would love to see that made permanent and then also expanded to all safety apparel. Um, we also support HB 5759. Um, the immediate nature of executive orders is challenging for a lot of businesses as they try to comply, prepare, educate their staff, and then plan for the future. It can be a big burden and many of our smaller businesses, they wear multiple hats. So trying to comply with everything can be a lot. In terms of streamlining solutions and using technology, we support 5174. Um, we would really love this bill to work in partnership with the governor's efforts. The new portal that he put up is a great start in simplifying the process and being a one-stop shop. In terms of workforce development, we do support HB 5150. We appreciate the intention of this committee trying to grapple with the silver tsunami coming down the line and refilling our workforce to ensure state services can be delivered. Um, we do have some concerns like many on here, um, but the next bill we really support is 5612. The industry professionals can provide so much knowledge to our students and certification requirements can be seen as a barrier. You know, we're providing so many different alternative pathways for our students and creating alternative pathways for our teachers would be great. Um, we do request, however, that the committee do take a look at the data and the usage from the State Department of Education regarding the current fast track program for trade professionals. If we can simply improve upon what's already existing versus recreate the wheel, I feel like that would serve so many more trade professionals and students more. And then lastly, we do support 5215, which would establish a grant program for certain research uh, engaged in STEM. As you know, New Haven has become a bioscience hub. And I think with the pandemic, we've also seen the need for the Pfizer's of the world. 
Um, we also have another company that um, started in Brantford with only 15 employees and is now uh, 1,500 in Stanford. So we should really be recruiting those businesses and letting them know that we're open for business. Um, so with that, I would just like to thank the committee for raising a lot of these bills that are in line with the business community, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ashley. Um, thanks for hanging in there with us. Um, so I, I just have one, and that is with regard to your comment um, uh, about the fast track um, for trade, the uh, program for trade professionals. So um, in view of that, are you saying you think we're doing uh, all that we can in terms of um, bringing trade professionals and getting them uh, seated in, in our classrooms? I definitely think that there's more that could be done. Um, CBIA, we've heard from our workforce the need for new employees who are skilled and who are trained. So anything that can be done to remove barriers but still ensure the quality of our students and what they're learning, we would greatly appreciate. Um, we would love to see some of the requirements removed to kind of ease in or maybe extend the time period for which they have to complete these requirements. Um, but there's always more that can be done, I think. Okay, but you talked specifically about the fast track program? It's, well, the fast track in terms of, um, you don't have to go all the way through um, your teaching program through an institution. Um, so I think this would be a great way um, to get more of these professionals in, because I think a lot of them think that they have to go back to school to become a trade professional instructor. So I think we should just look at what's currently um, on the books right now and definitely see where we can improve upon. Okay, and that's what I'm asking. So is there right now a fast track program? Uh, not exact, just the way that has been discussed prior where you have to have six years of experience and then take the courses. Um, I believe it's the nine credits and then the special education requirements as well. Um, so if we can cut some of those and make it a faster track for some of these while still ensuring the quality of education, I think we would, CBIA would be very supportive of that. Okay, so um, not to keep bouncing it back, but Ashley, if you've got specifics on this, then we need to hear them, okay? We would be more than happy to send you information from our um, business entities as well. On this. From your what, please? We would be more than happy to send you information regarding um, what our businesses are asking for and what they would like as well in terms of this. Um, yeah. Okay, um, and, and just to be um, succinct, uh, what we would need is the the one, two, threes, the ABCs. Um, you know, we, we get the anecdotal stuff, but um, we're at the juncture now where we're trying to actually float solutions. Um, th thanks a lot, Ashley. So appreciate you being here with us. And so, uh, Representative Buckby, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ashley, always good to see you pop in and you've been following uh, and guiding a lot with CBIA. We appreciate that. Uh, always good input uh, from the organization. I, I have a question on that as we're talking about 5612. Um, I like the idea. My question really, I guess, is how would you guys feel about expanding what that, uh, as we talked about this in committee a little bit, uh, expanding the definition of trade professional uh, so it can include, be more inclusive of the entire business community? Yeah, I think if we could expand what would be considered a trade professional, especially when it relates to the education of the future workforce, I think CBIA would be very supportive. Excellent. And thanks for sending over the info you have, and thanks for uh, your commitment to doing so in the future. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Representative Buckby. Um, I do not see any other hands raised. Thanks much, Ashley, uh, to you for being with us. Um, like to uh, move you, on. Madam Chair, uh, Representative Lieber has a question. Oh, thank you, uh, Representative Lieber. Just a quick question. In terms of expanding the definition of trade professional, who are you looking to include in that definition? I think we would be open to um, anyone considered a trade. So we already have mechanics, um, plumbing, electricians, welders. So we would 
we can definitely check with our membership and then double check with you um, to see what the interest would be. I think it would mostly depend on the curriculum that the tech programs would like to offer, um, but we're definitely open. Okay. Uh, I, I had only chosen that because I thought it was pretty broad and generic. And I would just be curious if there was an overlap who, with a teacher shortage in whoever you are also looking to waive or reduce any teacher certification requirements. Because I think that was sort of the specific objective of, of what this bill was trying to address. Thank you. Yeah, we, we would be interested in the tech schools that have hands-on skills. So we'd be looking primarily at those um, courses. I believe someone earlier said that it's really hard for a trade professional to come in and then have to teach somebody how to read. So I think we would really just be focusing on the teachers who do the hands-on skills portion. Thank you for that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Lee, for um, seeing no other hands raised. Um, thanks again uh, for being with us, Ashley. Um, we will now uh, move on. Lori Robishoff. Lori? Lori? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Simmons and other members of the Commerce Committee. I, too, am going to pivot us back to HB 611 nine regarding arts, culture, and tourism funding. I am Lori Rabasha and I live and work in Stonington, where I serve as the executive director of La Grua Center, a small nonprofit arts and culture center serving southeastern Connecticut that has been presenting concerts, art exhibitions, and speakers on a wide variety of topics for the last 13 years. We also produce several youth art workshops and a summer music festival, and we can seat about 150 people in our space. I too have submitted written testimony, so I'll whip through a little bit of what I had because you've heard some of this before, but I'd like to give you a quick taste of how small organizations uh, like mine are operating under COVID and why additional funding to arts and culture through the tourism fund is so important to us. We are small, we get small grants, but if there's a bigger pot, we can get more and we can do more. Like everyone else in our sector, when we can't gather together in person, we've pivoted to the vir virtual world whenever we can. And for instance, uh, we have great acoustics in our space. So we're bringing in musicians and we're recording them and we're putting the concerts on YouTube and charging just a modest fee. But this means our expenses have gone up because we have to hire a camera operator and a videographer while our revenue has gone down. As you know, you can't really charge as much for a virtual event. And we continue to offer speakers and panel discussions, guess what, on the Zoom platform. And the same premise holds as to how much we can charge. So now we get to sort of compete with Netflix and deal with Zoom fatigue. <laughs> um, our art exhibitions have some limited hours under the state's museum guidelines. So we are partially open in that sense um, as well. To give you a sense of our size, our annual operating budget pre-COVID was around $300,000 two full-time staff members. And our biggest hit has been an earned income from subscribers, ticket sales, sponsorships, and rentals to other community groups, as well as contributed income that comes in through our annual fundraising events, which have had to be canceled. Although we received a PPP loan, the staff still took a salary reduction um, after it was forgiven. The hit to these very same income streams holds true for almost every other nonprofit in our sector in the state. We are in the midst of applying for a second PPP loan. And even though we are a shuttered venue, we are not eligible for that new federal grant because we don't have fixed seats. We stack them and move them. So with the many, with the many challenges facing you in the legislature during the pandemic, I know this whole conversation today has helped you get a greater understanding of why we consider arts and culture organizations to be part of the solution. That preserving these assets, as Wendy Berry talked about, helps the economy by preserving jobs, like mine, <laughs> while ensuring that our state residents still have the quality of life that Connecticut is known for, and Chris Tracy really spoke to that very eloquently, and encouraging tourists to visit and spend their money, as many of our colleagues have talked about. So that's why it makes sense to change the fund's name and increase the percentage of the hotel and lodging tax that goes to our sector. Um, 
it's a terrific example, as discussed before, of where increased investment surely leads to increased returns and it doesn't raise the hotel lodging tax. So we're very grateful to the federal government and Governor Lamont. We got a state grant from the COVID Relief Fund for the Arts that was just huge for us. And we really look forward to the legislature joining those efforts by supporting this bill, again, in increasing uh, the pot of money that goes to our sector. Thank you so much for hanging in there. I admire you all for doing this on Zoom and Senator Hartley for running it on Zoom. Good Lord. Thank you very much. Uh, hey, Lori, um, th thank you so, so much um, uh, for hanging in there with us. But so that's um, new information to me. So I did not realize the SBA shuttered venue fund um, criteria says you have to have fixed seats. That's my understanding. And I think it, you know, by and large, most of the venues do have fixed seats. We happen to not. And I think there are probably some smaller organizations that don't as well. And I, I don't know what the, what, you know, came behind that, but I suspect there is some concern uh, when they created the bill that, uh, you know, the marginal organizations, you know, uh, restaurants uh, who maybe had performers would not be included that they um, I, I don't know uh, the particulars on this but we've looked into it and that's my understanding um, yeah somebody else will correct me but yeah okay oh, all right, right. venue <laughs> that's, oh thank you um, uh, okay appreciate that um, I don't see any other hands raised um, so uh, I think next up is Razu uh, Frank. Are you with us, Razu? No. Um, okay. Uh, Renata uh, Bert Bert Bertoli from Newtown. Are you with us? Oh, I yes. am. Can yes. you hear okay. me? Yeah. So good afternoon and. I do hope I'm last or towards the last ones to go for your all sakes. <laughs> um, thank you, Chair Simmons and Hartley and all the members of Commerce Committee for this opportunity to testify in strong support of House Bill number 5480, which is a bill that would establish a revolving loan program for redevelopment and reuse of existing properties in a way of introduction because nobody here knows me and I know that because I did not know a single person here. Um, I'm a certified land use planner currently employed by town of Newington. And in my experience as a land use planner, I have had the fortune to work in number of communities that are very different in Connecticut. I worked in Coventry, Windsor, Manchester, Meriden, and now Newington. In each one of those communities, I can think of at least one, but in most instances, most instances, many more uh, than just one property, that if there were a state-run program that was providing a gap financing for building fire and safety code compliance, the building would have been saved. There, the, there would be a significant improvement of property conditions that's stimulated by such an incentive. Um, the incentive would prevent it building vacancy, underutilization and blight, increased property values in the surrounding neighborhood and rerouted new development from the environmentally sensitive land. If adopted, the Bill 5480 will ensure that there is an opportunity for gap financing for all the existing properties and buildings which require substantial investments for code compliance. I have included in my written testimony, which I submitted yesterday, um, several hypothetical scenarios in which having this type of incentive would really have helped. If you take time to look this over um, at your leisure, you will notice that these are type of situations that exist in each one of your communities. 
This is not anything that is specific to Newington. Um, I'm talking about conversion of historic homes that become too expensive because even with the historic loan preservation program, the code compliance requirements um, just trigger issues that of expenses that are too high to meet. Um, I'm also mentioning, you know, a situation where perhaps an manufacturing, previously manufacturing building is to be converted into a commercial um, assembly type of use, such as brewery with a taco or a restaurant. This type of adaptive reuse will require significant investment for ADA, for fire suppression, for access egress and energy codes. And a small startup brewer, which is very likely to be the person wanting to go into business like this, will likely not going to be able to afford this type of expense. Um, we have all heard that famous quote that the greenest building is the one already built. As we are waking up to the rapidly unfolding consequences of the looming climate crisis, the building sector as both the cause and the cure is becoming a priority. Building reuse is the most core carbon positive approach, extending benefits of actions taken decades ago while avoiding greenhouse emissions today and into a future. Building reuse ensures preservation of our ridges, our steep slopes, sensitive habitats such as vernal pools and wetlands. Rerouting new development towards existing developed sites eliminates monetary as well as the environmental expense of extending our roads and infrastructure, while at the same time, it ensures the continued investment in our built out neighborhoods. Changing economy in our state, particularly when it comes to retail and office, will require us all to think more creatively about ways to ensure our commercial real estate remains occupied. Here in Newington, that is particularly urgent considering that retail is in fact the predominant land use in a large section of our town alongside the Berlin Turnpike. However, that's not unique to Newington. Many other communities face very similar issues related to changes in retail and office uses. In the near, if not the immediate future, we can anticipate the operational changes moving from traditional to experience-based shopping, requiring large footprint buildings to be condomized into a smaller shop style areas, uh, as well as increasing market pressure to convert retail and office to other types of occupancies. Changes, changes in uh, occupancy, particularly when such change is for different use classification, often trigger expensive building and site modifications to address the, code, the building fire and safety code. And this is particularly problematic when it comes to already economically depressed communities where a return on investment is low. Frequently, this added expense prevents the reuse and reoccupancy of the building. And the last point that I will make is the last thing that we want in any of our communities is to have vacant and underutilized buildings, which uh, expense of the school compliance is another factor that contributes to that. Um, there is a Philadelphia study that had estimated that vacant properties result in an aggregate 3.6 billion in reduced household wealth because of the blighting effect that they have on nearby properties. Further complicating this issue, it's been shown that relationship between sales and vacancies is not linear, but logarithmic. All it takes is a small increase in vacancies to trigger a much bigger drop in house prices. Vacancy affects the quality of life, sense of well-being, and results in increased crime. Vacant and blighted properties are a massive drain on public resources and the communities that tend to be hardest hit are those communities already struggling, the poor and communities of color. In that context, this proposed bill will reduce the inherent inequity of issues of vacancy and blight. And with this, I will thank you for your time and attention to this matter. 
Thank you so much, Renata, Thank for you. your, your testimony, for being with us today and for waiting so patiently to, to testify. We really appreciate it. Um, and I will uh, open it up to any questions uh, from my colleagues. Okay, uh, seeing none, Renata, thank you so much again for, for your testimony. And just want to confirm, you submitted a written testimony as well, right? I, I did, and I will just also mention that I, I know that Connecticut Chapter of American Planner Association, as well as Connecticut Chapter of American Institute of Architect has submitted um, a written testimony in support of this. Terrific, great. Just wanted to make sure we had that on the record. Um, well, thank you so much. We really appreciate your, your time today. Um, thanks so much for all you do for the town of Newington and, and for our state and for being here today. Thank you. Okay, with that, uh, next we have uh, Brian Anderson. Good afternoon, Chairman Simmons. Uh, Chairman Harley and members of the committee, my name is Brian Anderson. I'm a lobbyist for Council 4 AFSCME. Our union is in strong opposition to House Bill 5150, an act establishing a state hiring program for recent college graduates. The top two problems with this bill are that it denies people the basic human right to form a union, and it erodes an already struggling middle class. This bill seems designed to create a low-wage workforce for the state. Otherwise, what is the motivation to deny college graduates the right to unionize? Why will we want the state to exploit recent college graduates? State employees lose layoff protection on July 1st of this year. This bill could be used to lay off current state employees and allow for their replacement by low-wage college grads. We know that the state faces a huge wave of state employee retirements in the next 17 months. Wouldn't it make more sense to recruit the college graduates into these coming state service vacancies as regular state employees with full human rights, such as the right to unionize? It also seems very paternalistic to direct funds from the pay of these new low-wage state employees to pay off their student loans. Shouldn't it be the choice of the employees as to how to direct the income that they've earned? Perhaps rent, food, utilities, healthcare, and other expenses will be more pressing for them. Uh, perhaps they can't afford to have 10% of their income steered to paying off loans, especially without having any say in it. There's no provision for health care coverage in this bill. There's no provision for retirement below a low wage worker's ability to fund a private retirement account. America's middle class has shrunk severely. In fact, by almost 20% since 1971. 61% of Americans were middle class then, now only 51% are. President Biden just cited that 43% of Americans are financially struggling. Connecticut's policymakers should put more concern into bolstering and restoring the middle class. Historically, a shrinking middle class leads to social upheaval. A shrinking middle class has usually been a big factor historically in cases where democracies have slipped into fascism. Hopefully, this is very much on legislators' minds with uh, current events being what they are. So we urge you to please reject this bill, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Brian, uh, very much uh, for your testimony today. Um, wanted to see, do any of my colleagues have uh, questions? Um, and, and, you know, one question I have, and, and Brian, very much appreciate, you know, your, your points and, and all your advocacy. Um, do you have any recommendations for how the bill could be strengthened or improved? Um, I don't really, but I'd be happy to dialogue with folks on it. What I think would be great is if there was a recruitment effort to steer college grads into these uh, 12,000 to 13,000 job openings that are going to happen. Uh, many of them will be college level jobs. It, it makes sense to uh, plan now, since we only have 17 months, to refill these positions. We really are looking at an almost catastrophic situation if you have this large group of retiree retirements between uh, now and July 1st of 2022. It, it seems like the necessary steps uh, to prepare for that silver wave have not been taken yet. 
Got it. Thank you for that. And and thank you very much again, Brian, for, for your testimony today and also for waiting so patiently um, in our uh, five or six here. So we appreciate you being with us today and, and thanks for, for all you do. Um, and before I move on, any other questions from colleagues? Okay, not seeing any in the chat. Um, well, thank you very much, Brian. Thanks for all of your endurance. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Take care. You too. Okay, next we have uh, David Green from the Cultural Alliance of Fairfield. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is David Green, and as the Executive Director of the Cultural Alliance of Fairfield County, I'm testifying for HB 6119. The Cultural Alliance was created by the Bridgeport Regional Business Council and the Business Council of Fairfield County as part of the 2005 One Coast, One Future Economic and Community Development Initiative across our 15 towns from Greenwich across to Shelton. The Cultural Alliance is a membership nonprofit with over 550 nonprofit creative business and individual artist members. We provide marketing, professional development and advocacy services, connecting all our members to one another and to their publics, consciously weaving together our cultural infrastructure and demonstrating its power. We study and promote the interconnectedness of the arts and culture ecosystem with the economic landscape of our region. Our 2016 report on the arts and economic prosperity of Fairfield County showed just the nonprofit arts and culture organizations and their audiences spent at least $235 million, generated $20 million in state and local government revenue, and supported at least 6,700 FTE jobs in our county in 2015. This activity and impact, of course, has taken a devastating pounding with the pandemic. Statewide, this sector, as you've heard, lost two and a half billion dollars in sales, over 33,000 jobs, and $400 million in revenue. During that pandemic, we've have had even greater contact with our members, holding weekly community conversations for members to share their situations and concerns. These have included the bridge loans, PPPs, the shared work program, pandemic unemployment insurance for gig workers, virtual fundraising, crisis financial planning, sustainable virtual programming, reopening requirements, and the threat of permanent closures. These and other issues were thrashed out, information shared, and recommendations made. In addition, since last March, we have conducted three countywide surveys to measure the losses suffered. We are, of course, all very grateful that the governor and DECD commissioner recognized the value of our industry by having awarded $10.5 million of emergency federal CARES Act funding for the Office of the Arts and Connecticut Humanities, both of which fund us but this is not nearly enough. This sector, this industry needs greater investment. It needs both further emergency relief funding to enable it to recover and contribute to the recovery of the state, plus increased and sustained investment in the future to enable it to flourish and to sustain its contribution to a vibrant Connecticut. We need further recognition of the critical role our arts and culture industry plays in the recovery and rebuilding of our state, not only in its economic recovery, but also in the recovery and restoration of the emotional and mental health of our citizens. Please vote for 6119 to replenish the Tourism Fund, Connecticut's chief investment mechanism for the arts, culture and tourism by increasing the proceeds from the lodging tax to the tourism funds from 10 to 25%. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David, for your testimony and also for your patience and staying with us uh, for this public hearing and um, you know, for all you do for the Cultural Alliance of Fairfield. 
Um, and I, I was really impressed to hear too the the return on investment that your organization provides in terms of job creation and and revenue. So so thank you for sharing that with us. And I also wanted to follow up on the community surveys that you mentioned that you distributed, and would be curious to hear if you have any elaboration on the responses you got and what kind of um, you know what what you heard from folks in the community in terms of the feedback from those. Well, first, the, the last one is currently um, in the works. We are conducting it with our peer organizations across the state, such as Shoreline and Southwest and the Arts Council of New Haven. Um, the first two uh, were both fairly early, one in March and one in June. We both, we had um, around 120 respondents to both of those surveys. Um, showing a lot of devastation. Um, I'm happy to share um, the, the surveys with them, so with, with you, um, many details. <laughs> so I can submit that with the summary of my testimony. Oh, that would be great, thank you. I'd be really curious to, to hear the feedback. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, let me just open up to questions from colleagues. Oh, I see uh, Madam Co-Chair, Senator Hartley. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam um, Chair. I, I just wanted to extend my apologies to everybody. I had to shut my camera off uh, because my battery is kind of uh, on the last percentages. Um, so I am still with you and thank you um, all. Yes, thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam, Madam Co-Chair. Any other questions from colleagues? Seeing none, thank you so much, David, for being with us today. Thank you, you're welcome. Next, we have Laura Atanasio from the Kids Connection Youth Theater. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Senator Hartley and other distinguished members, uh, Representative Simmons for, uh, from the Commerce Committee. And uh, thank you for your patience in allowing so many of us today to speak and give our testimony in support of HB 6119. Also, thank you to Representative Parker for introducing this bill. My name is Laura Atanasio, and I am the founder and artistic director of Kids Connection Shoreline Theater Academy, a nonprofit educational center for the performing arts in Clinton, which has been in business for 15 years. And I am in strong support of this bill. As an arts business owner, I have spent my career aware of the mutual wealth brought to communities through cultural events, thus injecting valuable commerce from tourists. Families are the very fabric of our communities. Children participate in so many activities that boost tourism naturally. To help you see this, I wanted to give you a little personal touch, a picture of a single child who invests time in a single community theater production. A true story, one of hundreds I could share, and this is the story of a nine-year-old boy named Billy from North Haven, 38 minutes away from us, and whom I first met at the age of six to participate in the musical Newsies. With 100 students ages 5 to 18, he was a beginner, and I suggested to his mother that perhaps there were other theater groups closer in proximity, giving her those suggestions, but she persisted. You see, Billy loved Newsies. He knew every song by heart, and she was willing to bring him to and from our rehearsals for three months to be part of that show. Twice a week, Billy's mother would drop him off and spend her hour shopping at T. <coughs> ordering takeout meals from Grand Pete's or chips and browsing the art studios on Main Street. And during show week, we moved over to the Clinton Town Hall. Family members, an aunt from West Haven and parents from Hamden. They remarked the, their awe of the historic auditorium, which we rented four times a year pre-pandemic. They had no idea it even existed, and I mentioned that they might also enjoy the George Flynn concerts also held there. Billy's aunt asked for recommendations for a local restaurant for the 15 family members coming from all over Connecticut and upstate New York to eat at after the Saturday matinee. Billy's other set of grandparents, well, they were flying in from Florida, making a vacation out of it. And they were planning visits to the Florence Griswold Museum 
and the Mystic Aquarium, and they'd even purchased tickets to another show at the Schubert. On the day of the production, Billy forgot his dance shoes. His mother quickly dashed to the local dancer's outlet to remedy the problem. Four shows all sold out, 350 seat capacity. Kids Connection pre-pandemic produced nine productions a year. Now I have tried to be fiercely independent from outside funding, proving to skeptics that we in the arts can and in fact do run viable businesses, but it will come as no surprise to anyone here that Kids Connection has taken a 70% loss in revenue this year. Without any help in this moment, small theater companies like mine may not survive after we return to more normal life. And Billy's large extended family, well, they won't have reason to visit our beautiful Connecticut shores as often. Now, I've spoken to many colleagues who manage similar small arts companies like mine who are facing for the first time this same extraordinary shortfall. Therefore, I wholly support the passage of House Bill 6119. I believe it will be a critical lifetime, lifeline for those of us smaller nonprofit arts companies that desperately want to survive, return to our independence, and continue spurring the tourism that naturally grows from our businesses. I want to thank you again, Madam Chair, Representative Parker, and all the representatives here today on this commission who have listened to all of our many testimonies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Thanks for being with us today and for your, your testimony. Um, you can just tell how passionate and devoted you are. And so we, I can just tell your kids are so lucky to have you as the artistic director um, at the Kids Connection Youth Theater. So thanks for all you do and for your support for this bill. Uh, any questions from colleagues? Seeing none, thank you so much, Laura. We appreciate you being with us today. Thanks, thanks for your patience, everyone. Thank you. Next, we have Andrea Aaron from Silver Scrape. Hi, my name is Andrea Aaron, and I'd like to thank the members of the Commerce Committee for giving me the opportunity to give testimony and support for HB 6119, an act concerning arts, culture, and tourism funding. And I'd like to thank Representative Parker for writing that bill. The growth of our economy, as well as our general well being, is highly dependent on the health and support of the arts. Currently, the lights are turned off on many of our galleries, arts businesses, theaters, dance companies, and nonprofits. We're missing our community gatherings on our town greens for musical concerts, art exhibitions, and festivals. My entire life's career has been devoted to the creation of art and the teaching of art to all ages. I was a high school art teacher at New London High School for 34 years and at Wyndham High School for almost 10 years previous to that. Most recently, I've been teaching at Wesleyan Potters. And through all of my teaching, I have been astonished by the power of the arts and their impact on the development of the whole person. Critical thinking skills and problem solving through art will prepare our youth for the demands of the future and provide social emotional learning. We all have the need to be expressive and creative and the interaction with the arts feeds our souls and connects us to others. I am also a small business person and member of the Connecticut River Artisans Cooperative in Essex, where I sell my handcrafted jewelry and assist in running the shop. I've met folks from all over the world, all over the country and all of Connecticut, of course, um, when they walk into the shop and uh, buy or purchase one of a kind handmade works of art. Many people arrive by boat um, and dock in the marina and come from really far away. But our cooperative, our shop was closed for three months and business is still adversely affected. 
small businesses, individual artists, educators, and nonprofits continue to struggle while navigating these difficult times. We are all hungry for the resumption of art experiences, which truly enrich our lives. Passing HB 6119 will increase funding for the arts in Connecticut, help us to reach our goals while growing our economy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andrea, for your testimony and for being with us today. Uh, really appreciate it. And opening up to my colleagues, any questions? Okay, seeing none. Thank you so much for being with us, Andrea, and for your support for this bill. Thank you. Take care. Next, we have uh, William Hosley from the Terra Firma Northeast. William, are you still with us? I'm sure it doesn't look like he is. Okay, we may have lost William. We'll we'll move on to the next one and then we'll we'll circle back if he joins us again. Um, next, we have Candy Carley from the East Haddam Stage Company. Hello, what a day this has been. I've been here for the whole thing. It's, it's great that you all are uh, still with us at this uh, late hour. Uh, I'm going to read the statement that I also submitted uh, the testimony and I'd like to thank the committee and uh, both uh, chair ladies for facilitating this discussion. And uh, this is the first time that I've uh, done a, what I would refer to as a live presentation for um, the legislature. And uh, so it's, it's, it's clear how important this is. Let me tell you just a little bit about who I am. Uh, my name is Candy Carl. I'm the producing artistic director of the East Adam Stage Company. And I'm here testifying to the Commerce Committee a public hearing on HB 6119 in full support of all as written. I have the East Adam Stage Company, which is a live performing arts organizations in, uh, organization. And we're in residence at Gillette Castle State Park, which is based here in East Haddam. We perform on a stage that was built specifically specifically for us on site. This past summer was the first time in 12 years that we were unable to share our six weekend season of free shows, which brings in an average of two to 3,000 audience members to the park. We also offer touring shows to various venues throughout New England. I myself am an actress known as a Victorian lady. I tour with those programs. Among other roles, I present living history programming to a variety of arts, cultural, and tourist-driven organizations in Connecticut and beyond. In that vein, I am a gig worker or independent contractor. I am coming to you today as that independent contractor, that performing artist, to urge you to support House Bill 6119. First off, the name change from the Tourism Fund to the more inclusive Arts, Culture, and Tourism Fund will better reflect the entities to which the fund is dedicated. The Connecticut Office of the Arts, as well as the Connecticut Humanities, along with the Regional Arts Council, such as the Shoreline Arts Alliance and the Southeast Connecticut Cultural Coalition, work hand in hand to offer resources to those of us who make our living in this sector. And it is true, you can make your living in the arts, you just have to work really hard at it. I will be forever thankful to those organizations for their assistance in navigating the PUA and PPP programs during this pandemic. The Arts and Cultural Councils were a lifeline. When I and others like me were in the weeds, they dug around in the barn, brought out their weed whackers and cleared the path so we could stay afloat. Mixed metaphors notwithstanding. Uh, please don't forget that uh, included under this umbrella is heritage tourism. This includes historical societies, small museums, living history sites, libraries, small art galleries and studios and performance venues. They are the backbone of the communities in the 169 towns in Connecticut. These oft times all volunteer run not-for-profit jewels may not have big celebrity names, get line item status, nor curry favor from wealthy donors, but they are the stars in the constellation of Connecticut. They are the keepers of our stories of lives lived, past, present, and yes, even the future. You can see where you need to go based on knowing where you've been. 
The increase in the percentage of the already collected tax going into the Arts, Culture and Tourism Fund means more resources available to enhance the ability of these heritage heritage tourism sites to make real connections and promote their dynamic places. You can do great things when you know somebody has your back. They not only work to maintain their properties and interpret their collections, but also offer independent contractors the opportunity to share our creativity and talent with their patrons, whether they be locals from the immediate community or visiting tourists. We professional artists invest in ourselves with the research, the supplies, the studio space, the classes, the writing, the directing, the rehearsing, the costuming, the props, the technical, the marketing, the travel, and as independent contractors, we pay the minimum 15% taxes, 1099ers. Small groups such as the East Haddam Stage Company, as well as the independent musicians, singers, sculptors, artists, dancers, storytellers, poets, living history role players, the list goes on and on, make our living by being hired by these organizations. We invest in our talent with blood, sweat and tears, so we are worthy of their investing in us. So I ask you to invest in them, which is in fact, investing in me. Others have highlighted the economic impact studies and statistics. I hope you've seen that those numbers reflect just how the arts and culture sector is, is a thriving part of the economic health of any state. HB 6119 is an investment that will enrich and reward. Think about the school kid who has that aha moment when they come face to face with Nathan Hale and is wowed by the bravery of Prudence Crandall. Think about everyday folks like yourselves who are moved, cheered, and touched by being in the presence of thought-provoking art, of being given the opportunity to experience human connection reflected in our rich culture. When you vote to increase the percentage of revenue for the newly named Arts, Culture, and Tourism Fund. In closing, I would like to share a story of just how the arts can and do inspire. In 2018, my East Haddam Stage Company, after four years of research and months of writing, casting, directing, and producing, along with a regional initiative grant from the Connecticut Office of the Arts, premiered a one-man drama, Osaki-san, William Gillette's Gentleman Valet, on stage at Gillette Castle State Park. Yukitaka Osaki came to the U.S. from Japan in 1888 with his brother and three others for what was to be a three-month visit. When it came time to leave, his brother, Yukio, got on the ship, but Yukitaka decided to stay. He never returned to Japan. The play is based on his life, his eventual employment and friendship with William Gillette, and as a Japanese man, the impact the events of Pearl Harbor had on him. Gillette, of course, is most famous here for his creation of the role of Sherlock Holmes, and his retirement home, now known as Gillette Castle State Park, was also the location of Osaki-san's retirement home, built for him by Mr. Gillette near the Chester Hadline Ferry on the Connecticut River. During the research phase, I had reached out to the Japan Society of Greater Hartford for their input and viewpoint. They had not realized that there was a very important link between Connecticut and their native Japan. Many of their members were at the standing room only premiere of the show at Gillette Castle in the fall of 2018. I had hired a wonderful Japanese American actor, Taku Hirai, to portray Osaki-san and I made a great connection with him. He is currently contracted to portray Osaki-san for the foreseeable future, and we look forward to his performances as soon as it is possible to get him back on the road and on stages. Now jump ahead just four months into early 2019, as the show was touring to various venues throughout New England, I received an email from the president of the Japan Society of Greater Hartford sharing that they were fundraising in order to make a very special gift to the park in honor of Yukitaka Osaki and William Gillette. You see, Yukitaka Osaki's brother, Yukio, was the mayor of Tokyo in 1912 and was responsible for the gift of the now iconic cherry tree blossoms to Washington, DC. And as it turns out, the Japan Society of uh, Greater Hartford had been looking for an opportunity to share Japan's cherry blossoms with Connecticut. 
they identified and reached out to the nursery in Japan, which is responsible for the descendant saplings of those original cherry trees in Washington, DC. They made a purchase of a dozens of samplings, which arrived in the US in 2019 and are currently in quarantine at the USDA outside Baltimore, Maryland. While they hoped that the trees would be ready to be planted by 2020, they were not ready for release. So in the meantime, the Japan Society of Greater Hartford purchased seven cherry blossom trees from a nursery in Farmington, Connecticut. And on a chilly day in October, this last fall, a group of us, including park supervisor and staff, volunteers from the East Haddam Stage Company and the Japan Society of Greater Hartford, planted five of the trees near the pond. One near the I'm castle. so sorry to, to interrupt, but unfortunately you're over your, your three minute time and I just want to make sure we have time for the rest of our, if you could, could wrap up, although yep. this is fascinating. I'm loving hearing this, yep. not to say that we're not interested. Hi. I just uh, wanted everyone to know that the gift would never have happened had I not reached out to the Japan Society of Greater Hartford in the first place and had they not come to the park to see the show. Because of COVID, we were not able to have a festive celebration of the gift, but as soon as we are able, we will be shouting from the rooftops. Partnerships such as what the East Adam Stage Company has with the State Park, our local business sponsors, and through the Bonds Forge with other cultural entities, we have indeed been enriched and I hope that this bill, HB 6119, will go through so more of these kinds of partnerships and stories can come out and we can all be shouting from the rooftops and prove how worthy we all are of the monies that uh, we are asking for today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Candy. Thank you for your, your testimony. We really appreciate you being with us today. Uh, any questions from committee members? Seeing none, Candy, thank you so much. We appreciate your support for this bill and, and all you do for the East Haddam Stage Company. Thanks for being with us today. You're welcome and thank you. Great, okay, next we have uh, Tina Tyson from the Maritime Aquarium. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, Tina, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you, Madam Chair and good afternoon, honorable members of the Commerce Committee. I'm Tina Tyson from the Maritime Aquarium at Norwalk, and I'm thrilled to be here to speak in support of proposed House Bill 6119. Our organization also submitted written testimony in collaboration with Mystic Aquarium and Connecticut's Beardsley Zoo. Just to introduce myself further, I'm dedicated to driving tourism to the state of Connecticut. As the Director of Marketing for the Maritime Aquarium, I work to promote visitation to one of the largest family attractions in the state. Beyond that, I'm also involved with several statewide tourism efforts, including my service as an officer of the Connecticut Tourism Coalition. I am passionate about supporting tourism, and I want you to be too. Given my placement in the testimony order, I won't reiterate all the numbers that have been delivered by earlier speakers. I, I think by now it's pretty well documented that the arts, culture, and tourism industries are huge economic drivers for the state with tremendous upside via increased funding. I'll use my time instead to focus on the importance of statewide tourism marketing based on the experience of the Maritime Aquarium. In a non-COVID year, we host almost a half a million visitors annually, and approximately 40% of those are from out of state. Conservative estimates cite our annual economic impact to the state of Connecticut north of $42 million. The aquarium reopened in June following a three month closure due to COVID-19 and families are coming back. The returning to visit are more than 7,000 animals, our dynamic exhibits and our state of the art vessel and new theater. We sit just 16 and a half miles from the New York border. Not surprisingly, visitors from Westchester County make up approximately 30% of our attendance. So we are acutely aware of the disparity between our state and neighboring New York with respect to investment in tourism marketing. What the I Love New York campaign spends in one month is about the same as what the state of Connecticut has spent annually in recent years. As New York State will naturally work to bolster its visitation post COVID, Fairfield County residents are a likely target given their easy access to New York. For our aquarium, even a small drop in visitors from Westchester could have big downside on our operations and our economic contribution to the state. 
If that's coupled with a reduction in visitors from our own Fairfield County because they're visiting New York more, that neg negative economic impact could be very significant. House Bill 6119 is essential to provide statewide marketing support, to jumpstart visitation, minimize competition from neighboring states, and enable the organizations and industries that are so vital to this state's economy to thrive. I thank you for the time this afternoon and the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much, Tina, for your testimony and for staying with us today and for all that you do for the Maritime Aquarium. I can uh, speak uh, personally. I know for our family, it's a favorite of our of our boys, and uh, it's just really a a jewel in our in our state to have it. Um, so thanks for all you do, and I want to commend to your staff. They've been doing an amazing job um, with COVID restrictions and and making sure that protocols are being followed. Um, so encourage everyone to to come visit if you haven't been to the, the Norwalk Aquarium in Norwalk. Um, so I uh, wanted to open up to any uh, committee members, any questions from my colleagues? Uh, Representative Thomas. Hi, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have a question, but I just wanna echo your sentiment uh, and thank the aquarium for all the great work in Norwalk. I know whenever I drive down the road and try to get a parking spot, I see all the out of state license plates. So I know you attract um, people from all over the region. So thank you for your work. Thank you for your comments, Representative Thomas. Thank you so much, Representative Thomas. Any other questions from colleagues? Seeing none, Tina, thank you for being with us today. Next, we have Catherine Steele. Catherine, are you still with us? Okay, if not, we will move on. We have Dick Wheeler. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Representative Simmons and Senator Hartley and all the committee members participating today and listening so closely and so patiently. I'm speaking in support of HB 6119. Uh, my name is Dick Wheeler. I'm the Executive Artistic Director of Oddfellows Playhouse Youth Theater in Middletown, the ancestral homeland of the Wangunk people. Oddfellows is located in downtown Middletown across the street from Kid City Children's Museum, around the corner from the Buttonwood Tree Performing Arts Center. For 46 years, Oddfellows has served Central Connecticut young people through performing arts training, participation in performance opportunities with an ongoing commitment to low-income youth and families and to using arts as a vehicle to bring together kids from many different backgrounds. We all know the impact that COVID-19 has had on the arts and arts education. It's devastated the entire sector and we'll all need some help in regaining our mojo in the coming months and years. Arts are an essential part of Connecticut's economy, of our education system, our cultural identity, cultural enrichment, and they provide young people and adults with vital social and emotional supports. After school arts-based programs can be an essential part of building a healthy society. Long-term programs like the Children's Circus of Middletown, a summer program in its 33rd season, attract multiple generations of families and bring life-changing arts and social experiences to the most economically disadvantaged young people in our community. Youth arts build community and build bridges between parts of the community. When we reemerge from COVID, the entire sector will need to build trust, create a sense of safety, and make folks feel welcome. State support of the arts through the Connecticut Office of the Arts allows arts and arts education to expand beyond the well-resourced to serve lower income populations and help overcome the racial and economic inequities that COVID has exposed so dramatically. State support of the arts is, as First Select Woman Chesborough said about six hours ago, an investment, not a handout. And the return on that investment is well documented. Valuing the arts and arts education results in breaking down barriers between people, 
and builds more well-rounded, aware, and compassionate citizens. Thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Dick, for your, your testimony and for being with us today. Any questions from committee members? Uh, seeing none, th thank you so much, Dick, for, for being with us and, and for your support and for your testimony today. Okay, uh, last but not least on our uh, official list, we have Steve Matiotos from the Connecticut Lodging Association. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, I'm the one you've been waiting for, uh, I think we're number 62. Uh, appreciate the time you've all provided to us uh, throughout the entire day and obviously to myself personally. Uh, Senator Hartley, Representative Simmons and members of the Committee uh, Commerce. Uh, I am Steve Matiados. I am the president of the Connecticut Hotel Lodging Association and I am here in support of HB 6119. As we transition from the pandemic response to recovery, it is essential that we address the fundamental deficiency in the funding of the statewide tourism uh, marketing. For years, the lodging industry has advocated for meaningful investment in tourism marketing based on demonstrated results. And as we heard earlier today, numerous times for every $1 invested in tourism, the ROI is $3. Hotel occupancy tax collections are down 56.5% which is down 34.7 million for the first five months of the fiscal 2021. And as of just a few weeks ago, as of uh, January 23rd, there's 30 plus thousand uh, continued unemployment claims for the hospitality sector. The impact of the pandemic on our industry fully supports our case as domestic and international, in, international air travel are not expected to fully recover until 2024 our marketing efforts must focus on the drive market. As we are one of the most expensive media markets in the US, our funding must be on par with our neighboring states. Connecticut is fortunate to have impressive outdoor attractions, including our shoreline and extensive trail networks. And we need to leverage these assets into economic activity. We have the opportunity to draw residents from neighboring states, as we've heard throughout, throughout the day, uh, into Connecticut, or we can sit and we continue to watch Connecticut residents flock to our neighboring states. Uh, by establishing a consistency source of funding based on performance, we are positioning Connecticut's hospitality and leisure industry to recover steadily. With the appropriate tourism marketing funding, we can attract visitors, increase both direct and indirect employment, and improve the quality of life of our residents. In addition, we recommend diversifying the funding sources for the tourism fund beyond the lodging occupancy tax. As continued disproportionate uh, reliance on hotel occupancy taxes will result in the same fiscal challenges during the next economic crisis, which uh, none of us certainly uh, hope happens anytime soon. Uh, we need to promote our state for when the better days arrive. And uh, I think we all are hoping it's, it's coming very soon. And hospitality is all uh, key to that state's recovery. We often compare our great stats throughout our state uh, versus the other New England states with great pride. And uh, we also need to evaluate our areas of opportunities. And I think an area of opportunity is truly our funding tourism, uh, which uh, is what we're speaking of obviously today. It's where we have lacked over the recent years and where our greatest opportunity is. So on behalf of the Connecticut Lodging Association, I thank you for your time throughout the entire day, the time provided to me, and I urge for the approval of increased funding to the tourism fund. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve, for your, your testimony and for being with us today. I, sorry, one second. I'm so sorry. For the, um, it's been a long day. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> He's sad that we're not giving enough marketing revenue to support our tourism. <laughs> Um, but could, couldn't agree more on the need to um, support our lodging and hotel industry. And uh, thank you so much for your advocacy and all you've been doing for this industry that's been getting crushed right now. Um, with that, I want to open up. Do any of my colleagues have any questions? Yeah. Will you have Art take care of that child, please? <laughs> Seriously, thank you, Senator. <laughs> All right, See, seeing no questions, thank you so much, Steve. We really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks for being with us today. Thank you, everyone. We certainly appreciate it as well. Thank you.
Um, apologies all. Um, with that, I, uh, I know we're done with our official list. I want to turn it over to Madam Co-Chair uh, Hartley to see if uh, you have any final comments or remarks. No, thank you very much. Um, and thanks so much for stepping in as uh, my power went out. Um, it, it's been a long day. Thanks everybody um, for sticking with us um, and to my co-chair and my ranking members um, and, uh, and little Teddy uh, over there. Uh, so having gone through a very extensive list, thank you uh, all those who participated and to my colleagues, um, we will now uh, end today's public hearing, alas. <laughs> Th thank you all. Um, Madam Clerk, are we uh, okay? Is there any unfinished business before us? We are all set. Okay, um, we will uh, adjourn today's public hearing. Please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Be well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Have a good day, everybody.